Let me share with you something that a correction officer said a long time ago. He said this, discovered that human nature is such that imagine for a moment an 18-month-old baby that you're holding in your arms. And that 18-month-old baby sees that shiny watch on your wrist. And he grabs for your watch. And you pull his hand away and say no. He begins to cry and move about in your arms. He reaches for the watch again. You grab his hand and say no. He begins to scream and cry. He reaches for the watch again. You say no. He begins to frail his arms even in the direction of your face. I submit to you that if that 18 month old baby had the strength of an 18 year old man, he would slaughter you there where you stand, Father. Rip the watch off your arm and walk across your bloody body out the door without feeling an ounce of remorse. You see, here's something you need to understand. Hitler was not an anomaly. Hitler was not a phenomenon. Hitler was what everyone in this room has the potential of being. And not only that, you need to understand, even in all the, all the wickedness of Hitler, Hitler was still restrained by the common grace of God. And you need to know this, that if it were not for the common grace of God restraining you in your unconverted state, you would make Hitler look like a choir boy. What we do not understand is what Scripture teaches about men. Men are evil. You say, well, I don't agree. That's because you've grabbed enough of Christianity to stand, but you don't believe the Bible. The Scripture's testimony against you and all men is that we are born with evil. And we are evil. Do you have to teach a child to lie? Do you have to teach a child to be self-centered? Do you have to teach a child to be selfish? Do you have to teach a child to be brutal to other children? They learn that on their own. Set them free. Discipline them not and see what you have in ten years. A monster. Set them free. Discipline them not and see what you have in ten years. A monster. Why? Because what Scripture says is true. And you hold your ears and you say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. In the same way that a person dying of cancer is in denial and says to the doctor, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. That by cupping the hands over your ears, you close yourself off from any remedy. The first thing you must embrace is this. All men are born in sin and given over to sin. And all men are born hating God. You say, well, I never hated God. Yes, you do. If you did not, if you did not and in your, in your unconverted state hate God, then the Bible is not true. Because the Bible calls all men haters of God and enemies of God. You say, but I loved God ever since I was little. No, you loved an image of God that you created with your own mind and you loved what you made, but if someone would have come to you and pointed out the God of Scripture, you would have said, I could never love a God like that. So many times I'll go to people and they say, well, I've loved God all my life. And I say, can I sit down with you for a half an hour and just explain from Scripture some of the historical Christian beliefs about God? And after a half an hour, a good churchman will say, that's not my God. And I have to say, of course it's not but it is the God of Scripture. It is the God of Scripture. Go to Genesis 8 for a moment. Verse 21. And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to Himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. This can mean evil from childhood. Evil from a babe. Let's just go for just a moment. Go over to Genesis just quickly with me. Chapter 6, verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Only evil continually. I simply read this text one time preaching at a university and a young reporter came up to me and he said, I don't agree with your interpretation. And I said, young man, I didn't interpret the text. I read it. 
And he said, well, I don't agree. And I said, young man, let me tell you something. If I could pull out your heart right now, if I could take every thought you have ever had from your first waking moment until this very hour, if I could take every thought you've ever had, not just your deeds, but your thoughts, only your thoughts, and I could put them on a video, and I could show that video here in this auditorium tonight, you would run off of this campus and you would never show your face here again because you have thought things so wicked and so perverted you cannot even share them with your closest friend. As a matter of fact, if your closest friend knew some of the thoughts you've had against him, he would no longer be your friend. And young man, I do not know that because I'm a prophet. I know that because it's what the Scriptures say, and I know that like you, I too am a man. I can say the same thing about every one of you here tonight. You would spend every ounce of energy to hide from everyone in this room what has gone through your mind just in the last hour. Don't tell me Scripture's not right when it talks about all men having sinned because all men are sinners. Let's take another look. Let's go on over to Isaiah. Isaiah 64, verse 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. I helped build a church years ago in San Pablo, near the Colombian border on the, on the Amazon, and it was a colony of lepers. Have you ever seen a leper? you ever smelt a leper? If I brought a leper of the worst sort, there's about three different kinds of leprosy. If I brought a leper of the worst sort, you'd smell him before he got out of the parking lot into this building. If he walked in here, he would be a mass of rotting flesh, body fluid, pus, and blood. When he said all of us are like one who is unclean, this is possible to reference here. And let's say that all you find people say, well, we must do something about this. So you go to Kansas City, to the most exclusive shop, and you buy the most fine, some finest silk you can find. And you take that silk, and you bring it back, and you wrap that man head to toe in that fine white silk, and you say, bravo, look what we've done. We've saved the day. We've made him presentable. But that silk only lies on that flesh for a few seconds. And the corruption of that man's body begins to bleed through that fine silk. And that silk becomes as corrupt as the man himself. That is why all our good works are like filthy rags before God. Because we ourselves, prior to conversion have a heart of stone, a God-hating heart, a heart of evil, born in sin, given towards sin. That is the testimony of Scripture. Some of you, in your 60s, 70s, you heard preaching like this all the time when you were children. But now it seems the new generations to follow cannot bear with truth. They would rather be deceived and think well of themselves. But a man who will not accept his illness cannot be healed. A man who does not have all his hopes crushed with regard to his own self-righteousness, merit and worth cannot turn to Christ. We must realize that we are destitute and there is only one Savior and His name is Jesus. There are four fundamental questions that every single religion on planet Earth tries to answer. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? The way you answer those questions is totally determined by your worldview. Some people look at the world and say, you know, it's amazing. A big bang made this from nothing. That's the humanist worldview based on the evolution theory. Other people look at the world and say, you know, there's incredible design. There must be a designer. That's the creationist worldview based on creation. And those two worldviews are at war with each other. I mean, somebody is wrong. And I enjoy showing them who they are. Real simple. But if the evolution theory is true, how would you answer the four great questions of life? Who am I? And what am I worth? Well, if evolution is true, you're nothing important. You're just a piece of protoplasm that washed up on the beach. You're not worth a thing. 
Actually, you're part of the problem, you see, because you are one of the polluters of the environment. And the more of you we can get rid of, the better. See, that's normal thinking if evolution is true. Where did I come from? Well, if evolution is true, you came from a cosmic burp about 20 billion years ago. Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Well, if evolution is true, there's no purpose to life, so you might as well have fun. If it feels good, do it. Where am I going when I die? Well, if evolution is true, you're going to the grave, and you're going to get recycled into a worm or a plant. But see, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, if that's true, that puts a whole different set of answers to those questions. That means we better try to figure out who God is and find out what He wants and do what He says, because He created this place, which means He owns it, which means He makes the rules. We better find out what He wants. And if you're not obeying His rules, you may be in trouble one of these days. We're going to get into more of that later. But boy, the devil doesn't like this idea that God created the earth. The devil came to Eve in the Garden of Eden. The first thing he said to the woman, he said, Eve, hath God said? Yea, hath God said? He's, tr he's, he's trying to raise doubts about God's Word. Satan always tries to raise doubts about God's Word. That's one of the reasons we've got all this confusion on the different Bible versions. You know, where is God's Word? Is it over here? I don't know where it is. We cover more on that in video 7. The second thing he said to the woman, he said, Ye shall not surely die. He's calling God a liar, basically. The third thing he said to Eve is what I want to talk to you about tonight. He said, Eve, if you eat off that tree, ye shall be as gods. And right there is where the whole idea of evolution got started. It didn't start with Charlie Darwin. <laughs> it started with Satan in the Garden of Eden. He wants you to think you can become a god. Yes, boys and girls, we started like an amoeba, and we're evolving. We're getting bigger and better and stronger and smarter, and someday we're going to sail around the universe and discover new life forms like Star Trek. People ask me all the time, they say, Hovind, do you think there's intelligent life on other planets? I say, nope. I taught high school 15 years. There's not much intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> I didn't get to see a whole lot of it. Satan's a liar. He said, you can be like God. I'll tell you what, the Mormon church has swallowed that. They teach their people, if you're a good Mormon, when you go to heaven, you get to become God. And if you're a good Mormon wife, when you go to heaven, you get to be eternally pregnant, producing spirit babies. My wife don't want to go. She said, that's not heaven. <laughs> By the way, there are some great books to reach Mormons, and a good website, utlm, utahlighthousemission.org. If you want to reach Mormons, you ought to study that one. I was surprised to find out a couple years ago, some of the major Catholic theologians of the past have taught man can become God. It's still in their catechism right now. Now, most Catholics don't believe that, and they don't even realize some of their leaders have taught that. But even Kenneth Copeland said, Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifest in the flesh. He said, you don't have a God in you. You are one. I'm sorry, Kenneth. You're crazy about that, okay? Kenneth Hagin said, the believer is called Christ. That's who we are. We're Christ. No, you're crazy. The job's not available, and you couldn't do it if you had it, okay? You're not God, right? Nor are you Christ. Walk on water sometime. I want to see that. Lucifer is the one who wants to be God. Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. See, Satan wants to be God. But the job's not available, so he's all upset about that, and he can't be God. So he lied to Eve and told her she could be like God. Now, he, Satan hates us, though, because we're made in God's image. And boy, Eve fell for that hook, line, and sinker. Wow, I get to be God. Now, Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. Anyway, this will be my brother. Now, please don't laugh. He can't help it. There he is right there. <laughs> Notice what the textbook says. 30 million years ago. Now, kids, let me translate that for you. Anytime a textbook says millions of years ago, what it means is long ago and far away. That means a fairy tale is coming next, okay? That's your warning, fairy tale coming up. 30 million years ago, these critters evolved. Well, there's that word again. You've got to watch that one. It says they're ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Ancestors to humans? Grandpa? What big eyes you have, Grandpa. <laughs> uh, the better to see you with, my boy. 
You know, we've been teaching kids they're nothing but an animal, and today a lot of them act like animals. Even Barbara Reynolds figured it out. She said, your kids go ape in school? Here's why. He's being taught evolution. Guess what, Johnny? You're an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. <laughs> you mean I'm just an animal? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have you ever stopped and thought that possibly what we're teaching the kids is maybe affecting how they behave? Hmm? What you believe determines how you behave. Kids are taught today, you know, that you're just an animal. The rock music these days is all full of death and destruction and blood. Well, the Bible says, they that hate me love death. Kids are taught today there are no absolutes. I was in a debate one time and this professor said, Hoven, there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> blew his little brain. Now hold on a minute. How can I be absolutely sure? There's no absolutes. I was speaking in a public school in Pennsylvania a couple years ago, and this kid sat on the second row, and he said, Hovind, I'm an atheist. There's no God. I said, are you sure? He said, I'm sure. I said, well, let me ask you a question, son. I said, do you know everything? He said, oh, no, no. I said, okay, well, good. I said, do you think maybe you know half of everything? He said, no. I said, okay, well, let's just pretend for a few minutes that you know half of everything. Would it be possible then for God to exist in the other half you don't know? Brand new thought rattled around his brain for a while. Got lost, I'm sure. I said, by the way, son, if you're an atheist, let me ask you a simple question. How do you tell right from wrong? Ask an atheist that question sometime. How do you tell right from wrong? He said, that's easy. I decide what's right and wrong. He said, I'm the God of my own universe. I said, I'm glad to hear about that, son, because I am going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, oh, yeah, I can. You see, I am the God of my own universe, and I decided it's fine for me to shoot you. You see where that logic would lead in a hurry? If every man did that which was right in his own eyes, like the book of Judges says, Serious problems for society, big time. How do you tell right from wrong? Simple question to ask an evolutionist. They don't have a way to tell. I mean, maybe, maybe Osama bin Laden should decide right from wrong. Huh? Maybe Bill Clinton should decide right from wrong. If he has any idea where to find it. I mean, how do you tell right from wrong? Simple. It's real easy to tell right from wrong. Thus saith the Lord. Now see, that is absolute. And the Lord said, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. Some people either don't know what God says, or maybe they just don't care what God says. But God says, don't do that, okay? <laughs> now, if you did it in the past, okay, say, God, I'm sorry, that was dumb, and don't do it again, all right? A lot of teachers don't seem to understand. They just blindly follow the textbook and think they have to teach this evolution theory. No, you don't have to teach this evolution theory, okay? Teachers can teach creation in public schools if they want. You're going to be told in school you started like a slime and you slowly became a human. You be careful because that philosophy will spoil you. Jesus said, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of the world and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Hey, if a child goes 12 to 16 years to school in your town, how's he going to view the world? Probably as an evolutionist. Hey, if the Bible's right about the beginning... Maybe it's right about the end. Mm -hmm. Let's summarize here. God made the world. He owns it. He makes the rules, and we are all guilty of breaking His rules. Every one of us. I'll show you. Here's the Ten Commandments. He told us, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. How many of you have ever told a lie in your life? Put your hand up. Come on. You're doing another one if you don't. Okay. All right. Thou shalt not steal. How many ever stole something? Come on, you already told me you're a liar. Put your hand up, okay? <laughs> Keep your hand go up there, brother. Put it up. Okay. All right, so far we know we're all a bunch of lying thieves, right? <laughs> Do you want to read the whole list and see how we're doing? <laughs> we better stop right there. There's no question we are guilty and we are going to be punished. God is a righteous judge. He cannot look upon sin and we're going to be punished. Or you need to find a substitute. That's where Jesus comes in. He wants to pay for your sins. 36 years ago, I told him he could pay for mine. I asked him to forgive me and save me. Hey, if you died today, where would you go? 
Smoking or non-smoking? <laughs> Where are you going when you die? Hmm? You ought to think about that because you're going to be dead for a really long time. All you get in this life is a little bitty dash between two dates. I'm going to die someday. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do, but it's going to happen. It could happen today. Have you seen the way they drive around Knoxville, Tennessee? You have got some certified rednecks out there, folks, and you can get killed on the way home tonight. Right? Where are you going when you die? If you're not sure you're saved, why don't you ask the Lord to forgive you and save you? And if you are saved, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Everybody ought to find something to do for the Lord. There's a war going on. Find something to do, okay? Get busy. Win souls. Be a Sunday school teacher. Bus driver. Do something for God with your life. If we can help, that's what our materials are for. Catalog on the back table back there as well as our videos. We want to help strengthen your faith in God's Word. We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6.23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If he would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now, and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. And forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help. For more information on the Ministry of Creation Science Evangelism, write us at Creation Science Evangelism, P.O. Box 37338, Pensacola, Florida, 32526, USA. In Mark 10, verse 17, we have the story of the rich young man who runs up to Jesus and says, Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I don't know about you, but if that happened to me, I would be very excited. Mm -hmm. That would be a chance of a lifetime. Notice that Jesus does not say, Oh, my friend, you have a God-shaped hole in your heart that only I can fill. And if you will say this prayer and ask me into your heart, you'll get love, joy, peace, and go to heaven when you die. No, Jesus started by saying, why do you call me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. So he was correcting this man's understanding of the word good. And then he pointed him to the Ten Commandments. He gave him five of them. He said, you know the law. He says, you shall not lie, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder and honor your father and mother. And the young man said, I've kept all those since my youth. And then Jesus pointed him to the essence of the first and second commandment and said, there's one thing you still lack. Go and sell all your goods, give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And the Bible says that the man went away sad. And I'm thinking to myself, didn't Jesus know that no one can keep the Ten Commandments? We're not saved by keeping the law. We're saved by grace. Why did he talk to him that way? 
I mean, he didn't talk about God's love, God's grace. He didn't pray with him. He didn't even say something like, wait, come back. Would you like to come to my house this weekend for a lamb barbecue where I could establish a no-strings-attached, non-confrontational relationship with you? It seemed to me Jesus might have benefited from a friendship evangelism course. But that was my shallow and immature understanding of what he was doing. He was using a principle that prepares the heart for grace. It's a principle that has been used by Charles Spurgeon, John Wesley, George Whitfield, And it, it converts the soul according to the Bible. It shows a person why they need the Savior. It's a key that changes everything. And that's why the enemy does not want you to get a hold of it. It's something that the enemy has bent out of shape over the years. He's misused it and even hidden it so that much of the church does not even know that it exists. That's why we call it hell's best kept secret. So please watch and listen carefully and don't let anything distract you. Only a certain amount of time left. I have time left. That's a beautiful and huge epistle from John to the Lost. John to the Lost. There's nothing more important than your eternal salvation. The Bible tells us in Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. What is it that the Bible says is perfect and actually converts the soul? Why, well, Scripture makes it very clear. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, to illustrate the function of God's law, let's just look for a few moments at civil law. Imagine if I said to you, I've got some good news for you. Someone has just paid a $25,000 speeding fine on your behalf. You'd probably look at me and say, that's not good news. It doesn't make sense. I don't have a $25,000 speeding fine. You see, my good news would probably not be good news. It would sound foolish. But more than that, it would also sound offensive because I'm implying that you've broken the law when you don't think you have. But if I said it to you this way, it might make more sense. On the way here today, the law clocked you at going 55 miles an hour through an area set aside for a blind children's convention. There were 10 clear warning signs stating that 15 miles an hour was the maximum speed, but you went straight through at 55 miles an hour. What you did was extremely dangerous. The law was about to take its course when someone you don't even know stepped in and paid the fine for you. You are very fortunate. Can you see that telling you precisely what you've done wrong first actually makes the good news make sense? If I don't bring clear instruction you've violated the law, the good news will seem foolishness, it will seem offensive. But once you understand you've broken that law, then that good news becomes good news indeed. In the same way, if I approach a hardened sinner, someone whose understanding is darkened, and say, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, it'll be foolishness to him and offensive to him. Foolishness because it won't make sense. The Bible actually says that. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. And offensive because I'm insinuating he's a sinner when he doesn't think he is. As far as he's concerned, there are plenty of people far worse than him. But if I take the time to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, it may make more sense. If I take the time to open up the divine law and to show the sinner precisely what he's done wrong, that he's offended God by transgressing his law, then when he becomes, as James says, convinced of the law as a transgressor, the good news of the fine being paid for him will not be foolishness, it will not be offensive, it will be the power of God unto salvation. Now with that thought in mind, let's look at Romans 3.19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So there's one function of God's law. It's to stop the mouth of the sinner. To stop a person from justifying himself, saying, ah, there's plenty of people far worse than I am, I'm not a bad person. No, the law stops the mouth of justification and leaves the whole 
world, not just the Jews, but the whole world, guilty before God. Romans 3.20 Wherefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So there, the law tells us what sin is. In fact, 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is transgression of the law. And then in Romans 7, verse 7, Paul says, I had not known sin, but by the law. Paul said he didn't know what sin was until the law told him. And Galatians 3, 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So there he's saying that the law is like a schoolmaster that leads us to Jesus Christ so that we can be justified through faith in his blood. The law doesn't help us, it just leaves us helpless. The law doesn't justify us, it just leaves us guilty before a just and holy God. Let me say that again, this is so important. We are not saved by the law. We are saved by God's grace through faith. The law just shows us we're filthy dirty and in desperate need of God's cleansing. And the tragedy of modern evangelism is that around the turn of the last century, when it got rid of the law and its ability to convert the soul, to drive people to the Savior, modern evangelism had to therefore find another reason for people to come to the Savior. And the issue that it is chosen to attract people to Jesus is the promise of life enhancement. The gospel has degenerated into Jesus Christ will give you love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. Now to illustrate the unscriptural nature of this very popular teaching, one that I used to teach myself, please listen to the following story because the essence of what we're saying pivots on this particular point. Two men are seated in a plane. The first is given a parachute and told to put it on as it would improve his flight. He's a little skeptical at first as he can't see how wearing a parachute in a plane could possibly improve the flight. After a time, he decides to experiment and see if the claim is true. As he puts it on, he notices the weight of it upon his shoulders and he finds that he has difficulty in sitting upright. However, he was told the parachute would improve the flight, so he decides to give the thing a little time. And as he waits, he starts to notice that the other passengers are laughing at him because he's wearing a parachute in a plane. And as they continue to point and laugh, he finally can't stand it any longer. He slinks in his seat, unstraps the parachute, and throws it on the floor. Disillusionment and bitterness fill his heart because as far as he's concerned, he was told an outright lie. The second man is given a parachute, but listen to what he's told. He's told to put it on because at any moment he'd be jumping 25,000 feet out of the plane. He gratefully puts it on. He doesn't notice the weight on his shoulders, nor that he can't sit upright. His mind is consumed with the thought of what would happen to him if he jumped without that parachute. Now let's analyze the motive and the result of both passengers' experience. The first man put on the parachute solely to improve his flight. And the result of his experience was that he was humiliated by the other passengers. He was disillusioned and somewhat bitter toward those who gave him the parachute. As far as he's concerned, it'll be a long time before someone gets one of those things on his back again. The second man put the parachute on solely to escape the jump to come. And because of his knowledge of what would happen to him without it, he has a deep-rooted joy and peace in his heart knowing that he's safe from sure death. This knowledge gives him the ability to withstand the mockery of the other passengers. His attitude toward those who gave him the parachute is one of heartfelt gratitude. Now listen to what the modern gospel says. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll give you love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. In other words, Jesus will improve your flight. And so the sinner responds, and in an experimental kind of way, puts on the Savior to see if the claims are true. And what does he get? 
just what Jesus promised. Trials, tribulation, persecution. The other passengers mock him. What does he do? He takes off the Lord Jesus Christ. He's offended that he's been mocked. He's disillusioned and bitter. And how can you blame him? He was promised love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. And all he got were more trials and humiliation. His bitterness is directed toward those who gave him the so-called good news. And now he's worse off than he was before because now he thinks he's given Jesus a try and all he got was a big letdown. Another inoculated and bitter backslider. Instead of saying that Jesus improves the flight, we should be warning the passengers that they're going to have to jump out of the plane. That it's appointed a man once to die and after this the judgment. And when a sinner understands the horrific consequences of breaking God's law, he will flee to the Savior solely to escape the wrath that's to come. And if we are true and faithful witnesses, that's what we should be preaching. That there is wrath to come. That God commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. You see, it's not an issue of happiness, but of righteousness. It doesn't matter how happy a person is or isn't in their current lifestyle, without the righteousness of Christ, they'll perish on the day of judgment. The Bible says, riches profit not on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. You see, that's how I realized that I needed a savior. I had many of the things that the world has to offer, but I knew that none of that would matter on the day when I stood before God and all of my sin came out as evidence of my guilt. It was the righteousness of Christ that I would need to be saved. Now, let me say that peace and joy are legitimate fruits of salvation. They are the wonderful, beautiful results of salvation. But it's not legitimate to use those fruits as a draw card for salvation. Why? Because if a person comes to God looking for peace, some joy in their life, but they're not broken in their heart, repentant over the fact that they've sinned against Almighty God, they won't find peace with God. They won't know the joy of the Lord. They'll remain enemies of God in their minds through wicked works, separated from God because of their sin. And if we continue to give people the wrong reason to come to Christ, they'll respond with a wrong motive, lacking repentance. Can you remember why the second passenger had peace and joy in his heart? It was because he knew that parachute was going to save him from sure death. In the same way, I have, as the Apostle Paul says, joy and peace in believing because I know the righteousness of Christ is going to deliver me from the wrath that's to come. Now with that thought in mind, let's take a look at another incident on board our airplane. We have a brand new stewardess, and it's her first day on the job, and she wants to make an impression on the passengers, and that's exactly what she does. Because as she's walking down the aisle, carrying a boiling hot pot of coffee, she accidentally trips over somebody's foot and slops this boiling hot liquid into the lap of our second passenger. Now, what's his reaction as this boiling hot liquid hits his tender flesh? Does he go, oh man, that hurts? Yes, of course, he feels the pain. But then does he stand up out of his seat, unstrap the parachute, and throw it on the floor saying, the stupid parachute? No, of course not, why should he? He didn't put the parachute on to improve his flight, he put it on to save his life. And if anything, the hot coffee would cause him to cling tighter to the parachute and even look forward to the jump. If you and I have put on the Lord Jesus Christ for the biblical motive to flee from the wrath that's to come, when tribulation strikes, when the flight gets bumpy, we won't get angry at God, we won't lose our joy or peace. Why should we? We didn't come to Jesus for a happy lifestyle. We came because we had sinned against God and needed a Savior to save us from the wrath that's to come. And if anything, tribulation drives a true believer closer to the Savior. And sadly, we have literally multitudes of professing Christians who lose their joy and peace when the flight gets bumpy. Why? They're the product of a man-centered gospel. They came lacking repentance 
without which you cannot be saved. Think of the woman caught in the act of adultery. She had violated the seventh commandment. The law called for her blood. They were about to stone her. The law condemned her. And that's one of the functions of God's law. It condemns. Now you might say, wait a minute. That's not right. We can't go around condemning people. Well, that's true. We don't need to. They're condemned already. John 3.18 says, He that believes not is condemned already. All the law does is show a person himself in his true light. Some of you may identify with this. You've got a wooden table in your living room. You dust it down. It's clean. It's dust free. Then you draw back the curtains and let in the early morning sunlight. What do you see on the table? Dust. What do you see in the air? Dust. Did the light create the dust? No. The light merely exposed the dust. And when you and I take the time to draw back the curtains of the Holy of Holies and let the light of God's law shine upon a sinner's heart, all that happens is that he sees himself in truth. The commandment is a lamp and the law is light. That's why Paul says in Romans 7 verse 13, by the commandment, sin became exceedingly sinful. In other words, it was the law that showed Paul's sin in its true light. This next clip shows how little some people know about God's law. Can you name any of the Ten Commandments? Um, not to kill, thou shalt not kill. I know stealing's one of them. Let's see. Ten Commandments. I think there's ten of them. Okay, I don't know. Do you know any of the Ten Commandments? Can you name the Ten Commandments? No. Give me one. Bud, Bud Light, Corona, Heineken, Heineken, Budweiser, Old Style, uh, Red Zard, Bush, Red Wolf, Nestle White, Guinness, Foster's, Back. While that may seem funny to some, it's a sad reality that many people today know more about beer than they do about the Ten Commandments, God's moral standard. If someone does not know God's law, they will not see their sin as being exceedingly sinful, and their heart will not be prepared for the gospel. It's as simple as this. What farmer would take good seed and cast it on hard soil? Now, firstly, he prepares the soil. He breaks it up. Good seed, good soil, good harvest. And what modern evangelism does is it takes the good seed of the gospel and casts it on the hard, unregenerate heart of humanity. Biblical evangelism, without exception, is always law to the proud, grace to the humble. Never will you see Jesus giving the gospel, the good news, the grace of God to a proud, arrogant, self-righteous person. No, with the law, he breaks the hard heart. With the gospel, he heals the broken heart. Why did he do that? because he always did those things that please the Father. The Bible says God resists the proud and gives grace 
to the humble. Let me put it another way. What doctor would give a cure to a patient when the patient's not first convinced of his disease? Imagine I'm a doctor and I say to you, I've got this wonderful cure, but you're not convinced of the disease. You're going to pour it down the drain. And why shouldn't you? You don't appreciate it and there's no point in appropriating it. But if instead I say to you, you've got a terrible terminal disease, sit down. I can see 10 clear symptoms on your flesh. You're going to be dead in two weeks. And you say, oh, what should I do? Then I say to you, oh, don't worry, I've got a cure. Then you're going to grab it, you're going to appreciate it, and you're going to appropriate it because you've seen the disease that you might appreciate the cure. The disease is sin, and the cure is the gospel. And if we care about people, we must take the time to first help them see that they have the disease and help them understand the serious consequences of sin before Almighty God so that they will appreciate the cure of the gospel. I'd like to share with you now how I share my faith personally, how we put these principles into action. I love to read about how Jesus shared the gospel. And there's a beautiful example in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well, demonstrating how Jesus interacted with this woman. We like to call it the way of the master. It shows Jesus first relating to this woman in the natural realm, talking about natural things. And then he swings to the spiritual realm, talks about spiritual things. He brings conviction using the seventh commandment and then reveals himself as the Messiah. And I'll try to follow in his footsteps, so to speak, by talking with someone about everyday things and then deliberately swing to the subject of God. And sometimes I do this by bringing up uh, something religious that's occurred in the news, uh, just a general question like, hey, you ever think about what happens when you die? Hey, do you believe in God? Do you know any good churches around? Or I'll use a good gospel track to bring up the subject of spiritual things. I did this uh, not too long ago. I was on the golf course with uh, a friend of mine. And uh, we got on the subject of the things of God, and I asked him, I said, you believe in God? And he says, yeah. And he says, um, yeah, I used to go to church when I was a kid. And then I asked him, would you consider yourself to be a good person? And he said, yeah, I do. And then I asked, do you think you've kept the Ten Commandments? And remember, that's what Jesus used, the Ten Commandments, with that rich young ruler. And this man said to me, well, I've kept most of them. I mean, I've never murdered anybody. And I'm thinking, well, that's a good thing out here on the golf course. And I said, well, have you ever lied? And he said, yeah, of course. And then I said, what does that make you? What are you called? And he said, a liar. And then I said, have you ever stolen anything? That's the Eighth Commandment. And he said, uh, no. And sometimes I'll say to him, come on, I'm not sure I believe you. You just admitted to me you're a liar. And he said, okay, okay, okay. I did when I was younger. Yeah, I've stolen a few things. And then I asked him, are you familiar with the seventh commandment? You shall not commit adultery. But listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Have you ever done that? And this man said, oh yeah, plenty of times. And then I said to him, by your own admission, you're a lying thief and an adulterer at heart. And that's only three of the Ten Commandments. There's seven more pointed at you. You should have seen the look on his face. Well, he looked guilty because he knew he was guilty. And that's what the commandments do. They leave the whole world guilty. I mean, think about it, even for you, sitting right where you are. Do you think you've kept God's commandments? Look at the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. Jesus said to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength so much that your love for everyone else is like hatred compared to your love and devotion for God. Have you always loved God that much? Or the second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a graven image. Now, you can either make a false god with your hands or with your mind. Have you ever said something like this? My God is a God of love and mercy. He's not a God of judgment and would never send anyone to hell. Well, if you've said that, you're right. Your God never would send anyone to hell because he couldn't, because he doesn't exist. He's a figment of your imagination. You've created a God in your own mind that you're more comfortable with. You've created a God to suit your sins. It's called idolatry. 
And many people call that simply their own beliefs, but the Bible calls it idolatry, and idolaters will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Or the third commandment, you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Have you ever used God's name as a cuss word to express disgust? Something called blasphemy. Jesus warned every idle word a man speaks, he'll give an account thereof in the day of judgment. And the Bible says the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I went for 22 years as a non-Christian knowing that God had given me life and never once did I say, God, you gave me life. What do you require of me? One day in seven, I violated that commandment. Or well, the fifth, honor your father and mother. Have you always honored your parents implicitly in a way that's pleasing in the sight of God? Or the sixth commandment, you shall not kill or murder. Most of us think we're innocent with that one. But Jesus said, whoever is angry with his brother without cause is in danger of judgment. And the Bible says, he who hates his brother is a murderer. We've already looked at the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth. And who of us can say that we're not guilty of violating the tenth commandment, coveting, or being jealous, greedy for things that belong to other people? And remember, God even sees our thought life and the secret deeds done in darkness. James 2.10 says, He who keeps the whole law and violates it at just one point is guilty of all. Can you see how the commandments leave us all guilty? My friend could see that on the golf course, and so I asked him, If God were to judge you by the commandments, would you be innocent or guilty? He said, guilty. I said, so does that mean that you'd go to heaven or hell? And you know what he said? He said, heaven. Because God is forgiving. You just need to ask him. And I said to him, man, try that in a court of law. You're standing before a judge, guilty of a serious crime, and the judge says, what do you have to say before I pass sentence? And you stand up and say, judge, I'd just like to say that I believe you're a good man, and therefore, you'll let me go. Is the judge going to let you go if he's a good judge? Of course not. He'll probably say, because I'm a good man, I'm going to see that justice is served. Because I am a good man, I'm going to see that you're punished for what you've done. And the very thing that many people are hoping will save them on the Day of Judgment is the very thing that will condemn them. Because if God is good, then by nature, He will make sure that justice is served and that people are punished for what they've done. And the Bible says that God will punish sin wherever it's found. He'll punish murderers and rapists, but He won't stop there. God is so good, He'll also punish liars and thieves, adulterers, blasphemers, and all those who violate the inner light that God has given to every man. So I said to my friend, if God gave you justice, you wouldn't be headed for heaven, would you? But for hell. It's when he hung his head and his mouth was stopped that I knew the law, the commandments, had done their work. And he was ready for grace. I said, man, I want to tell you some great news. Put yourself in a courtroom. You're guilty of a serious crime with a million dollar fine or life in prison. You can't pay your fine when all of a sudden someone comes into the courtroom and pays your fine for you. I said, that's what God did for you and for me 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ stepped into the courtroom, so to speak, and paid our fine when he suffered and died on the cross. The Bible puts it like this, God demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We broke the law and Jesus paid our fine. It's as simple as that. And then he rose from the grave and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And then I told him, God commands him to repent and put his faith in Jesus Christ. We got to the end of the golf course and he put his, his face in his hands and began weeping in the middle of the parking lot, crying out to the Lord to forgive him. It was a beautiful thing, and he said to my wife the next day, that was the best day of my entire life, and golf had nothing to do with it. Please watch carefully as Ray uses the commandments in this clip to help a person see the disease of sin before he offers the cure of the gospel. Okay, can you name any of them? Um, yes, thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not 
Oh, all right, I know. Yeah. You know a few. Yeah, I know. Now, do you think you've kept those Ten Commandments? Um, yes. Have you ever told a lie? Well, at some times, you know, most every human does. So you broke that one? Yes. So what are you called if you tell a lie? A liar. Uh, have you ever stolen? No, sir, I haven't. Even something really small. Be honest before God. Well, I guess a little stuff. Like, okay. maybe like a piece of gum or something. Oh, just a piece of gum. So what does that make you? I just, oh, a stealer, I guess. Thief. See, the value of the thing you steal doesn't make any difference. If I open your wallet and just take out one dollar, it's as bad as taking out a hundred dollars. I'm a thief. And Jesus said, if, you, if we look at a woman and lust after her, we commit adultery with her in her heart. You ever done that? Um, no, sir. I, You've sorry. never looked at a woman with lust? Oh, um, well. <laughs> your friend over there is laughing at you. He doesn't think you're speaking the truth. Well, I mean, yes, I have looked at a woman, you know. So you've told another lie. All right. Yes. So you've really blown it, haven't you? So you've broken three commandments. We've only looked at three. We haven't looked at the other seven. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes, sir. So instead of using a four-letter filth word to express disgust, you've taken the name of the God who gave you life and used his name as a curse word, which is called blasphemy. So on Judgment Day, when God judges you by that standard, are you going to be innocent or guilty of breaking his commandments? I'll be guilty of that one. Do you think you'll go to heaven or hell? Um, well, I think, think I'd probably go to heaven in the sense that that's, that's one thing that from now on I'll try to improve myself and that God might forgive me for, all my, for the sins that I've broken from that. So do you think God should let murderers and liars and thieves and adulterers into heaven? I guess not. So you're in big trouble. Really, you're heading for hell, aren't you? Yeah. Does that concern you? Yes. Yes, it does. Because there's nothing more valuable, more valuable than your life, is there? Would you sell one of your eyes for a million dollars? No, sir. Because your eyes are precious to you, aren't they? And you, they're the windows of your soul. Your soul or your life looks out those, those eyes. Now, Jesus said, you ought to despise the value of your eye compared to the value of your soul. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it's better to enter heaven without an eye than go to hell with both your eyes. Now, do you know why Jesus died on the cross? Why he did? For, uh, for sinning. Sinning? Well, he died for our sins, for the sins of the world. Of everybody around the world, like you know, sacrificing himself for everyone else. Now, do you know how to uh, partake in that gift of salvation? Do you know what you should do? No. Well, if you were on a plane and you knew you had to jump and there was a parachute under the seat, what would you do? I'd take the parachute. Put it on. You wouldn't just believe in it, would you? You'd put it on. Yes. That's exactly what you have to do with Jesus. The Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to repent. That is, turn from your sins once and for all and put your faith in Jesus the same way you put your trust in a parachute. The moment you do that, the Bible says you'll pass from death to life. You'll come out of darkness into light and you'll receive God's gift of everlasting life. Perhaps you're a professing Christian and you're beginning to doubt the motive for your salvation. Well, the Bible says examine yourself and see if you're in the faith. And if you're not sure, make your calling and election sure. Go somewhere quiet. Confess your sins to God. Open the Bible at Psalm 51 and make it your own penitent prayer. We really want to thank you for taking the time to listen carefully to this teaching. Now, if you have questions, be like the Bereans and search the scriptures to see if these things are true. See you next time. of dinosaur fossils was thought to be a problem for creationists and for the biblical account of creation. Hi, my name is Eric, and what you're about to see is a powerful seminar that combines the last 30 years of research done by Dr. Hovind. It's in a field called cryptozoology, which is the study of hidden animals. The seminar is titled Dinosaurs and the Bible.
Well, thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be here at Hiles Anderson College in Indiana. How many have been to one of my seminars before or seen one of the videos before? Okay. And how many never have? And how many do not understand the question so far? Good. Same three as yesterday. Good. Um, well, my name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now for the last 16 years I've been an evangelist. I speak about 900 times a year now on the subject of creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And I take the position that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. And the evolution theory being taught in our schools in violation of the First Amendment is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of planet Earth. No dumber idea ever. Anyway, I live in Pensacola, Florida. I have three kids, one of each. Got them all married and the dog died. Praise God, I made it. I'm home free. And so far, four grandkids, and that's definitely God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. So <clears throat> hang in there, it'll be worth it all. All my family lives right around me, and they all work in our ministry. So it's great having uh, kids that love the Lord. And a couple of them are back here at the back table back there, and one running the camera. We have in our backyard in Pensacola, Florida, Dinosaur Adventure Land. I like dinosaurs. Our phone number is 479-DINO. Our website is Dr. Dino. Dinosaur Adventure Land's phone number is 478-DINO, 3466 for you alphabetically challenged folks. We like dinosaurs. We have thousands and thousands of visitors come. We've had probably close to 1,000 people get saved coming through our Dinosaur Adventure Land. Everything we do there has a science lesson and a spiritual lesson. We have a blast using dinosaurs for the glory of God. But you know, for the last 200 years, Christians have been extremely confused about where dinosaurs fit into the Bible. I heard a lady last night, I was talking to a witness to a lady at the hotel, she said, well, I got a friend that told me dinosaurs never existed. One guy told me, he said, well, the devil put those bones in the ground to fool us. <laughs> well, you're, you're going to look like a real idiot when talking to anybody with normal intelligence when you say something like that, okay? Yes, dinosaurs lived, but when did they live? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? Here are two of my grandkids playing with one of the dinosaurs at Dinosaur Adventure Land. We have a wonderful time. Christians, though, often are very confused of where they fit in. What's happened, Christians have compromised the clear teaching of the Bible in order to accommodate the dinosaurs. That's why they have the gap theory or the day-age theory or progressive creation or theistic evolution. There's no need to do that. I'm going to give you the biblical view of dinosaurs here this morning. Now, this guy in National Pornographic, a Geographic, says, no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. Now, just hold on a minute. Does he know that or does he think that? He thinks that. There is no possible way he could know something like that unless he talked to everybody that ever lived. Do you think he talked to Adam and Eve before he wrote that? Did he talk to you before he wrote that? No, okay. That's just not something you can know. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It says in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Well, if he made everything in six days, then Adam must have seen dinosaurs. It's just no two ways about it. And yesterday, we talked about seminar part two, what the Garden of Eden was like. It says, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, <clears throat> and let it divide the waters from the waters. We talked about how God originally created the world with a canopy of water overhead, which all fell down at the time of the flood. It's gone now. And there was most of the water under the crust of the earth, which all came shooting to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Psalm 136, he stretched out the earth above the waters. I don't know why Christians can read that and read right over it and not see what it's saying. The water that's now in the ocean used to be in the crust of the earth, but it all, it all came shooting out when the fountains of the deep broke open. We cover much more on that on video number six. What caused the flood in the days of Noah? We call it the Hoven theory, so nobody else will get blamed for it. But from the creation 6,000 years ago, up until the flood, 4,400 years ago, the world was very different. During that time frame, the Bible says the people lived over 900 years. They really, honestly did. Lived to be 900 plus. It's interesting, many ancient cultures have a legend about what they called the Golden Age. The Babylonians, the Sumerians, the Egyptians all talked about a time when man used to live to, near, to be nearly a thousand. Well, that's because it was really true. They really did live to be almost a thousand. And yesterday we covered how reptiles grow all their life. Reptiles never stop growing. So dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They did not live millions of years ago. So the obvious question would be, well, did, did Noah take dinosaurs on the ark? 
They asked Billy Graham, were there dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? Billy Graham said, no, nope, Noah's Ark did not include dinosaurs because they were extinct by the time man got here. Oh, and I praise God for all the good Billy Graham has done, but he is dead wrong about that one. Okay? Dinosaurs on the ark? Well, I hope he kept the woodpeckers in a steel cage of some kind. That'll be important later. <laughs> People say, dinosaurs on the ark? Now, Hoven, they're kind of big, aren't they? Yeah? The big ones were big, but the little ones were little. See, Noah was 600 years old when he built that boat, okay? He's probably smart enough to figure out, you don't have to bring the biggest ones you can find, okay? You bring two babies. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. That'll be important later, okay? <laughs> there are all kinds of reasons for bringing babies on the ark, okay? You bring babies because they're smaller. Well, duh. You know, the biggest dinosaur egg is smaller than a football. You bring babies because they weigh less, they eat less, they sleep a lot more. They're tougher. You know, kids fall down and bounce and get up and keep running. Adults fall down and break or lay there for a while. <laughs> Plus, you bring babies because after the flood, they're going to live longer to produce more offspring, and that's the reason you're bringing them. Why on earth would you bring big elephants on the ark? I mean, that would be stupid for multiple reasons, okay? Why would you bring big giraffes? Just bring babies of everything, young ones. God, and God told him to bring two of every sort, not two of every species, two of every sort. He said, bring them after his kind, after their kind, after his kind, after his kind. I mean, the Bible's, you know, real clear on the topic. You bring the kinds of animals, not the species. And you only have to bring those in whose nostrils was the breath of life, and only those on dry land. Noah did not have to bring any fish on the ark. They had plenty of water outside, okay? He also did not have to bring any bugs on the ark, because bugs don't have nostrils. Bugs breathe through their skin, through spiracles. Insects were not required to be on the ark. Insects can survive a flood just fine. Go any place where there's been a flood, after the water goes down, walk out into the mud and tell me the first thing you notice. Bugs bite a bazillions, right? Yeah, insects did not have to go on there. Some of them might have been on there, but they didn't have to be. Noah did not take 400 pairs of dogs on the ark. Noah probably never saw a chihuahua in his life. Why did somebody do that to the dog? All that special breeding to create a dog that's 100% useless. <laughs> Noah probably just had a generic dog like my dog, Nikki. We had Nikki for 12 years before I knew what kind of dog it was. A friend of mine came to the house one day and he said, Hoven, you have got a full-blooded Canardly. I said, a what? He said, your dog, look at that, that's a Canardly. I said, it is? He said, well, look at it, man. You can hardly tell what kind of dog it is. <laughs> ah, yeah, full-blooded, can hardly, yep. <laughs> Probably the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor, like this Mexican textbook says. And I would agree, the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor, but it looked like a horse, okay? Four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery, I mean, all the horse equipment, okay? <laughs> Skeptics say, how did Noah fit those millions of animals onto the ark? Well, in the first place, he only brought land animals, okay? Secondly, you bring those with nostrils, no bugs. Uh, thirdly, you bring babies. Now, that's just plain old common sense, right? Fourthly, you bring two of each kind, not every single variety. And since God made the kinds, and God told Noah how big to build the boat, I bet God had it kind of figured out, you know, about what size to make it, you know? Plus, how many were there? Many experts will tell you there are about 8,000 basic kinds of animals in the world. 8,000 basic kinds of animals. Noah had two of each kind, now seven of some, I understand. But plenty of room on the ark for that. St. Matthias say, well, Adam could never name all those animals in one day. Oh, come on. When I get excited, I can speak 350 words a minute. At 300 words a minute, you can name all the animals in 26 minutes. Dog, cat, elephant, aardvark, hamster. I mean, come on, it's not a big deal. Plus, you've got to figure, Adam had an extremely high IQ. I mean, he came straight from the hand of God, fully programmed. He could speak every language in the world. Well, there's only one, okay. I mean, the guy could walk, talk, name all the animals, and get married first day. This guy's super high IQ, okay? No problem naming all the animals in a half hour. Okay, what's next, all right? What else you got for me, God? Plus, how big was the ark? I have atheists that I debate all the time. They'll say, well, Noah could never put all those animals on the ark. I say, really? How many were there? They say, well, we don't know. Oh, well, how big was the boat? Well, we don't know. All we know is he couldn't do it. Oh, I see. <laughs> is that the way this works? Okay. It beats what they believe. 
They believe 18 or 20 billion years ago, there was a big bang where nothing exploded and made everything. And 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down and formed a rocky crust. Yes, the planet earth cooled and a rocky surface was created. And then as the earth formed, the surface was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. This textbook says there was no oxygen on the earth, 0% oxygen, but the rocks absorbed it. So what? I've been trying to figure that one out for four years. But anyway, then oceans formed as it rained on the rocks for millions of years. Millions of years of torrential rains created the oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Boy, it sure is. It don't even happen. That's how slow it is. <laughs> Life on Earth may have begun in rocks on the ocean floor. Wow, all came from a rock. The first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So according to their theory, 20 billion years ago there was a big bang. 4.6 billion years ago the Earth formed. It was a hot ball of rock. And then it began to rain and rain and rain and rain and rain and rain. And finally the oceans filled in. And in the oceans the first living organisms appeared. So great, 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 grandpa was soup. <laughs> That's the evolution theory. I didn't make it up, but they did. So, you know, you can laugh at them if you like, as far as I'm concerned. But Now, I, I asked me to come speak at this college in Boston one time. This uh, pastor, I was going to speak at the church. I said, brother, call some of the colleges and see if you can have a debate. I love to do debates against these guys in front of their own university. Well, he called every college within 100 miles of Boston. There a lot of them. There's a lot of colleges around Boston. And... Finally, one college said, no, we don't want him to come have a debate, but he can come speak to our students if our professors can ask him any questions they would like. Because we would like to show our students how dumb you Christians really are. I said, I would be honored to come for that. <laughs> so I showed up. There were six professors, all their students. I felt like Daniel in the lion's den, you know. I got my two timelines out over there, and I said, now, folks, I believe the Bible. Nobody cheered. I said, I believe 6,000 years ago God made everything, and 4,400 years ago there was a flood when, you know, everything got destroyed in the, in the flood. And then Noah had two of each kind, not species, kind on the ark. Now, since then, there's been a whole lot of new varieties produced. And then I told them what they believe, because most of them don't know what they believe. You've got to tell them, you know. I said, you guys believe 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. This one professor was getting very angry. <clears throat> I seemed to do that to them. <clears throat> he said, Mr. Hoven, do you realize there are nearly 400 varieties of dogs in the world today? I said, sir, I have no idea how many, but 400 sounds good. He said, do you mean to tell me that you believe all those dogs came from two dogs on Noah's Ark? You want me to believe that? I said, sir, uh, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all those dogs came from a rock. He didn't have any more questions after that. <laughs> I did a debate one time in university, and afterwards this lady came walking down the aisle. Boy, she was mad. The smoke was coming out her nose. She was angry at me. She came walking straight up toward me. I said, Lord, I'm coming home. <laughs> she walked up, put her hands on her hips, and she said, Tonight, you told everybody that we believe we come from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, Ma'am, you need to calm down. You're going to blow a gasket. I said, ma'am, do you believe in evolution? She said, yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, well, ma'am, would you please tell me then where we came from? She said, we came from a macro molecule. I said, and where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, and where did that come from? She said, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. You could see it was slowly dawning on her. You know, I do believe I come from a rock. Yes, ma'am, you do. Better be careful going outside. Don't step on Grandpa. <laughs> I found her life verse saying to a stock, Thou art my father, to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. There's Grandpa right there. Yep, yep. I even found my daddy's life verse in the Bible. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. Anyway, the Bible says the earth was corrupt and filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and it was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark. 
And Noah said to his boys, boys, go for wood. We've got to build a boat. And so they went and got all this wood, and they built this huge boat. Now, after the flood was over, Noah's son had a baby and named him Arphaxad. Why would anybody name a kid Arphaxad? <laughs> Can't you see that kid in kindergarten? What's your name, son? Arphaxad? Do you know how to spell it? No. <laughs> Nobody does. But don't you think one day little Arphaxad's getting big enough? He's sitting on Grandpa's lap, and he's looking around like kids do. <laughs> he says, hey, Grandpa, I have a, I have a question. Uh, how come we're the only people in the whole world? You mean we got this whole planet to ourselves? <laughs> what, what happened? <laughs> and Grandpa's going to tell him the story about the flood. Actually, they're going to talk about that flood for a long time. We're down in Pensacola. We're going to be talking about Hurricane Ivan for a long time. <laughs> okay? And that's just one little storm. Can you imagine a worldwide flood? Man, they talk about that for centuries. Actually, our fact said's daddy, Shem, Noah's son, lived long enough to tell that story directly to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You'll never catch that reading your Bible, but when you graph it out, it's like, wow. That's unbelievable. Do you know they're still talking about that flood in many cultures around the world? So far, 270 flood legends have been identified in different countries and cultures around the world. The Hawaiians have a legend that says, Long after the death of Kunihana, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. He made a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Huh, one family saved in a boat full of animals. Sounds kind of like the Bible story, doesn't it? The Chinese have a legend called the Hiking Classic. They say that Fuhai is the father of their civilization. Fuhai is probably Noah. Okay? The story says, Fuhai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped a great flood. He and his family were the only people alive on earth. After the great flood, they repopulated the world. Interesting. Now, the Mexican, the Tolik Indians in Mexico have a very interesting story. They said, the first world lasted 1,716 years and was destroyed by a flood that covered the highest mountains. One family named Cox Cox survived. 1,716 years. Well, the Bible dates add up to uh, 1656 from the creation to the flood. But that's not bad for a legend 4,000 years old. Question, why would there be nearly 300 flood legends? Uh, I think it's because there was a flood. That's my theory. Okay. Probably the Atlantis legend, everybody's searching for the lost continent of Atlantis. Probably it's another flood legend. As far as the folks on the boat were concerned, the whole world sank beneath the waves. Actually, they were going up. The world wasn't going down. I think Atlantis is another flood story. Anyway, if you look at the country of Turkey, at the far right-hand side, you will see a mountain called Mount Ararat. It is 12 miles from the Russian border. Very politically unstable region. On a Turkish map, it's called Noah Ungumshi, which means Noah's big boat. That's the name of the region. They've got signs. You drive right up to it. Noah's big boat. This way, five kilometers. The Bible says the ark rested in the seventh month. <clears throat> now that's interesting. Noah did not get out till the 13th month. Why would he stay in there for five and a half extra months after the ark rested? Well, we cover all the reasons why on video number six, the Hoban theory, but the Bible says it rested in the seventh month upon the mountains of Ararat. Mountains, plural. The Bible does not say the ark landed on Mount Ararat. Read it carefully. It does not say that. It says it landed in the mountains of Ararat. Actually, there are four theories about what happened to Noah's ark. Okay. One theory says they took it apart and used the lumber for buildings. Second theory says it rotted. The third theory says it's still on the mountain. And the fourth theory says it's in the valley. And the guys who think it's on the mountain go over there every couple years on a big expedition. They climb the mountain. They all come back and say, you know, we almost found it. I'm not sure how you can know you almost found something. But anyway, that's what they say. And maybe, they, maybe it's there. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me at all. Okay. But other folks think, hey, guys, it's not even on that mountain. It's down in the valley, 17 miles away, and they think that is Noah's Ark right there, that boat-shaped object, kind of a teardrop shape. In 1960, this was discovered by high-altitude surveillance plane. In 1978, there was an earthquake, and either it lifted up or the ground dropped down. I don't know. The result's the same. It is now sticking up out of the ground about 18, 20 feet. Hmm. Ron Wyatt died in 99. He was a good friend of mine. 
He and many others have spent years studying this thing, but they think it's Noah's Ark. And like I said, honestly, I don't know and I don't care. I don't, it doesn't matter to me where it is. And some Christians and creationists get all upset with anybody that mentions there might be another theory besides theirs. Look, my, my approach to any subject if, is if there's more than one option, tell everybody all the options and say, here's the various theories on this. Here's why I believe this one, but go ahead and research yourself. I think you ought to look at all the options. Um, Richard Reeves took over for Ron. There he is in front of his uh, model of Noah's Ark that he built. But according to them, the Ark has collapsed. Obviously, a boat that old would, you know, cave in and fold out to the side. It's splayed. And so one of the arguments the skeptics use is, well, it's too wide to be Noah's Ark. Well, of course it's too wide. Boats all do that. They fall outwards. You can go to any old rotten boat someplace, you'll see the same effect. But radar scans show that there are deck timbers, some kind of huge timbers in there. Apparently, uh, some kind of big structure. They find iron rivets in there. The Ark was bolted together. They knew about iron back then. Not a problem. You can see some of the rivets at the Wyatt Museum, south of Nashville, Tennessee. It used a laminated wood, three layers of wood glued together with a tar-like substance, pitch, made from tree sap. And apparently it's like basic plywood, okay? Huge, thick layers of wood. And there's no grain in the wood. Interesting. It's almost like the trees didn't have growing seasons, the wood they were using. Anyway, the Wyatt Museum is a converted gas station just south of Nashville at exit 27 on the northwest corner. You can stop down there and see them. Mrs. Wyatt wrote a book called The Dooms Boat Shaped Object on Doomsday Mountain with all the research she and her husband had done on that. Apparently the ark landed close to Mount Ararat, got stuck in the mud. Everybody got off and left and at some time later there was a mud flow or, and or a lava flow that pushed the ark down and broke the bottom off. What used to be the, the keel full of uh, ballast for weight to keep it upright was broken off and it's way up near the mountain and the ark has apparently moved down several miles from where it used to be. It used to be way over here at the left at a little village called Kazan, which in Turkish means village of eight. Village of eight. Now, wait a minute. There was eight people on that boat. But apparently the ark has drifted down from where it used to be, and that's another long story. But the government of Turkey has studied all this, and they say, yep, that's Noah's Ark. They even built a visitor center. Now, some folks have said, oh, it's not Noah's Ark. It's a boat-shaped object. It's just a, t it's just a flow stone. It's, it's flow formation around a stationary object. When mud flows around something, it makes that teardrop shape like an airplane wing. Yes, I understand. It does. You're right. But the pointed end of the teardrop is always downstream. The rounded end is upstream, like an airplane wing. This one's backwards. There are flow formations in that area, no question. But this is not one of them. One guy argued, it's just a fort. Who would build a fort under a hill? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> the guys throw rocks down inside, you know? <laughs> anyway, some creationists say it's not Noah's Ark, and they get mad at me for even mentioning Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to mention it until I start working for you, and then I'll quit, okay? But uh, the Bible says the Ark will be 300 cubits long. Now, a cubit is elbow to fingertip. I'm six foot one. My cubit is 21 inches. The average standard Egyptian cubit was 20.65, just a hair shorter than mine. That boat-shaped object is uh, 515 feet long, which is 300 Egyptian cubits. So that doesn't prove it's the ark, but it is interesting. It is the right size, okay? It's about two-thirds the size of the Titanic, about two football fields long. Pretty good-sized boat. In that region near the village of Kazan, they found 12 giant rocks that weigh 9,000 pounds. These rocks appear at Kazan, 9,000 pound rocks, and they have holes in the top. Apparently, this rock was to be held over the side of the boat to be what's called an anchor stone or a drogue stone. And the hole in the top of the rock is curved. I have drilled a lot of holes in my life. I've done a lot of building construction. I don't know how you would drill a curved hole through a rock. But there they are. When the Sea of Galilee dried up quite a bit here 10 years ago, it exposed all kinds of beach that had never been exposed in centuries. And all around there, they found hundreds of small rocks with holes in them. It's a common practice in stormy areas like that to put rocks around the side of the boat to keep the boat stabilized. Give it some weight. If it gets windy, you drop them down into the water, and you now have a sea anchor all the way around the boat. But anyway, there are a lot of folks who think these rocks were actually drogue stones or sea anchors for Noah's Ark. What this would do... This would make, make the boat stable during stormy weather. It's almost like you're anchored to the water, if you can imagine that. And if it really gets windy, the rocks are going to drag behind you, and now you're always perpendicular to the waves. You can't capsize. Hmm. One atheist wrote me a letter. He said, Hoven, 
I heard your seminar about Noah's Ark having big rocks hanging over the side. You are so stupid. Don't you know if he had rocks hanging all over the boat, it would slow him down? <laughs> I wrote back, where was he going? <laughs> there is no place to go, okay? The whole world's underwater, okay? He's just trying to float. You see, Noah, the instructions are real simple. Get in, sit down, float, land, get out, okay? <laughs> you don't have to go anywhere. No sails. You don't have to steer the boat, okay? One atheist said, well, a sailboat was built with six masts, and it, it leaked so bad because of the twisting from the sails. Well, Noah's Ark didn't have any sails, okay? It just was designed to float. And some people think it might have had a moon pool in the center because a long ship has trouble going over the waves. It tends to lift up, and the ends are exposed, and it tends to flex or break in the middle. Well, if Noah's Ark had a moon pool, that would solve the problem. What it is, it's a hole in the center. As the waves go up and down, the water goes up and down inside that hole. Of course, you've got a wall built up on the inside. It's called a moon pool. As the water goes up and down inside that moon pool, going over the waves, it acts like a giant piston, <laughs> forcing fresh air in and out of the boat every time you hit a wave. You might actually pray for a good wave once in a while. Hey, Lord, we're about to feed the elephants. Would you please send a wave? Yeah. Anyway. What happened to the dinosaurs when Noah got off the ark? You know, the question of what happened to the dinosaurs has been used in schools to start a conversation about evolution for a long time. One of Satan's favorite tools to use is dinosaurs because kids love them. I spoke at a public school one time to 300 first graders. Try that sometime. I drove a church bus for 17 years and taught junior church for 17 years. And, um, there were 300 first graders in this room, I'm speaking, and I got my dinosaurs out, and I said, boys and girls, I got a question for you. When did dinosaurs live? I mean, instantly, all of them shouted out, millions of years ago. I thought, now, wait a minute. These kids are in first grade, okay? They can barely read. How do they believe that already? Where have the Christians been teaching the truth about creation? Why are we waiting until the kids get their mind polluted with evolution and then trying to win them back? Why don't we just not lose them to begin with? Why hasn't there been a Christian response to this dinosaur stuff? Where, the, what the Christians did in the 1800s is they compromised their Bible with the gap theory to accommodate the dinosaurs, and then they let Satan have the dinosaurs. That's what happened, exactly. But anyway, there are 16 theories of what happened to the dinosaurs. One theory says an asteroid struck the Yucatan Peninsula in you know, Mexico and killed them 65 million years ago. A scientist here in Indiana said, the dinosaurs killed themselves off with their own flatulence. <laughs> they could not stand the heat. I'm not sure what to do about a theory like that, but here's the real reason they went extinct. Mm, smoking. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what, what made the dinosaurs go extinct? Do you realize they're asking the wrong question? The question is not what made them go extinct. The question is, did they go extinct? See, the liberals are always real good at getting us to argue about the wrong subject. They're always asking me, should we have creation taught in public schools? I say, that's a good question, and I will be glad to discuss that. However, there's another question we should ask first, okay? The real question is, should we have public schools? Mm -hmm. Let's argue that one for a while first, okay? And if we're going to have them, then we'll discuss what should be taught in them and who decides what is taught in them. I mean, does Bill Clinton decide what's taught, or does Osama bin Laden decide what's taught, or maybe you should decide, maybe I should decide. See, the whole problem is, some people have this idiot idea that children belong to the state. No, no, no. You see, children belong to God, and they are entrusted to parents. And the parents should decide what God wants them to be taught. The state does not ever have any children. It is sterile, okay? It can't have children. Okay, so they want to steal yours. That's another long, interesting story. But anyway, the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution says the federal government only has certain very limited powers, and anything else is left to the states. The federal government has no business being involved in education or welfare or hurricane relief or anything else. No business at all. If you want to see why the schools went public, get this many good articles, one by Samuel Blumenfeld that's incredible about why we have a public school system. It's all part of the plan for a new world order. Big part of the plan. Get our college class, CSE 102. 
I teach college classes on creation where we go into much more detail, you know, chase every rabbit and kick every dog, and you can get that if you get time. But anyway, dinosaurs getting off the ark had a very difficult time. The climate had changed. Things were different. Remember, before the flood, they lived to be 900. Read your Bible. After the flood, they only lived to be 400, and then 200, and then 100. Something changed. Well, for one thing, that canopy overhead was gone. Number two, the soil was now not loaded with minerals like it's supposed to be to have plants grow like crazy. And the atmospheric pressure was different. The canopy had collapsed. It was gone, I believe. Sunlight was now getting through, radiation, etc. Much, Many more problems in the post-flood environment. Dinosaurs had two problems. Number one, the climate change. Number two, was probably worse, people hunted them. They killed them. Now, they didn't call them dinosaur, though. They called them dragon. See, the word dinosaur wasn't made up till 1841. So for most of human history, these creatures are called dragons. Did you know dinosaurs not even in the dictionary in 1891? For most of human history, they were known as dragons. Now, dra dragons are mentioned in the Bible 34 times. People say, why aren't dinosaurs in the Bible? Last night, I'm talking to this lady at the counter at the hotel. She said, well, dinosaurs aren't in the Bible. I said, that's correct. That word wasn't made up till 1841. And if you got the right Bible, that was translated 1611. So, of course, you're not going to find that word in there. Uh, duh. But they called them dragons. Dragons are listed in the dictionary in 1946 as now rare. <laughs> hmm. As the population of people began to grow after the flood, the population of dragons began to go down because nobody wants to live next door to a dragon. <laughs> Same thing happened in Cobb County, Georgia, where Atlanta is today. Do you realize how many grizzly bears there are roaming around the woods right now near Atlanta, Georgia? Zero. Do you know how many there were just 300 years ago? Hundreds. What happened to the grizzly bears in Cobb County, Georgia? Well, as people move in and civilize an area, the big ferocious animals are killed off or driven off. Happens everywhere. If it came on the evening news tonight that there were five grizzly bears roaming around Cobb County, you know what would happen by 6 o'clock in the morning? They'd all be dead. Because every redneck in four states would be out there with a rifle trying to shoot one. Right? And whoever could shoot the biggest one would be a hero. They'd have his picture on the front page. Hey, Bubba shot the grizzly bear and saved the village. Yeah, he did. Well, that's exactly what happened to the dragons. Man, if you could figure out a way to kill a dragon, they'd be telling stories about you around the campfire from now on. People kill dragons for meat because they were a menace to prove you're a hero, to prove you're superior, competition for land, or for medicinal purposes. Many ancient recipes call for dragon blood, dragon bones, dragon saliva. Why? Gilgamesh is famous for slaying a dragon. A Chinese legend tells about a guy named Yu that surveyed the land of China. It says after the flood, he surveyed the land and divided it into sections. He built channels to drain the water off to the sea and make the land livable again. Many snakes and dragons were driven from the marshlands. Yeah, that's just normal. If you want to build a city, you've got to you know, drive off the dragons and then build your city. I mean, it was expected. You've got to drive the dragons off. Okay? Why would the Chinese calendar have 11 real animals, you know, the pig, the duck, the dog, and a dragon? Why would they put a mythical animal in there? Could it be that at the time they came up with these 12 symbols, there were 12 real animals? Hmm? Here's one of the oldest pieces of pottery on planet Earth. It's a piece of slate from Egypt, first dynasty of United Egypt. It shows long-necked dragons. We make replicas of it if you want to get one for a prize for your bus route, for some give out to the kid who does whatever, you know. You, they go crazy over this thing. It's half-size replicas of the oldest pieces of pot piece of pottery on Earth. Why would they put long-necked dinosaurs on pottery... 3,800 years ago. Hmm. Here's two long-necked dinosaurs with a sheep in between their mouths. Here's a hippo tusk from the 12th century B.C. showing an animal with a long neck and a long tail. Here's a cylinder seal showing what appears to quite obviously be long-necked dinosaurs. The Bible talks about a fiery flying serpent in Isaiah 14. Wait a minute, a fiery flying serpent? Well, if you read the story of Herodotus... Herodotus says he went to a certain place in Arabia, almost exactly opposite Buto, to make inquiries concerning the winged serpents. On my arrival, I saw the backbones and ribs of serpents in such numbers as it's impossible to describe. The winged serpent is shaped like the water snake, 
Its wings are not feathered, but resemble very closely those of the bat. The people where the bones lie at the entrance of a narrow gorge between steep mountains. The story goes that with the spring, the winged snakes come flying from Arabia towards Egypt, but are met in this gorge by the bird called Ibises, who forbid their entrance and destroy them all. The book of Josephus talks about the fiery flying serpent that Moses came, had to kill when he came to the land of Ethiopia. And he ended up marrying the princess of the Ethiopians, and which is why his sister got mad at him later for marrying an Ethiopian. Not because she was black necessarily, but because of how this all happened. You read the story in Josephus' book. Anyway, in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it talks about in 793 A.D. about the fiery dragons flying across the firmament. The Babylonian god Marduk has shown pictured on a fire-breathing dragon. You say, Brother Hovah, now you don't believe in fire-breathing dragons, do you? Yeah, I believe there were some. We cover all that in our videotape about Leviathan, but Job chapter 41 talks about Leviathan. It says, Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke. You know, I've seen deacons do that at Southern Baptist churches. Okay, so that's no big deal. But uh, his breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Now, wait, wait, wait. Was there really a fire-breathing dragon? Well, you better watch the Leviathan video about the fire-breathing dragon. But if you get a Catholic Bible... You find the book of Daniel has two extra chapters in it. It's part of the Apocrypha books, okay? Daniel 13 and 14. Very interesting reading, definitely not scripture, okay? But in Daniel 14, it says, There was a great dragon in the place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now that this is not a living God. Adore him, therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but that is no living God. But give me leave, that's permission, you military guys know about leave, okay? And I will kill this dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give thee leave. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and boiled them together and made lumps and put them into the dragon's mouth and the dragon burst asunder. What a strange story. Let me give you the Hoven translation, okay? The Bible tells us that Daniel was a man who understood science. Those are the kind that Nebuchadnezzar took away at that time, okay? And Daniel would have known full well that pitch is made from tree sap, and it's very sticky. Fat is salty tasting, and almost all animals like things that are salty tasting, and hair won't digest. So he made little lumps of pitch, fat, and hair, tossed them in. The dragon loved them, swallowed them, couldn't digest them, and they plugged up his intestinal tract. And these were the days before Roto-Rooter, and so he burst asunder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you figure it out, okay? Anyway, Saddam bin Sain... Hussein has quite an ego problem. He thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein. I wondered, why does he call him Saddam? His name is Saddam. Well, Saddam means prince. Saddam means horse's rear end. <laughs> so he called him Saddam Hussein. <laughs> anyway, uh, Saddam issued currency with his picture in front of Nebuchadnezzar. Saddam spent a fortune rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. But you know, ancient Babylon was discovered, buried in the dry sand over there. The bricks were just nearly perfectly preserved by the dry sand. So they excavated ancient Babylon and rebuilt it. Babylon was totally rebuilt in the last 20 or 30 years, I believe. Saddam put a brick about every 10 feet around the wall that says, I am Saddam Hussein. I have rebuilt Babylon the Great. I am the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. But on that wall, they found carvings of lions, and carvings of dragons. Now, I can understand why they'd put a lion on there. I mean, we know about lions, but why would they put carvings of dragons on a brick wall 2,600 years ago? Uh, maybe because they knew about uh, dragons? Hmm? They're still there. You can go see them. A friend of mine was there, a soldier. He said, yep, they're still here. Dragons still on the wall from 2,600 years ago. Ishtar Gate is covered in them. Lions and dragons. Hmm. Now, we made a model of it for Dinosaur Adventure Land. If you want to come to Pensacola, that's a little closer to Iraq for most of you. But Alexander the Great said his soldiers were scared by dragons when they conquered part of India in 300 B.C. This Roman mosaic shows two long-necked dragons fighting or kissing. Now, that would be necking. Wow. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> how, did, how did the Romans know about dragons in 200 A.D.? St. George is famous for slaying a dragon in 275 A.D. Beowulf slew two dragons, and the third one killed him. 
You should try to read the Beowulf story in Old English. <laughs> Good luck. That's English. 1,500 years ago, that was English. I can only read one word on the page. It says, duh. <laughs> but anyway, when they translate the story to modern English, the story tells us Beowulf killed Grendel the dragon by pulling off one of its arms, and the creature bled to death. Pulled off his arm? Well, they found a Babylonian cylinder seal showing a guy pulling the arm off a dragon. Interesting. Get the book After the Flood if you want a whole lot more on dragons living with man. But there's a city in France that's famous because a dragon came up out of the water and a guy killed it and cut the head off and stuck it over the corner of the building. The head of the dragon was mounted on his building. They called it the gargoyle. How many of you have ever heard of the gargoyle? They still do that today. You can buy these ugly little critters. You put them on your building or whatever over your door. Well, the word gargoyle means throat. We get our word gargle, gurgle, regurgitate, gorge, and glutton from that word. It has to do with the throat. So next time you gargle, you can think about slaying a dragon. You say, Brother Hovind, I am slaying a dragon when I gargle. Mm, okay, anyway. An Irish writer said they killed a dragon with iron nails on its tail. Well, Stegosaurus certainly had big spikes on his tail, that's for sure. So did several other animals, but there's a Viking woodcut showing a dragon swallowing a guy. This is from the 11th century, a thousand years ago, okay? The Vikings put dragon heads on their ships a thousand years ago. Why would they do that? Well, they knew about the great dragon of the sea. They called it the Kraken. Again, Bill Cooper's got a lot on that in his book, but uh, the famous Nor uh, Icelandic hero Siegfried slew the dragon Fafnir. As a castle, bricks were found in a castle from the 12th century showing dragons. There's a 12th century castle in Germany with dragons on it. Why would they put dragons on their castles? Marco Polo lived in China for 17 years. When he came back, he said, the emperor is raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Why would he say that? Oh, probably because the emperor was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Mm -hmm. That's my theory. Yeah, okay. In 1611, they appointed the post of royal dragon feeder. Why do you need a royal dragon feeder? Uh, let me guess, uh, to feed the dragon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, right, okay. There's a 13th century castle with dragons on it. There's a gray from the 15th century showing, in, carved in brass, two long-necked dinosaurs. 16th century castle has dragons on it. We've got seven coins in our museum on loan. They're silver dollars from 1500s to 1600s, real silver dollars. All of them show somebody slaying a dragon. It was common 400 years ago. Everybody knew about slaying dragons. Of course, you've got to slay the dragon. You know, that's just standard procedure. Save the dragon, rescue the princess, or whatever. I don't know. But here's a Russian medallion showing a guy killing a dragon. Bulgarian postage stamp has somebody killing a dragon. The crest of Lithuania shows somebody killing a dragon. A city in France was renamed Nurluk to honor the man who slew the dragon. Indians carved dinosaurs on the walls of the Grand Canyon. Why would they put dinosaurs on the walls of Grand Canyon? Maybe because they hunted dinosaurs around there. Mm -hmm. In 1925, some guys took a raft trip down one of the canyons out west, and they wrote a report. They saw one of these dinosaurs, and they said, the fact that some prehistoric man <clears throat> made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories. Oh, they upset his theories. Oh, no. Uh, he said, about a year ago, a photograph of a dinosaur was shown to a scientist of national repute who was then specializing in dinosaurs. He said, it's not a dinosaur, it's impossible, because we know dinosaurs were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on Earth. <laughs> oh, hold on just a minute, okay? First place, it's not possible for you to know what happened 12 million years ago, okay? So let's just get that straight first up, okay? Secondly, notice he said 12 million. Now, today the kids are taught dinosaurs died 65 million years ago, aren't they? 65 million years ago? It's interesting to see the inflation of the age of the earth. See, in 1770, <clears throat> they said the earth was 70,000 years old. By 1902, it was 2 billion years old. 1969, it was 3.5 billion years old. Today, it's 4.6. Did you know the earth is getting older at the rate of 21 million years per year? <laughs> That's 40 years per minute. Okay, it's aging rapidly, folks. Anyway, you go to Blanding, Utah, you'll see carvings of dinosaurs on the cliff there. Apparently, they knew about dinosaurs in Utah. The Indians knew about them. They killed them, apparently. This is a cave painting in Australia showing a guy running away from what appears to be a dinosaur. 
I can't pronounce the name of this place in Canada, Mishap uh, something or other here, but it looks like these Indians have painted something on the cliff there that appears to be like a dinosaur with a dermal frill ridged on its back. This is a painting from Australia. These guys are all dancing around what quite obviously looks like a dinosaur. Apparently, they're upset because it ain't their friend. Okay, there's the friend inside. You know, give him back, please, right now. Anyway, um, this guy says nobody's ever seen a dinosaur. Well, why did they put them on their cave paintings? Why did they put them on ancient pottery? Why, did, why do we see so many legends of dragons if nobody's ever seen one? Down in Peru, they've got the driest desert in the world. It's only rained twice in 400 years, is my understanding. When the Spanish came across there in 1500s, they found white lines on the desert. They were obviously man-made. Somebody piled up the rocks. There's a pile of white rocks that goes sometimes for miles, straight as an arrow. These are today are called the Nazca lines. How many of you have ever heard of the Nazca images? They got all these images down there and down in Peru. You can study that if you'd like. But strange, these images are interesting. But one of them shows a spider, which has no eyes, and one leg is longer than the rest. And for centuries, everybody thought, well, these were poor, ignorant, stupid people. You know, they forgot to put the eyes on and they made the one leg longer by an accident. Recently, there was a spider discovered in the Amazon jungle a thousand miles away. It only lives in caves. It is extremely rare. It's supposed to be one of the rarest spiders on Earth. It's an eighth of an inch long, little tiny spider, lives a thousand miles away in the dark, in the caves. The spider has no eyes. And during mating season, that one particular leg grows longer, and it exchanges DNA off the tip of that leg for 15 seconds. How did they know that in Peru, a thousand miles away? Maybe they weren't so stupid after all, hmm? Anyway, in 1535, the Spanish conquistadors came through that area and they found stones with strange animals on them. They sent some back to the king of Spain and said, what on earth are these animals carved on these rocks? The king said, I have no clue. Today they're called the Ica burial stones from Ica, Peru. Dennis Swift is probably the world's expert on those. He's one of my good friends from Portland, Oregon. He did a great session at our boot camp in uh, 95, I mean in 2005, our creation boot camp we have in Pensacola, Florida. And we've got his DVDs about him speaking on the Ica stones. Oh, it's incredible. You can still get those on our website. But these stones show dinosaurs on them. The Nazca burial stones from about the time of Christ, plus or minus a few hundred years. Some of them show brain surgery. They find brain surgery instruments, hardened copper, tempered copper instruments for cutting into people's heads, apparently. They, some of them show heart uh, surgery, limb reattachment, steam engine. One of them showed what looks like a steam engine. Strange things are found on these Ica stones in Peru, but quite a few of them, over 500, I believe, show dinosaurs. Why would they have dinosaurs and humans on the same stones? Well, because people lived with uh, dinosaurs. Anyway, there's plenty on that. There's one from our museum. Shows a dinosaur holding a guy by the head. This one we've got shows what appears to be a guy cutting the head off the dragon because the dragon killed his friend. You can see the friend's body is inside, but his head's missing. So his buddy's just doing what the Bible says. You know, vengeance is fine, saith the Lord. <laughs> something, something like that. But uh, this guy's jabbing one through the throat with a spear. This one's hard to see, but he's shoving the spear down the dragon's throat. This one, the dragon's got the guy by the arm, and apparently his spirit is leaving. He's flying off into heaven or wherever they go when they die in their culture, you know. This guy's got the knife stuck in the dragon's head, and the dragon's biting the guy. We've got eight of these stones in Pensacola, Florida. It's the largest collection in America, I believe, at $1,500 each. You know, not too many people have these things, but some of them show circles on the side. Now, that's kind of interesting. Why would they put circles on the side of the dinosaurs? Well, nobody ever found dinosaur skin until about 20 years ago when fossilized dinosaur skin was found. It's very interesting, the dinosaur skin has circle patterns on it. They had to see a live one to know to put that on the stones, because you couldn't tell that from the bones. We've got some dinosaur skin in our museum in Pensacola. Recently, they just found uh, uh, unfossilized soft dinosaur tissue. Soft dinosaur tissue? So now the brilliant scientists are trying to figure out how could tissue stay soft for 70 million years? The thought will never cross their brain to question that maybe it's not 70 million years old. I mean, that thought will never enter their head, okay? This guy's cutting the head off a dragon. There's a guy riding one. We've got a ton of information on dinosaurs living with man. Sometimes they're in friendly gestures, like this one's petting him. He's got his head laying on his shoulder, okay? 
Pottery was found with dinosaurs on it. A mummy was found in a tomb wrapped in a blanket, and all around the blanket were dinosaurs. Why would they put dinosaurs on their blankets? Why would they put them on their pottery? Why would they carve them on cliff walls? Why would they put them on their waistbands? In Acumbaro, Mexico, 56,000 ceramic figurines of dinosaurs were found. They knew about them in central Mexico. They have always lived with man. They did not live millions of years ago. But everybody today is saying dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Nobody's ever seen one. Yeah, I think they have, okay. An Italian peasant killed a dragon that was bothering his cows. They had it stuffed and mounted for a museum display in 1572. By the way, you know why so many Italians are named Tony? Years ago, they were shipping them to America, and they stamped on their forehead, to New York. Hmm? <laughs> Just a little bit of trivia there. But the Sutton artifact appears to show what it looks like a uh, pterodactyl with its wings folded up. This lady sent me this picture of the dragon found in uh, Utah. She said, Brother Hogan, looks like a dinosaur to me carved on the cliff up here. Roman artifacts were found in Tucson, Arizona. By the way, the Romans came across the ocean way before Columbus did. Columbus was not the first white man across the ocean. There was trade back and forth for centuries until the you know, Catholic Church kind of had the Dark Ages come in and shut down knowledge and information. But Brenda the Navigator came across in 500 A.D. Roman coins, or Hebrew coins, were found in Ohio in a burial mound. There was trade back and forth at the time of Christ across the ocean. But in a Las Lunas uh, Decalogue stone here found in New Mexico, there's an 80-ton stone showing the Ten Commandments in Byzantine, which was only used about 500 A.D. is my understanding. Somebody came across, tried to evangelize America, made it as far as New Mexico 1,500 years ago. But one of these Roman swords shows what quite obviously appears to be a dinosaur on it. How on earth could they get dinosaurs on their, stone, on their swords at the time of the Roman Empire? During the age of sailing ships, there are thousands of legends of people sighting sea monsters. Well, if you're in a sailboat, it's kind of quiet going through the water, okay? With a, today, with a diesel engine, they can hear you coming 50 miles away underwater. Of course, you're not going to see one, all right? But there are legends all over of dra dragons living with man. I think we've really been lied to. We could spend a long time on dragon legends. I read <laughs> prolifically on that topic about <laughs> dragon sightings down through history. Just get our video number three if you want more on dragon legends. But you know, there are actually stories of giant octopus living in the ocean. I mean, like, really, really, really big octopus. One octopus washed up on the beach in Florida. It was 200 feet across and weighed five tons. That's a big octopus. A whale was killed near Seattle. Inside the whale's stomach was one arm to an octopus that was 150 feet long. Whales love to eat octopus. And if a whale eats too much octopus, he'll get sick and puke it back up. And if you ever see a piece of puked-up octopus floating around in the ocean... Be sure to grab it. It's worth a fortune. Does anybody know what they make out of puked up octopus? Perfume. That is correct. That explains a few things, doesn't it, fellas? Hey, dear. You smell like a puked up octopus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can sleep on the couch for a month, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are giant squids found out there in the ocean. I mean, really big squids. We could spend a long time about that one. A giant squid washed up on the beach in New Zealand. They said it was a baby. Full grown, it would have been 150 feet long. People say, no, wait, 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 Hoven, if there are dinosaurs mentioned all through history, are dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible? Oh, yeah. Dinosaurs in the Bible? <laughs> yeah, we're going to cover that in the next session. Dinosaurs not only mentioned in the Bible, some dinosaurs might still be alive. We'll cover that in a minute. Okay, let's take up where we left off about dinosaurs in the Bible. People say, come on, now dinosaurs aren't in the Bible. Well, of course the word's not in there. They didn't make up the word till 1841. The word computer's not in there either, but there really are computers, okay? Uh, but yes, dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible. You say, I didn't see them in there. Well, you need to read carefully, okay? If you get the book of Job, <clears throat> the book of Job has 42 chapters. Just about dead center in the Bible, just before Psalms. You find a very fascinating book. In Job chapter 1, <clears throat> it says, Job was a perfect man. He feared God and hated evil. By the way, that's good advice. Okay? And Job had seven sons and three daughters. And Job had thousands of sheep and camels and oxen and asses. The guy was rich. Really rich. Job was probably written after the flood. 
but before the law was given in the days of Moses. Before the flood, they lived to be 900. After the flood, they lived to be 400. See, Job lived long enough to have 10 kids all grown out of the house. They all died. He had 10 more kids and saw his great-great-grandchildren from his second family. So you've got to be living a long time to accomplish those things. Okay? So those are the reasons why most people think the book of Job was written after the flood during the time when they were still living to be you know, 400. Anyway, one day the messenger came to Job and said, Job, I've got some bad news. The oxen and asses were stolen, and your servants got killed. And the sheep got burned up. Oh, and by the way, Job, the camels got stolen too. Stock market crash. Get it? Stock? Never mind. Okay. No. Another, another messenger came and said, Job, your, your kids all died. All ten of your kids are dead. Job's having a bad day. And then Job said, The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Man, what kind of guy is this anyway? Hey, do you do that when bad things happen to you? Huh. Then Satan gave him boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And a boil is like, like the world's worst zit, and Job was covered in them. And his wife turned against him. You know, a man can handle just about any tragedy in life, but that's the toughest one right there. There's a verse you probably never heard preached on ever. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about, you know, husbands love your wives and wives submit yourself to your husband. You've probably heard that part preached on. I bet you never heard this part. Let the wife see that she reverence her husband. Treat him like a god. Offer him burnt sacrifices three times a day. Okay? <laughs> Amen. All right. Chapter 2, verse 10. And Job said, you speak like one of the foolish women. Can't we receive good at the hand of God and not evil? And then Job's four friends came to visit him. One of those guys was the shortest man mentioned in the Bible. Bildad the Shuhite. That's pretty short, okay? But these four guys came and they talked to Job for 35 chapters. Most of the book of Job is these guys explaining to Job why everything went wrong. They had to be Baptists the way I got it figured. They said, Job, you must have sinned. I mean, Eliphaz said, whoever perished being innocent. Job, the reason bad things are happening to you is because you sinned. Now, folks, that is the wisdom of the world, okay? That is not true. See, if something bad happens to somebody, you don't know why it happened. You should love them, pray for them, encourage them, and shut up. Don't go to the hospital when they get their gallstones out and say, hey, brother, these aren't gallstones. These are tithes and offerings. God's getting them out of you one way or another. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> Let God take care of why everything went wrong. He can handle them just fine, all right? So Job is sitting there scraping the pus out of the boils by the graves of his ten dead kids, thinking, God, would you please answer me? Why did this happen to me? Folks, you don't have to live on this planet very long before you're going to be asking that question. God, why did you do this to me? Now, I don't want to drag skeletons out of anybody's closets, okay? But maybe you've had tragedy in your life. I know a little bit of what I'm talking about. I've got three kids here and three in heaven already, okay? Yes, tragedy comes to good people trying to do right. It happens, all right? But if something bad happens, what's your response? Job said, I wish the Lord would answer me. See, Job didn't know about Romans 8, 28. God said, we know all things work together for good. To them that are the, love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Now this verse does not say everything that happens is good. It doesn't say that. It says it'll work together for good. I'll show you. Has anybody ever been hungry? You ever been hungry before? <clears throat> Suppose you come to my house, you knock on the door, say, hey, Hoven, I'm hungry. I'll say, come on in, man, I'm going to give you a cup of flour. <laughs> that don't sound too good. I got it. How about a spoonful of salt? Now that'll fill you up. That ain't going to help. I got it. How about a spoonful of baking soda? Now that will wake you up in the morning. Uh -huh. Now you're probably getting kind of dry by now, so let's pour down a half a cup of Crisco. <laughs> and chase it down with a cup of buttermilk. You say, Brother Hovind, that would taste terrible. How about if we mix them all together and make biscuits? <laughs> Did you know the individual ingredients for biscuits taste lousy, but they work together for biscuits. And do you know everything that happens to you might not be good, but it'll work together for good if you love God and you're called according to his purpose. 
See, the Christian life is so simple. Keep your heart right with God. That's it. Now, that'll be tough to do because the heart is deceitful above all things and <laughs> desperately wicked. But Job is sitting there scraping the pus out of the boil saying, God, would you please answer me? And in chapter 38, <clears throat> the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind. You know, if a tornado starts talking to me, I'm going to pay attention. <laughs> and the Lord said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Hey, Job, your four friends did not know what they were talking about. And by the way, be very careful about getting any Bible doctrine from the book of Job, okay? It's true that the guys said it, but what they said was not true. And cults are always good at picking a verse out here. You better read, better read the whole chapter, okay? Now, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, but the Bible contains some lies. It accurately records the lies of men. It's true that they said it, but what they said was not true. Okay, that's the case of these four guys. Anyway, God said, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? I read that 36 years ago as a brand new Christian. And I thought, what a dumb question. God, why would you ask Job where he was when you laid the foundations of the earth? I said, God... He wasn't there. You know that, and he knows that. So why are you asking such a question? How many of you were here when God built the earth? Was anybody here when God made the earth? Only a couple of Mormons, okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're in your second existence. I understand, okay. No, you were not here when God built the earth. Now, kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully, okay? Since you were not here when God made the earth, <clears throat> that means that God is older than you are. How many can figure this out with no help at all? Okay? Did it ever occur to you that God is also smarter than you are? Did it ever occur to you that God is stronger than you are? Did it ever occur to you that God is richer than you are? You say, Brother Hovind, everybody's richer than I are. <laughs> okay. Well, God certainly is. Hey, try this one. I've said this one a thousand times and I've never understood it once. But I say it a lot and I think about it till my brain hurts. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? He's already thought of everything. He even knows everything you've ever thought about. The Bible says he understands the imaginations of the thoughts. That's a fascinating verse. He not only knows your thoughts, he knows the imaginations of the thoughts. You see, you can not only think about things, you can actually think about what you are thinking about. Think about that. The brain is amazing. The Bible says God knows the thoughts of man. And by the way, it says in Luke, he, Jesus knowing their thoughts. That's one of many verses that proves Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. God knows your thoughts and he loves you anyway. Wow. Praise God for his mercy, right? Job 38, 4. God said, declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? Question mark. Job doesn't answer. Job's not answering any of God's questions. God said, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Did you know scientists didn't even know there were springs in the sea until 1977? Just discovered. Science is very slowly catching up with a few parts of the Bible. God said, where is the way where light dwelleth? Now that is fascinating. I taught physics. Did you know light doesn't stay in a place, it's in a way. It's always moving. But then it says, as for darkness, where is the place thereof? You know the speed of light, 186,282.4 miles per second. You know what the speed of dark is? Zero. Darkness cannot move. Now think about it. We are the children of light. We are supposed to be on the move, you know, get something done for God. Right? People say, well, it's getting dark. The world's so bad. Well, then turn on your light. Duh. Duh. It's, the reason it's dark is because of you. Right? You're the light to turn it on. Right? The Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Hey, gates don't attack you. You attack them. Yeah, let's go, man. Do something for God. Anyway, verse 24. By what way is the light parted which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? Now, wait, wait, wait. Is God telling Job that the light causes the wind? He sure is. And you can ask any weatherman, that's exactly correct. The sunlight causes the wind patterns. The ground heats up, expands the air. We have wind on earth because of the light. 
just like God said 4,000 years ago. God said, canst thou send lightnings? Boy, it's a good thing I can't. How many of you can think of somebody that's lucky to be alive because you cannot send the lightnings? I can think of several. Yes, I can. God said, canst thou send lightnings that they may go and say unto thee, here we are. Now, wait, wait, wait. Is God telling Job that electricity can be used to send a message? Like radio, cell phone, microwave, TV? Electricity sends a message two different ways. Through the electricity, through the wire, and also through the electromagnetic force, the radio waves coming off of it. God told Job that 4,000 years ago. Marconi and them guys had discovered it in the last few hundred years. God asked Job 84 questions. Job never answered one. These are the kind of questions that don't need an answer. The question was designed <coughs> to change the person's attitude. These are the same kind of questions you dads have to ask your kids. See, I've got three kids, one of each. I know what I'm talking about. Kids get to a certain age, and they get kind of cocky, and they think, you know, they should make the rules around the house. The kid comes in one day and says, hey, dad, listen. I believe I should be allowed to stay out till 4 in the morning with my friends. After all, I'm 10 now. And dad says, hold on just a minute, kid. You'd like to know why you can't stay out till 4 in the morning. Well, son, let me ask you a couple questions. Uh, who pays the electric bill around this house? Huh? Who's paying for the house? Who paid for them clothes you're wearing, son? Who paid for that bed you slept on last night? Who pays for the food you eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat? Who paid for that hot water and soap you took a shower with about a month ago? <laughs> Let's just get it straight, son. The Bible is very clear. He who payeth the bills maketh the rules. Second Opinions, chapter 4. You see, son, <laughs> me, dad, you, kid. And if you're going to sleep under my roof and eat my food, you're going to do it my way. And if you want to do it your way, well, then go get your own roof to sleep under and do it your way. See, that's the golden rule, son. He that hath the gold maketh the rules. Who do you think you are, kid? Where were you when we brought this property and cleared this land and drove off the grizzly bears and marched uphill to school 40 miles in the snow, barefoot, both ways? <laughs> How many got the same speech when you were growing up? You know, okay, good, good. Let's get it straight, son. Me, dad, you, kid. I think that's what God's doing to Job. God asked Job 84 questions. Job never answered one. But Job got an attitude adjustment. See, Job had the same problem that most of us have. He did not have a good appreciation for who God was. Come to chapter 40. God said, Behold now behemoth. Well, what on earth is a behemoth? Well, whatever it was, Job could behold it. Because God never tells you to do something you can't do. See, God would not say, Behold now, Behemoth, if he could not behold now, Behemoth. That's deep theology, I know, okay, but think it through, all right? Now, some reference Bibles say, Behemoth is probably the elephant or hippopotamus. Oh, that is ludicrous. I believe Behemoth is the long necked dinosaur. Now, there are 13 different long necked dinosaurs, okay? There's the Brachiosaur, the Apatosaur, the Cetosaur. He's got the big seat, okay? There's the Blondosaur. You have to talk to her kind of slow, okay? Um, I, say, I think behemoth is the brachiosaurus. It says he eats grasses and ox. Some people say, hey, my Bible says elephant and elephants eat grass. Well, duh, bunny rabbits eat grass too, okay? A lot of animals eat grass, right? Look at the next verse. His strength is in his loins, his force is in the navel of his belly. The biggest part on him is his belly. And they say, well, elephants have a big belly. Yes, I know. Hippopotamus have a big belly. Brachiosaurus had a big belly. He has a big belly. <laughs> So does he. That is just sick, sick. Who would, who would pose for that? Anyway, it says, he moveth his tail like a cedar. Now, hold on a minute. His tail is like a cedar tree. Have you ever seen an elephant's tail? I mean, would that remind you of a cedar tree or a hippo tail? Not like a cedar tree. Now, Brachiosaurus tail, yeah, that's a little more like a cedar tree than the rest of them, okay? You know, before they put those footnotes at the bottom of the Bible, I think they should be required to read the passage at least once and then comment on it, okay? By the way, you preachers, if you're going to preach on a passage, at least read it once before you preach on it, okay? Yeah, all right. Anyway, 
The next verse says, his bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He has big, heavy-duty bones, and they did. This is a real dinosaur toe bone I've got in my museum in Pensacola. One of the knuckle bones from a brachiosaurus. Now, this will be kind of complicated, so listen carefully. The reason he had such big toe bones is because he had big toes. How many can figure that out with no help? Four, five, six, okay. And the reason he had those big toes is because he had a big foot. There's a kid taking a bath in a brachiosaur footprint. Picture's on the book right here on the steps. And the reason he had that big foot is because he had a big leg to hold up. His front leg is 20 feet tall. The biggest dinosaur found so far is 60 feet to the top of the head. Found in Oklahoma. They say it's going to take them 20 years to dig all the bones out of the ground because it is a government project. <laughs> they say when it was alive, it probably weighed 100 tons. Now, 100 tons is equal to 14 school buses put together. That means if he was to come by and step on you, you would be deeply impressed by him. <laughs> you would be road pizza. Mm -hmm. By the way, speaking of government projects, <clears throat> I've got to share with you my new invention that's going to make me the richest man on planet Earth. I'm going to save so much money for the highway department, construction crews, utility companies, and the military. Oh, and all I want is 10% of the savings, and I'll be the richest man on planet Earth. I have invented a shovel that will stand up by itself. You won't need to pay those guys to lean on it anymore. Mm, I thank you, I know. <laughs> Next verse says, he's the chief of the ways of God. He's the chief. That's the Hebrew word, resheth, which means he's the chief, he's the principal, he's the biggest animal God ever made. Well, that would not be the elephant or hippopotamus. It would be the brachiosaurus. And that kind of fits the pattern for the way the devil works, you know. Whenever God makes things, the devil tries to destroy them. God makes beautiful things, and Satan always tries to destroy them. Hey, question, how big is your God? I mean, do you ever think about that? When you stop and pray and you say, Heavenly Father, do you have any idea who you're talking to? I mean, have you ever stopped and just thought about that? Who are you about to talk to? I mean, you sit down for lunch, you know, and you're going to pray. Okay, bless the bunch as they crunch the lunch, amen. We expect God to come like a puppy dog when we call, don't we? Okay, God, I got time for you now. Pay attention. Now, here's my prayers. Give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this, and give me this, and give it quick. That's about what it boils down to, isn't it? I mean, have you ever stopped and really thought how, who you're talking to? How big is your God? Hey, is your God big enough to tell you what to do, and you just simply do it without question? For instance, does God tell you what kind of clothes to wear? Now, First Timothy says the women should dress modestly. See, my daddy always said, if you're not in business, don't advertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Does God tell you how to cut your hair? First Corinthians says it's a shame for man to have long hair. Oh, when I got saved, I was a lifeguard. Nice suntan, long blonde hair. I read that and said, oh, wow, I better go cut it. It's just a no question. It's a no-brainer. God, you're not happy? Yes, sir. It's absolutely no-brainer. Is How big is your God? I mean, who is God of your life anyway? If he's really God, then you read the book, you do what he says, end of story. Hey, does God tell you what kind of speech to have? Ephesians 4 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Is God happy with everything coming out of your mouth? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's a good uh, verse to quote to somebody when you hear him cuss, by the way. Uh, does God control what you watch on TV? Psalm 101 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Hey, do you put wicked things in front of your eyes? Suppose you made a rule around, just suppose, just suppose you made a rule around your house. If you hear a cuss word on TV, you're going to shut it off for two hours. If you see somebody immodestly dressed, you're going to shut it off for two hours. If you see somebody drinking alcohol, you're going to shut it off for two hours. What if you just made those three simple rules at your house? How much TV would you watch? None. So you might as well sell it and give that 30 bucks a month for the cable bill to a missionary and we could, we could win the whole world to Christ, couldn't we? Yeah. Uh, does God tell you what kind of music to listen to? Ephesians 5, speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing melody, making your heart, in your heart to the Lord. Is God happy with your music? See, God loves music. 
God invented music. But Satan has invented some ungodly music you shouldn't listen to. Somebody asked me one time, they said, Hovind, do you know what you get if you play country music backwards? I said, no. He said, you get your wife back, your hound dog back, your pickup back, and you get out of jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God created them, male and female. Did you know God invented marriage and the family and sex? I mean, he invented the whole thing. And he wants it to be wonderful. But so he put some rules down. Boys, don't touch the girls until you're married to them. Now, if you don't want to touch them, then stay away from me. I saw your kind in San Francisco, okay? But God put the rules down. <laughs> he put the rules down because he wants the best. He said the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. God doesn't want you hunting for a precious life. He wants you to have a precious life. Hey, do you know why these Hollywood folks have to get married again every six months? Or Britney Spears, 55 hours. Jennifer Lopez, seven months. Brandy Norwood, less than two years, less than six months. Zsa Zsa Gabor, married one day. Do you know why they got to get married again every six months? They're hunting for the precious life. They don't have it. Now listen carefully. Don't pay any attention to Hollywood. They don't have a clue. Not the clue in the world how to have a precious life. If you want to have a precious life, you keep yourself pure till you walk down that aisle and the preacher says, wilt thou, and then you wilt or whatever they do, and then you stay faithful to that one the rest of your life. That is the precious life. Don't believe Hollywood for a second. They don't have a clue, all right? God created the living creatures, every living creature. God made the dinosaurs. He made them. And Satan said, you know, there has to be some way I can use dinosaurs against God. But he couldn't fool Adam, not with dinosaurs. <laughs> Adam named them. Can you imagine the devil walking up to Adam and saying, Hey, Adam, did you know dinosaurs lived millions of years ago? <laughs> Adam would say, Are you stupid? There's one in the backyard right there eating on a cherry tree. I mean, what do you mean millions of years ago? The devil couldn't fool Noah. I mean, he fed them every day. But for the next 4,000 years, dinosaurs became more rare. They were dying off or being killed off or whatever, you know, some of the reasons they died. And by 1809, they were just nearly extinct. And somebody found the bones and put one together. 1809, first dinosaur that we know of, put together for a museum. Satan was there that day and said, wow, here's my chance. These critters have always lived with man. I know that, and God knows that. But these people don't know that. So the devil said, I think I'm going to tell everybody they lived millions of years ago. And if they believe it, It'll make them doubt the Bible. And boy, has it worked good. You know, for the last 200 years, kids have gone to kindergarten and they get a book like this. I can read about dinosaurs. Would anybody like to take a wild guess at what the first sentence in the book says? Millions of years ago. Hey, uh, how many kids are being taught that in your town? At your expense, you are paying for the destruction of the next generation. Now, maybe that doesn't bother you. But it bothers me. And if you think I leave my gorgeous wife and travel all over the world, been gone, let's see, over 200 days a year for years now, flew 215 times last year, spoke over 900 times. If you think I leave my gorgeous wife and my four grandkids because I like being gone, you are mistaken. Okay? They would much rather be home. But there's a war going on. Somebody's got to warn the troops. Hello, to arms. The British are coming. You know, pick up your gun, guys. Let's go. There are kids by the billions being brainwashed on this planet. And Satan is using dinosaurs to do it. Nearly all the books say millions of years ago. And then we got some Christians that totally ignore the subject because they don't have an answer. Well, study to show yourself approved unto God. Get the answer and go share it with somebody, okay? Millions of years ago, the book says. I go to museums all the time. just makes my blood boil. You see hundreds and hundreds of kids coming past these incredible displays. I mean, beautiful big dinosaur skeletons. And guess what the sign says at the bottom? Millions of years ago. See, Christians don't seem to understand this. The museums and science centers of the world, that is their church. They are preaching their gospel just like you are trying to preach your gospel. And they're using your tax dollars to preach their gospel. That's how it happens. Millions of years ago. The Bible says, Behemoth lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. Now, the word fens is an old English word that means the swamp. You know, the biggest swamp in the world is in the middle of Africa. 
It's called the Lekwala Swamp. That swamp is huge. Most Americans don't appreciate the size of Africa. Here's what Africa looks like next to the entire United States. Africa's gigantic, okay? That swamp is bigger, is the same size as the state of, state of Florida, 55,000 square miles. That swamp is huge. Did you know that swamp is today is 80% unexplored? In 1885, Congo in Africa was taken over by Belgium, and it was called the Belgian Congo for many, many years. In 1960, the communists liberated them. <clears throat> you know how the communists liberate countries. They kill everybody. Okay, you're free now. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> there were reports in that swamp <clears throat> from the 1700s when the missionaries went in there and said, man, there are dinosaurs still living in that swamp. Dinosaurs still alive? 1910, New York Herald ran an article about dinosaurs still living in Africa's swamps. Here's the Saturday Evening Post, 1948. There could be dinosaurs still alive in Africa. A big game hunter named uh, <clears throat> Mr. Gobbler returned from a trip to Angola. He announced to the Cape Town newspaper, the Cape Argus, that there was an animal of large dimensions, the description of which could only fit a dinosaur. The natives call it Chipiqui. In Central African Republic, they call it Naguri. Roy Mackle went there in 1980 <clears throat> on an expedition. He spent a quarter million dollars, went back again the next year, went to that swamp. He said it's the most miserable swamp on planet Earth. The mosquitoes landed on them at the rate of about 1,000 an hour constantly. I mean, like swarms of dust around you. Bloodthirsty mosquitoes. 95 degrees, 95% humidity all the time. As they traveled around the swamp, the natives talked about this animal called Mahamba. <clears throat> He said, what's that? And they showed him a crocodile. Oh, yeah, that, the Mahamba right there, Mahamba. He said, how big does it get? They paced it off on the sandbar, 50 feet long. Now, if you're a pygmy, four foot four, a 50-foot crocodile looks really big to you, okay? And everybody says, no, crocodiles, they never get past about 17 feet. Oh, I don't think that's correct. Earlier in the, the summer of uh, 2005, they killed a 24-foot crocodile in that swamp. Of course, the natives will say, oh, you should see the big ones. The natives also talk about an animal they call Mokale Umbembe. Mokale Umbembe? What on earth is that? Well, if you show them the picture of an apatosaurus, they'll say, yep, yep, that's it, Mokale Umbembe. The natives claim these animals live underwater. They're very rare. Of course, they're in the swamp in Africa, and there's, nobody goes out at night anyway, and there's no lights over there at night. But the animals are seen mostly early, early morning or late in the evening when they come out. And their favorite plant is the Malombo plant. There's Dr. Mackle holding a Malombo plant. Dr. Mackle was a University of Chicago microbiology professor. And he went over there and studied this carefully and came back and wrote a book called A Living Dinosaur. Now, he believes in evolution, but his book is great about the evidence for dinosaurs still living in African swamp. They found footprints of the creatures. A missionary friend of mine was there for 43 years as a missionary, Eugene Thomas. He's in Ohio now. Here's his phone number. Call him up. He was there for 43 years. He said, I had two pygmies in my church that killed one and ate it. Dinosaurs. There have been reports of these creatures in that swamp for a long time. One Belgian Congo biologist went up there, upriver 500 miles to, from his house and said, he said he saw one, but his camera malfunctioned because the high humidity apparently ruined all the mechanisms inside. I don't know. There have been many reports of dinosaurs in that swamp, and you can study this for yourself. Uh, one group went there, and they said the creature was dark brown in color. The skin appeared slick and smooth, had a long neck and a small head. They heard it. They saw it. It was making a roaring noise, and the government officials even saw it. There's an article here in the Boston Herald newspaper about a group going over to look for the dinosaurs still alive in the Congo swamp. All you got to do is type in cryptozoology. Crypto means hidden. Zoology means study of animals. Cryptozoology, you'll find all kinds of stuff about dinosaurs still living. <clears throat> the natives claim these animals live in caves along the side of the river. Uh, William Gibbons has been there four times now to the Congo Swamp. He and I wrote this book together for kids, Claws, Jaws, and Dinosaurs. William Gibbons wrote me a letter. He said, according to our guide, Pierre Sima, we were the first white men to actually penetrate the forest and swamps bordering the Buamba River. Our informants, almost all of them Baca pygmies, with the exception of an elderly Cameroonian Muslim, are perfectly familiar with all the known and unknown animals of the swamps. While they do not regard Lakila Mbembe, it's a different language, okay, as being an unusual animal, <clears throat> they do fear the creature because of its ferocity 
and attacking hippos, elephants, and crocodiles. The animal appears to be completely intolerant of any other large creature that shares the river and controls large stretches of the river, particularly where those food supplies, where the food supply is present. The two suspected dinosaurians, Mokale Mbembe and Nagubu, are observed and encountered on a regular basis. I question an older Baca couple that work on Pierre's plantation. Like most pygmies, they are very familiar with the flora and fauna of the region. I presented them with our book of known African animals and dinosaur illustrations. About 98% of the dinosaur illustrations were rejected except for two which they picked out without hesitation that they had observed, a sauropod dinosaur and a triceratops. Now why would people in the middle of the swamp in Africa say, oh yeah, we've seen that one. Missionary Cal Bombay was there for years in Kenya. He said he and his wife saw one of these creatures but the plates on the back were bigger, more like a stegosaurus. Down in South America, They've got the Amazon jungle, which is huge. In 1907, the British Army sent Colonel Fawcett to mark the boundary between Brazil and Peru. He was an officer in the Royal Engineers and was known as a order, as recorder of, meticulous recorder of facts. In the Benny swamps, he said he saw what he believed to be a diplodocus. The natives and the tribes around there said, oh yeah, that animal still lives out here in the swamp. Colonel Fawcett's son made sketches of the footprints. In 1883, uh, Scientific American ran this article before they got committed to evolution. An article like this would never make it in Scientific American today because now they're dedicated to preserving the theory. But they said the Brazilian minister at La Paz, Bolivia, had remitted to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Rio photographs of drawings of an extraordinary saurian killed on the Beni after receiving 36 balls. By order of the president, the dried body, which had been preserved and was sent to La Paz, it was 12 meters long, 39 feet from snout to point. It had scale armor. The neck is long, the belly large, and almost dragging the ground. Professor Gilvetti examined the beast, said it's a member of a lost species. The Indians in that region make small earthen vessels in the same shape, probably copied from nature. Dinosaurs? Vaughn Goff called me three days ago as I was driving up here to Indiana. He said, yeah, the natives in his area uh, talk about a lizard that's 30 feet long, 5 feet tall, makes a thundering noise to startle its prey. The native Waiwai Indians call it uh, Uru Ferry, and they are terrified of this creature. Here's his email, Vaughn at GoffMinistries.org. Email him. They're talking about dinosaurs still in the swamp down there. Here's a giant snake that was killed several years ago, 35-foot snake. It had eaten a man who fell asleep on the job. <laughs> Stay awake on the job, fellas, okay? This snake was reported in Indonesia being 49 feet long. I don't know if it's true or not, but I mean, they might, people might have exaggerated, but that's the reports of a giant snake down there. Colonel Fawcett shed, said he killed a 62-foot anaconda snake. And the natives were terrified. They said, Colonel, if there's one, there's going to be another one. The uh, off officials of brazil Colombia boundary in 1933 killed a 98-foot snake, two feet in diameter, weighed two tons. The cook from a hotel in Amazon said they saw a 100-foot snake that the military hunted down after it had killed and eaten two soldiers. The head was five feet long. Reuters News Service reported a 130-foot snake back in 97. This thing floated down the Amazon River. Nobody poked it to see if it was alive, but they reported it's over 100, nearly 150 feet long. Amazon River is huge. Halfway up where a former student of mine was a missionary for years, he said the Amazon River way back here is nine miles wide. That's a big river. There's a lake in Scotland called Loch Ness. Has anybody ever heard of Loch Ness? Loch Ness is a huge lake, 24 miles long, a mile to a mile and a half wide, up to 900 feet deep. Loch Ness is big enough that everybody on planet Earth could go drowned in it at the same time. It would hold the entire population of the world. Six billion people would fit in that lake. It's huge. In 1933, a roadbed was cut into the side of the mountain. Because before 1933, if you wanted to see the lake, you got to climb over the mountains or go up river seven miles in your boat. So not many people went there. Very sparsely populated. 1933, the first year the road was put in, there were 52 separate sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. Hmm. This author said there have been 9,000 reported sightings today. Now, that was back in the 1960s when this book was written. Today, it's over 11,000 reported sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. 11,000. Of course, some are fakes and frauds, okay? Discover, I wouldn't trust the, you know, uh, weekly world news, you know, 
where they got all this weird stuff in there. But Sir Peter Scott's a member of Parliament. He said he saw it. He believes it's a plesiosaur. Almost everybody that sees it says it's this animal right here, a plesiosaurus. Long neck, four big flippers. One guy wrote a book and he said, some people think Nessie is a plesiosaur. There's one thing wrong with this theory. Plesiosaurs are believed to have become extinct 70 million years ago. Oh, is that what's wrong with the theory? <laughs> I think this evolution theory has got to be the biggest hindrance to scientific research there's ever been. Okay? You look at the facts, forget your theories, look at the facts and come up with your conclusions. Okay? Arthur Grant nearly ran into Nessie on his motorcycle one night. He said, I had a splendid view of the object. In fact, I almost struck it with my motorcycle. It had a long neck, oval, uh, large oval-shaped eyes on top of a small head. The tail would be five to six feet long. He describes it, 15 to 20 feet long altogether. He said, knowing something of natural history, he was a veterinarian student, okay? He said, I've never seen anything like it in my life. Here's the sketch he drew of what he nearly ran over on his motorcycle, a 20-foot long plesiosaur. Alexander Campbell was the game warden for Loch Ness for 47 years. He said he saw it 18 times. There's the sketch he drew of it. Many people have tried to catch the Loch Ness monster. They've used everything you can imagine for bait and some things you could not imagine. So, so far, nobody's caught it. I mean, the lake is huge. But there have been many, many sketches drawn. <coughs> One family said they saw it with a sheep in its mouth. <coughs> One guy got a picture of the hump sticking out of the water. The neck is over on the far right. Then Reader's Digest, of course, they crop everything down. They cut the neck off when they publish their picture the crop picture, but Mark McLeod said he watched it for nine minutes through binoculars and made four sketches of it, of what he saw. McLeod said, I think the monster looks like this. <clears throat> All you got to do is, you know, watch TV programs once in a while where they talk about the Loch Ness Monster. There are thousands of people who will go on record and say, I have seen it. World Book Encyclopedia paid to have a submarine taken over there from South Carolina, the mini-sub. The guy went down in the water and said, that water is so black, I can't even see the front of my own boat. Loch Ness is like a giant mud puddle. You go down in there just a few feet, visibility is zero. You can't see a thing. Japanese put 24 boats, went all the way down the lake, and reported they scanned the bottom with radar, sonar, and said, man, this is a deep lake, and it's wrinkled up like a raisin. And there are caves going off to the side. Probably with air chambers, the creature can come up under, and you know, go under the, inside the mountain and breathe and live in there. One guy got a picture of diamond-shaped flipper underwater. Again, they thought it was a plesiosaur. Reader's Digest published this picture, and back in 78, pictures right there on the floor, about Nessie with, Nessie with its mouth open. <coughs> we can go all day about Loch Ness Monster, but they said this photograph was a fake, and it probably was, but I don't know. It's interesting, they waited till the last guy involved died to announce it's a fake. Now how do you check out the truth? But anyway... There are other lakes besides Loch Ness. There's Loch Lochie, Loch Morar. There are many other lakes reporting creatures. There's one called the Morguar, the Cornish Sea Serpent by England. The English Channel has many reported sightings of a creature like this. In 1749, <coughs> in England, a creature was caught resembling in some degree an alligator but having two large fins. The body was covered with impenetrable scales that had five rows of teeth. 1934, this thing washed up on the beach in Normandy, France. There's a guy... Uh, Standing there looking at it for scale. Uh, a couple of scientists reported this creature swam past their boat in Brazil in 1905. They reported the whole thing in a scientific journal. The creature had a long neck, <coughs> six feet long, <coughs> two feet high. Um, the dorsal fin, I'm sorry, was six feet long, two feet high, a small head on a neck about seven or eight feet long. Two experienced British naturalists reported the thing. And again, we can go all day on reported sightings. This thing, in 1977, a Japanese fishing boat pulled this up in their net. It was 32 feet long, 4,000 pounds. They said, what on earth is that? The captain said, I don't know, but it stinks. <laughs> when they set it down on the deck, it broke in half, and pus oozed out everywhere. So they made a bunch of sketches, took a bunch of pictures, and shoved it overboard. A special stamp was made for Japanese mail, 1977. Now, some people argue that it might have been a basking shark, and I agree, it might have been a basking shark. But the fishermen on board said, we know what basking sharks are. We don't think it is, okay? Basking sharks, they tend to rot away, leaving the head part behind. There's a basking shark right there, okay? It could have been a basking It doesn't matter to me. They said the protein is 96% similar. Yes, I know, but nobody's ever seen plesiosaur protein, okay, to know what it's supposed to look like. 
Humans and apes are similar, but have many differences also. Anyway, there's a lot of arguments about that. It doesn't matter to me, but some people get all bent out of shape because they even mention, you know, the Japanese catch of 1977. Russians report a creature in the lake up there. They're called Mystery of the Lake here. A dinosaur, what looked like a dinosaur, washed up on the beach in Russia in 1994. It was 39 feet long. This thing apparently <clears throat> is a doctored photo of a shark. Somebody with Photoshop, you know, made it look like a, a plesiosaur, but actually it's a doctored photo. But, uh, so be careful. There's plenty of frauds out there, no question. But the existence of a fraud or counterfeit does not disprove the existence of the original. Right? In, in 2004, a bunch of people over in Papua New Guinea reported a creature like a dinosaur, th 10 feet tall, with a head like an alligator, or tail like an alligator, a head like a dog, right there on the island in the city of Kokopo. One lady said she saw it, she ran for her life seeing a three meter tall creature with a head like a dog and a tail like a crocodile. You can read all about it on the internet about this creature seen just in 2004. Japan reports some of these creatures. The North, Lake, North Island, Haikoto reports them, and the South Island down here of Japan. They call it Ishi in Lake Ikeda. In China, there's reported uh, one called the uh, USO, Unidentified Swimming Object. Uh, <clears throat> Norway has several reported sightings, as do Swedish lakes. A couple of Swedish lakes up there. They call it, anybody speak Swedish, know how to say that? Stores, Jordan. Close enough, yeah, okay. You don't speak Swedish, do you? You're lying, okay. Uh, in Norway, they've got a creature. They, they say it's very similar to the Loch Ness Monster. Hundreds of folks claim they've seen it. It's in the news occasionally, kind of like Loch Ness, okay? Canada has reported sightings of these creatures, Canadian lake monsters. Nessie's Canadian cousin. There's a lake in the town of Kelowna uh, called the Lake Okanagan. It's a huge lake. It's 80 miles long. I've been up there twice to speak in the town of Kelowna. The, na the natives call this creature the Ogopogo. We sell a book uh, on our table back there if you want to get that. The Ogopogo, very similar to Loch Ness Monster. Thousands of folks claim they've seen that one. This article says they were the latest among thousands to see something strange in this narrow 80-mile-long lake. One guy swam the length of the lake and said the thing came up under him, scared him half to death. I got news articles like crazy about this. And she said, I saw Ogopogo twice, this woman says. I interviewed uh, John Caruso. He and his family were sleeping in their boat on the lake. They're camping out on the lake in their big boat. And uh, something bumped the bottom of their boat and woke them all up in the middle of the uh, early, early in the morning. They went out and saw two Ogopogo swimming across the lake. He went back, grabbed his camera. By the time he got it, it was you know, pretty far away, but he gave me the, uh, the copy of the video footage of what he saw at about you know, quite too far away to make out the details. But he said, look, Brother Hovind, I saw the Ogopogo. Many, many folks will go on record and saying, I have seen it. There's one in Cadborough Cadbury Bay, British Columbia. There's a book about that if you want to read more. A baby caddy was found inside the stomach of a sperm whale. They say it has a, long, a short pointed front flippers and a long necked, uh, uh, long necked beast with a horse like head. One guy caught a baby one with his dip net, drew a sketch of it before he released it. He didn't know what it was, so he let it go. I interviewed this guy for an hour. These four guys were fishing in Canada when a creature chased their boat off Cape Sable Island, Nova Scotia, when I was preaching up there. Uh, it happened in 1992 uh, when I met him. He said, uh, he was 67 when this happened. He'd been fishing out there since he was five. He said this 40 to 50 foot long creature chased their boat for one to two miles. He said the neck was two feet thick and eight to nine feet long. It had nine inch diameter eyes. He said they were six miles south of Cape Sable Island. He said, I don't want to see it again. That's what he told me. This thing washed up on the beach in Newfoundland. Sometimes big blobs wash up. Sometimes it is whale skin, actually. The whale dies, gets eaten, and the layer of blubber, you know, washes up sometimes. Sometimes it's a basking shark. Parker Cove, this thing washed up in Parker Cove, Canada. I talked to many folks who said they saw it. A lot of people went and analyzed it. I don't think it's ever positively determined what it is. It might have been a basking shark, but we, nobody knows positively. <clears throat> but it's gone. People cut pieces off it. The vertebrae do tend to look like shark vertebrae instead of uh, any other kind. It's just interesting that stuff like this washes up on the beach. But we sell a book called Monster Monster about North American lake monsters. Lake Monsters and Sea Serpents. A uh, good book by Lauren Coleman, who is a cryptozoologist, but also an evolutionist. Okay? I, deba I, I debate nothing. I, I interviewed uh, Jacques Boivet for three hours. He collects sightings of the Lake Memphremagog creature between Vermont and Quebec, Canada. Hundreds of folks claim they've seen something in this lake up there in Mem Lake Memphremagog. Creature's been seen in the Potomac River. There's a book about the great New England sea serpent. 
There's an island off Connecticut in Rhode Island called Block Island, where many folks claim they've seen creatures swimming around out there. They call it the Block Ness Monster. <laughs> one washed up in 1996. Another was something else washed up in 2004. Never was identified that I know of. And I, I interview people all the time. And Lake, Lake Erie's apparently got one. Erie's Bessie matches Nessie. They say it's 35 feet long, has a snake-like head. It's in the newspaper once in a while about Lake Erie's monster. Okay, you can read all that for yourself. But uh, <clears throat> A dead baby creature was found on the beach of Lake Erie. A guy took it home, stuffed it, and mounted it. He's a taxidermist. He said, you tell me what it is. I don't know. Dr. Ball bought it. It's in his museum in Texas. It's never been identified. They're not sure what. It may be a fake. Nobody knows, but very interesting little critter. I interviewed the sheriff. We saw that one of the first guys to see the Situate Harbor monster. 50 feet long when it washed up on the beach. Everybody started cutting pieces off. By the time they got the photo taken, it was pretty butchered up. Some people argued it's a basking shark. Others said it's a real sea serpent. The health department said, we don't care. It stinks. We're getting out of here. And so they blew it up with dynamite. California, 1925, this critter washed up on the beach. That's the head. Here's the neck going down to the right. Just the neck was 20 feet long. What, everybody that examined it said it was a plesiosaurus. 20-foot neck. One atheist wrote me a letter and said, Hovind, you're so stupid. He said, don't you know that was a whale? I said, now just exactly where is the neck on a whale? <laughs> Ought to be between the head and the flippers. Hmm. He said, it's a rare form of bard's beaked whale. Oh, it's pretty rare, all right, with a 20-foot neck. Duh. The people who saw it said it's a plesiosaurus. Why is that so hard to believe? You know why people resist explanations like that? It goes against their theory. They like the evolution theory because it gives them freedom from God. That's why they like that theory. And we could spend all day on cryptozoology stuff. I have studied this for years and love. I've interviewed now 100 people that claim they've seen a living dinosaur. In New York, 1969, the Harbor Police chased something much bigger than a whale upriver. Never did catch it. Could have been a Zooglodon or a Basilosaurus, I don't know. But the White River Monster in Newport, Arkansas, has been reported many times. Up until 1973, it apparently disappeared. Arkansas Senate passed a resolution that said it's unlawful to molest, kill, or trample the White River Monster. Off the coast of Jupiter, Florida, something's been seen similar to a dinosaur swimming in the ocean out there. You can read the articles for yourself. A lot of this stuff's on my website, Dr. Dino. You can read all about this. There's a lake between New York and Vermont called Lake Champlain where many people claim they've seen the Lake Champlain monster. I interviewed Sandy that took this picture. I said, Sandy, do you think you saw a dinosaur? She said, no, I know I saw a dinosaur. She and her husband and two kids watched it for 10 minutes. 58 people on the Ethan Allen, which capsized earlier a couple months ago, you know, uh, people, uh, some people think they all ran to one side to see something and fl fl flipped the boat over. I don't know, maybe it's just too many Twinkies, but... Uh, the captain on board back in 898 said, if you, if you think what I saw was a fish, it weighed 3,000 to 5,000 pounds. The Bible talks about the dragons of the waters. He shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. In Pensacola, where I live, four or five teenagers went scuba diving back in 1962. <clears throat> One survived the trip. Here's what he said. They were going out to the sunken ship in the Pensacola Harbor called the Massachusetts. And here's what he said. Uh, I've got tons of stuff on this. He said, we were in an Air Force rescue raft bound for a sunken ship a few miles off the coast. Midway out, we were caught in a storm and dragged out to sea. When the storm cleared, we were in a dense fog. We began to hear strange noises like the splashing of a porpoise and a sickening odor like dead fish. The noise got closer to the raft, and I heard a loud hissing sound. Out in the fog, we saw what looked like a long pole about 10 feet high sticking up out of the water. On top was a bulb-like structure. It bent in the middle and went under. It appeared several more times, getting closer to the raft. The silence was broken once again by something out of the fog. I can only describe it as a high-pitched whine. We panicked. All five of us put on our fins and went into the water. Keep together and try for the ship, I yelled. After we got in the water, we got split up in the fog, and from behind I could hear the screams of my comrades one by one. I got a closer look at the thing just before my last friend went under. The neck was about 12 feet long, brownish green and smooth looking. The head was like a sea turtle, except more elongated. The eyes were green with oval pupils. I don't know how long it was before I heard a scream. It lasted maybe half a minute. Then I heard Warren's call, hey, help me, it's got Brad. I've got to get out of here. 
His voice was cut off abruptly by a short cry. Brad, Warren, hey, where is everybody? I yelled back at the top of my lungs. Larry now swam with Eric and me. Warren and Brad were nowhere in sight. Right next to Eric, that telephone pole-like figure broke water. I could see the long neck and two small eyes. The mouth opened and it bent over. It dove on top of Eric, dragging him under. I screamed and began to swim past the ship. My insides were shaking uncontrollably. He drew a sketch of the thing that killed his friends. He said, I finally made it to the top of the uh, ship and stayed there most of the night. Next morning, I swam to shore, was found by the rescue unit. That's the sketch Brian McCleary drew of what he saw that killed his four friends. I was speaking in Fort Walton Beach, Florida one time, and Valerie Bill came to me and said, Mr. Hoven, my, my stepson, Larry Bill, was one of the kids who was eaten. That story you are telling is correct. But the Pensacola News Journal said, after they interviewed him, they said, this is a beach town. You know, people come here to go swimming. We're not going to report that your friends got eaten by a dinosaur. We're going to report that they drowned. So that's what the newspaper said, four teenagers drowned. Panama City, there's something seen there similar. Youth director at a Lutheran church told me his whole youth group was in the van and they saw a creature like that in Panama City Harbor. There have been many reports of dinosaurs still living. There could be some pterodactyls still alive. The natives call the animal the Congomato. If you're in uh, Congo, in, Bat in Kenya, they call it Batamzinga. Uh, Steve Romani was, Romandi was on the Kenya Olympic running team. He called me and said, he was going to school in uh, Louisiana. He said, Mr. Hovind, I saw those creatures. He said, we've got them in my village in Kenya. He said, their favorite food is decaying human flesh. They dig up graves and eat the bodies. They kept talking about the Kangamato. Well, we could cover dinosaurs still living for hours, but there have been lots of reports of pterodactyls still around. I get calls about this from people all the time, about pterodactyls being seen in Papua New Guinea or in uh, Indonesia or in Venezuela. Wish we had time to cover all that, about all these pterodactyl sightings. Uh, Dave Wetzel went there and said, man, the natives kept talking about this flying ropen that glows in the dark over in Papua New Guinea. It lives on the island right there. So what's the point? You say, Brother Hovind, who cares? Yeah, I think there might be some dinosaurs still alive. And I think we have really been lied to about the dinosaurs. Now, I don't think there's many, and it's probably safe to go to the dorm, okay? Don't get excited and think, wow, we're going to get eaten by a dinosaur. Yeah. No, it's not that way. The hallway will be clear tonight, I assure you, okay? But the Indians had a legend called the Thunderbird. They said a giant bird got hit by lightning. When they found it three days later, the buzzards had picked the bones clean, but they said the wingspan was 20 feet and had a bony bump on the back of its head. The Indian prayer sticks, to this day, have the head of a pterodactyl on them. Now Henry Ford put an eagle on the taillight of his thunderbird. It should have been a pterodactyl. You blew it, Henry. Uh, French explorers uh, Jacques Marquette and Joliet stopped near what now is the town of St. Louis and reported they saw a big, ugly bird painted on the cliff on the other side in Alton, Illinois. The Indians said, oh, that's a Piasaw bird. A great chief killed him years ago. They painted the picture up there for years. They finally put a big metal plaque. There's me down below it for scale. They took it down for fear the plaque would fall. I guess they just recently put it back up. I don't know. But if you go to Alton, Illinois, you'll see Piasaw, you know, Piasaw Dairy Queen. <laughs> it's pretty famous over there, whatever the Piasaw bird was. Okay. And we talk a lot about that. Um, people say, well, Brother Hovind, why do you speak about dinosaurs? Well, for one thing, Satan's using them to teach his gospel. It's time Christians, you know, put up a defense. Christians are confused where they fit in. They are a great evangelistic tool. Kids will gather around you like crazy when you get dinosaurs. He's the chief of the ways of God. Well, then God ought to get the glory. Now, the Bible also talks about Leviathan, but that's a whole other story. We'll cover Leviathan some other time. So basically, God made everything in six days. Dinosaurs lived with man. People have killed most of them. There could be a few still alive. And Christians need to quit worrying about dinosaurs and start using them for God's glory. We'll cover more on that in the next session. Well, this is Kent Hovind. It is uh, August 31st, 1993. I'm sitting here at the Antique Quest in Winchester, New Hampshire, with uh, Sandy Mansi. It's good to see you again, Sandy. I saw you uh, back in 92. And Sandy is the one that saw uh, Champ. Her picture appears on the cover of the book uh, by Joseph Zarzinski. Uh, this was, this took place. Why don't you tell us uh, when it was and where you were and just a little bit about it? I was in. Vermont, on the Vermont side, and my 
husband, when we weren't married at the time, my fiance and my children, we were exploring the lake. I grew up in that area. And we were just exploring the lake, sitting there, enjoying the peace and quiet. My husband had gone back to the car to get the camera. And while he was gone, there was a disturbance in the lake. And I looked out. I thought perhaps it was a school of fish, and maybe a scuba diver or something. And then the head and the neck broke the surface of the water, and the head picked up in the neck and the back. And I knew it wasn't a fish. Right. <laughs> well, great. And some people said they, 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 I heard somebody told you that they thought maybe it was a duck. About a 2,000 pound duck. A 2,000 pound duck. When we were at the church, when you came to hear me speak up in uh, uh, wherever that was, New Hampshire, Dublin, New Hampshire, you, uh, I had all my dinosaurs on the table, and you immediately picked out this one as champ. But you said it was a little different, what you saw. Yes, what I saw is the neck was not near as long, and the head is shaped right, like a horse head. But the neck is not near as long. Okay, now, there are three or four different types of swimming dinosaurs that bones have been found of. There's the chronosaur, which has a huge neck, the plesiosaur, which you're holding, and then there's the elasmosaur. Uh, had a shorter neck, and the head is at a right angle to the body instead of in line with the body. Uh, there may be others, of course, undiscovered yet, but get that where they can see it on the camera. Um, I think this more. Shorter with neck. A, with a shorter neck, or, or it could be the... The neck wasn't all out of the water, too. Okay. All right, so this was in, back in 1977. Um, how many other people do you know, or have you talked to that claim they have seen it also? I have spoken with probably about six different people who have seen it. Mm -hmm. And all of our accounts are very, very similar. So we all can't be crazy, and we all can't right. be telling something that maybe we didn't see. But they're all very, very similar with the shape of the head, the neck, um, just the massive size of it. Okay, now you, you watched it for about how long, would you say? Probably from the time of the disturbance until it went back down, maybe eight minutes, ten minutes. Eight to ten minutes, okay. And uh, you told me the last time we talked, about a year ago, that when it first came up, it was um, looking different directions, it was looking yeah. around. When it came up, it was facing this way, okay, to me. And when it came up out of the water, and then it looked around, and when I did take the one snapshot, it was getting fidgety. It was getting a little more movement to it. And it had turned its head to look over its back. And that's when I got the snapshot. And then it turned, and then it went down. And it started going down like this, and then it put its head down under the water. After it was completely under the water, I heard a boat coming. I heard a boat. Mm -hmm. Never didn't even see the boat, but I heard it coming. It knew that boat was coming long before my sense of hearing picked it up. Hmm. A lot of people I've interviewed have told me that, uh, like the ones in Africa, the dinosaurs in Africa, they'll, the natives claim they have very sensitive hearing, and they'll hear you coming and duck under the water. Mm -hmm. I've got missionary friends over there that say there are dinosaurs in that swamp. Absolutely, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure of it. God created one. He created many. Sure. And this is something that has to be a creation. It's not It's not something that could have come from the eel or any of that nonsense. And if God could say, why do you create many? Sure, right. Now, your, your picture has, uh, as well as being on the cover of Joseph's book, has been in a number of places. It was in Time Magazine, mm -hmm. uh, the July 81, I think. You were on Unsolved Mysteries, did you say this last week? Or? I don't know. Unsolved Mysteries has shown three times. Um, the first was in September last year, and then it was September on. September of 92. Right. Okay. And, and then um, recently, about a week or so ago, we had a rerun of it. Oh, okay. So you're a movie star now? No. <laughs> well, there are those who teach that Evolution is a proven fact. The dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. I, have, as you know, am very different. I was a scientist, science teacher, 15 years. I'm of the strong, studied opinion that uh, a few dinosaurs are even still alive. The world isn't millions of years old. Would you say that what you saw was best described as being a dinosaur of some kind, water dwelling? I saw a dinosaur. You felt like you were seeing a dinosaur, right? I know. Not felt. I know. You know. Okay. I saw a dinosaur. 
Now, the question comes to some people's mind, why did you only take one picture? Because I didn't want to miss anything. Busy watching it. I was busy watching it. I brought the camera up, I took the one photograph, and then I put it down because I didn't want to miss anything. I was in so, such total awe right. of what was happening. And I don't even know why I took the one. It was just instant. My husband handed me the camera. He had gone after the he camera. He had gone anyway. after the camera to take pictures of the children. Okay, before it surfaced. Right. We didn't even know anything was going okay. on until he got back there. Sure. And he helped me up the banking, and he handed me the camera so to help me up the banking. And I had it. My knees gave out. I, I was shaking. And I went down on my knees. I picked the camera up. I took the one photograph, and then put it down. I had a both balance. You could have uh, taken 20 pictures. Oh, absolutely. Right. But I wanted to watch it, and I was, <clears throat> and your mind tries to rationalize. And I'm trying to think, well, what is this? And, you, and there comes a point when you cannot rationalize it. Yeah, well, great. Anything else, any other typical questions you get asked? Or, most of the people that interview you are those who believe in evolution. Yeah. And how do you feel about that? Yeah. You don't like that? <laughs> I agree with you 100%. Yeah. And, and I appreciate you letting me use your picture. I put it on one of my posters. Um, yeah. And uh, I have quite a few pictures from different people. And my motive is to strengthen people's faith in the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. And uh, there's Sandy's picture. You've been featured in a number of uh, shows and magazines and things like that. And you're just, you've lived here how long? In, in, in Winchester? About 20 years. 20 years. So you had no intention of trying to become a celebrity by photographing Jan. No, as a matter of fact, I really didn't even want to publish. I kept it a secret for two years. And then I made them keep it in the scientific world. And then they said, well, that's not true. You know, I was forced by the media to publish. Mm -hmm. Because they were calling, well, if this exists, why haven't we seen it? And sure, right. Well, I was forced to, and that's why I had to, I put a copyright on so that I could have some control and some protection mm -hmm. as to who's going to use it. Right. Smart. Good move. Now, people have asked me, they say, hey, if these creatures, if there's so many of these creatures, why don't we get more pictures? And I, I ask them the question, I'll say, have you ever seen a car wreck? And I say, well, sure. I'll say, give me a picture of one as it happens. You never see a picture of a car wreck as it happens, and yet thousands of car wrecks happen. So it's when a, it's something that it's fleeting. It lasts a few seconds. You don't think of taking a picture until it's too late. And, well, maybe if you could uh, keep me posted, send me information if you get any more people. Other because people probably come to you all the time, don't they? And say, yes. hey, I saw it. Yes. I would like to keep a file of that. Just send me a list. Absolutely. There's a camp up here on the wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me about the old gentleman that came and looked at it. I was standing here at the counter, and an older gentleman came in and. He's staring at the picture, and he's staring, and he asked me what it was, and I told him it was cheap from Lake Champlain. And he went on to tell me that he had never told a soul this, and he was in his 80s. I think he said he was 89 or 87. And he tells me about when he was a young man, and he went fishing with his grandfather up in Lake Champlain, up by uh, the Bulwaga Bay, um, that area. Up he, he grew up on the lake. Yeah, he grew up on the lake. Okay. And he told me of a time that he and his grandfather were out fishing, and this monstrous big thing, he said, came out of the water. And his grandfather told him that it was Chan, and that he wasn't to tell anybody due to the fact that he would think, think that they were insane. Mm -hmm. And so he, all those years, he never told a soul about it. I was the first person he told and he said to me, I was not insane. My grandfather was not insane. We saw a living, breathing dinosaur. Right. And I was like, hallelujah. Yeah. Yes. More and more testimony. Yes, absolutely. Now, other people, other people have seen it and they come to you and say, hey, you know. Yes, and, and I, I, I appreciate that because it gives me vindication. You know? right. I'm not crazy. I'm not freaked out. Yeah. This is what I saw, this is what they saw, and we all saw something. And what? And someday maybe the lake will give up her secret. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But let's not kill it. Don't kill it, no. no. Great. Well, thank you so much. You got customers here, we better let you go.
It's a shark! God darn, some weak things don't come out of the water. Dude, what the heck happened? Hey, there's one under. Oh, the trail. We're under right there again. You saw those binoculars. You see those binoculars? It was a shark. No, it was not a shark. Something just came up there. I've seen it, Dad. It's gone. It went under. I think we just see Champ. What's Champ? Like Champlain Monster. It's gone, Clayton. I know. I shouldn't have looked at it with the binoculars so long. I should have got the camera. Oh, under the same way. started way the heck out there. You know, that buoy, just past that buoy when that sailboat went by. I know. When I was looking at it with the binoculars, I thought it was just a log. It, just, it ran over, but it went right from that buoy oh. all, all the way inland, went underneath right in there. This is a giant squid of the species Archituthis ducks. It came ashore on November the 22nd, 1979, at St. Brendan's on Collier's Island in Bonavista Bay, Newfoundland. It's an immature female. It is a small female, but it is a giant squid. I believe the giant squid reach an approximate maximum size of something like 150 feet. If this is 20 feet long, uh, well then, um, it's uh, almost uh, eight times longer than this in overall length, and that's a big squid. In 1976, just 30 miles off the Lizard in Cornwall, two fishermen, George Vinnikin and John Cox, also met a monster. Well, it went steaming 30 miles off, 25 to 30 miles off. So what I thought was up turns out on the, on the horizon. So we went over to investigate. When we got closer, we could see it wasn't an upturned boat. It was something that, well, neither of us had seen before. So it was dark in color, and had sort of humps on the back. I should say it was, well, between 15 and 18 feet in length, and rising above the sea about three feet. It was a flat, calm day. There was no disturbance in, on the sea at all. Well, we got up closer, went a little closer, I came astern, to our amazement, up out the water about three feet from this body, head arrived, head peered out the water. And it was a, well, thing I've never seen before after about 40 years of sea. And it gradually sank in the water and disappeared. But after talking about it, the only thing we could explain it was, a, was one of, very much like a prehistoric animal. These open line program. I do believe that's what's going on in here this morning. Teresa, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. We're talking about the Ogopogo uh, today. A lot of people in uh, the area have seen it. The legend goes on for many years, and we'll be talking to some experts. I believe we've got Arlene Gall coming in. Arlene wrote a book on it. That's right. But we're going to go to the phone lines right now. Line two, good morning. Hello there, Mr. Puglis. Yes, go yes, ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, you want to know about Ogopogo? I certainly do. Yeah, okay. I had a taxi and uh, I took a passenger to the hospital and uh, and then the, I was coming down uh, Abbott Street. And I got far as uh, about here. I looked to the lake. I was surprised. I seen this thing come out of the water. Well, it's like a like a horse's head with the kind of horns on it. Well, he was huge, you know standing up there, oh my, just like a, you know, like a big serpent. Then another fellow come behind me and he says, what are you looking at? He says, I should see no Gopogo over there. And uh, he says, where, where? Over there, he says. I, I had the door open the car and uh, stepped out just a little bit 
and uh, we slipped back into the water, see? And he said, gee, look at the big, uh, big waves there. And all we can see is uh, big waves going down there to Fred's place where he had the boat, boat rental. And they disappeared, see? And then, and then I got all excited. I got in the car and I pulled to the willow in and I told the people, I says, uh, they were having breakfast. I just seen Ogopogo. And they says, what the heck you been drinking, eh? Line four, go ahead, please. Hello, John. How are you? I'm not too bad. Good. Are you going to give me your name? No, I'm not. Okay. Tell I me about saw, the... I saw Ogopogo off of Clarsons about four years ago. Okay, you don't want to give your name on the air. No, I don't. Uh, you've told some people, obviously. Uh, yes. Uh, are you afraid that they might think you're a little bit of a... Well, I had some strange phone calls. And, uh, I get them every day. That's what they pay me for. <laughs> well, I don't get paid for them, so I don't really <laughs> want, any, want any more. Thank you. We were up on the beach having a picnic, and my daughter was on the swing when I saw this creature underneath the wharf there. And when I turned around and saw it and realized that it was the legendary Ogopogo, I just freaked out. I just ran, I grabbed the baby and ran down to the beach and she I guess I yelled over and over, that's him. She was screaming like anything. She just couldn't believe it. Her face was red and uh, was fishing or whatever it was doing. And it was there for quite some time. Then it straightened out and went along those poles. And as it traveled along, it just the three humps were showing. And they were from one of those end of those poles to the other in the space the three humps were. It traveled along the beach till about the corner over there, and then it turned and went straight across the lake. All right, we're going to break from the phone calls right now and introduce to you someone that's well known in the Okanagan Valley, Arlene Gall. Arlene has written a book. The Yogo Pogo. Good morning, Arlene. Good How morning, are you? Good morning, John. Morning, Teresa. Morning, Arlene. How Arlene. many sightings have you documented? Literally hundreds. Mm. Literally hundreds. When was the first sighting? The very first sighting was in 1852. The first documented sighting in 1852. Okay, 1852, and it's now 1980. 1980. Do we take <laughs> it to uh, mean that there must be more than one Ogopogo? There definitely appear to be more than one. There has been a film that was made, and I think it was back in 1968. It's pretty hard not to believe when you see it right in front of your eyes. Tell us about that film this morning. The Folden film was taken in 1968 by a gentleman by the name of Art Folden. He was returning from a trip to his home in Chase. And as he neared uh, the Peachland area, he spotted an object out on the lake, and he said to his wife, look, there's Ogopogo. And she laughed at him. And he got out and started filming the creature. And what we see in the film is a large animate object moving through the water, surfacing and submerging uh, at various speeds and at various times. And it also shows the creature taking off at very high speed, producing a massive weight. And this is the footage uh, in the film that I like very much, because you see a creature just pushing water, something terrifically, with a massive weight in front, just creating uh, huge wave action. This is believability on my part. Have there been any uh, recent sightings? We've had approximately uh, seven to eight sightings this year, but we have one uh, that has been the very best sighting. Why? It was the Rieger family. Beautiful day. The water was just as calm as glass. When I just took a look across, I could see a big wave coming. And uh, at that time, I just didn't uh, take much notice of it. And it kept coming closer. And I thought to myself, why would there be a wave coming if uh, there's no wind or anything? So I called to my son. I says, come on back here. And I says, take a look and see if you think what the heck's coming down the lake here. So he took a look at it. And he says, gee, I don't know. So his, uh, we had his grandson, my grandson was along too. And he said, hey, Grandpa, he says, that's the Ogopogo. It would have ran right into us, but we had to wheel the boat off alongside. And then it, we followed it alongside for about, oh, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And I'd say the monster was possibly 14 to 16 feet long, which was above water, sticking above about three feet. And had a, quite a hump on the front shoulders and had a hump on the back where the tail went. And I'd say the tail was par approximately Oh, probably 30, 40, maybe 50 feet, because you couldn't see the end of it. But he did have a long tail. He had four legs. And I'd say the monster weighed approximately 
maybe 30 ton. And his head, uh, and his head in the front was moving from side to side. Uh, it, uh, it seemed like, uh, he, like uh, he was looking for fish or, or, or feeding or something like that. And, uh, he was, uh, and uh, he was stirring up a tremendous amount of water. If I would have never seen it, I would have never believed it. And actually, I don't care if anybody believes me or not. But I, I seen this animal, and I know it's here. I know it's a tremendous sized animal. It was some sort of a, we call it a, a monster fish, for lack of a better word. But it was approximately 30 to 35 feet in length. And its head was protruding out of the water. And uh, uh, you could see the flagell action of the tail and the waves going be beyond it. And uh, I took two pictures of it. Well, you said it was roughly similar to this. What was different? It's similar to this. Uh, I couldn't see these fins on the side okay. because they were. If that is the the, the the fish that I saw or or whatever. Mm -hmm. They were not uh, within sight. I mean, I could only see the head, and the neck, and like the upper part of the body. This is uh, Kent Hoven from Pensacola, Florida. I'm here in Canada at the 100 Huntley Street program. Several years ago, I think 1994, when I was uh, here on the program. I brought my book from Dr. Roy Mackle, uh, A Living Dinosaur, and uh, Cal, who's sitting here beside me, uh, Bombay said, uh, as we, he, was, he said, well, I was in Africa and I saw something like that, a dinosaur. And I turned to this page, page 256 in uh, Roy Mackle's book, and uh, Cal, you said, hey, I saw one of those. Would you take just a few minutes and tell the folks what you saw and, you know, where you work and if they can get a hold of you for any questions and tell, just describe what you saw. Well, it was, it was, it was probably one of the most startling experiences I've ever had. It was about uh, in 1963, I think, and I was on my way through the old roads of Kenya back to Nairobi to pick up a car. So I was taking this old Chevrolet that was almost too big for those roads for the potholes. And I was going rather slow. And it was a hilly country in near a place called Muharoni. And uh, that's down in the Rift Valley, but a hilly part of the Rift Valley. As we came up over the brow of the hill, my wife was with me. And suddenly laying there in front of us, right across the road, seven, eight, nine feet long, uh, was what I thought at first was a a crocodile, and I thought, no, it can't be a crocodile. This is a dry part of the country. And then as I looked at it, we slowed down and stopped the car, actually, and, and stood and sat there for 10 minutes looking at this. And as I looked at it, I, I thought, this, this is, I mean, the, the actual word prehistoric went through my mind. I said, this can't be real. I've seen pictures like this, but not quite like this one. Anyway, from the tail right through to the back of its head were, were uh, I don't know what you call them. Serrations, ridges. Ridges, uh, yeah. ridges, like triangulars, perfectly, perfect triangles, all the way from the tail to the, to the, for the head to the tail. And it was just laying squatted down on the road, seeming to sun. And uh, so I, I, l I looked at the thing for 10 minutes. I'd, I could shoot myself for not having my camera with me that day, right. but I wish I had. But there it was, and I, I had never seen anything like it, and nor before nor since. And I've asked people, in fact, I went to the Natural Museum and said, have you ever seen anything or heard of anything in Kenya of this nature? And they said, no, there's nothing like that alive today. I said, I saw something. And I, I argued with them really rather intensely for a while. And they said, well, it must have been a figment of your imagination. Well, my, my wife and I both saw it. And we, we asked for several years, we asked anybody if they'd ever seen anything like that. Nobody had, nor had I, have I since. But there it was, laying on the road. After about 10 minutes, it stood up not quite as high as as this drawing, but uh, it s just kind of wandered off into a very dry, dry part of the country, bushy a little bit, not much greenery. It was a dry time of the year, and it just took off. And Mary and I just kind of looked at each other in wonder, saying, what in the world is this thing? What, what color was it? It was kind of dusty gray. Okay. Uh, Could you see the eyes? Yeah. They, they'd blink. In fact, it turned its head and looked at, looked at us. You know, it, it didn't seem to be afraid of us. Could you tell from the pupil of the eyeball, was it slotted or round? I like, I or could you see that? I Not that close? I, I don't think I was close enough to see that. Was the shape of the snout like a crocodile? Would more, you say? more like a crocodile than a, than a hippo, say. Okay, yeah, sure. It had a, it had a long uh, face. Now, uh, some of the African people I asked, uh, they said, oh, that was a monitor lizard. Well, I said, impossible. I've seen many monitor lizards. I've never seen one nine feet long. Right. Never as long as that. And I've actually killed a couple of the monitor lizards in my car. 
and uh, they're smooth skinned and no ridges in the back. I know a monitor lizard when I see one. This was not a monitor lizard. This had those uh, ridges down its back. Could you tell if it had smooth skin or scales? It looked, it looked kind of bumpy, more like an alligator. Right, okay. Uh, uh, on the sides. Mm -hmm. I don't think it had scales. <coughs> okay. I, I can't really be sure. Uh, All right, well. It, it's been a lot of years ago. It's nine, six, I mean, this is 1997. I well, I've been saying <laughs> for years there's a few dinosaurs still alive, mm -hmm. and your first thought in your mind was something prehistoric, huh? Well, of course, I've been pre, I, I had been preconditioned by all the education that I'd had up till that right. time that yeah. these things don't exist. Whatever it is, it can't be a dinosaur. That's the yeah. first thought most yeah. people have. Well, well I, I, I considered it had to be some kind of a lizard. Sure. And because, you know, you have litter, lizards from this size, the yeah. little gecko lizards, right up to monitor lizards. All right, now you work here at 100 Huntley Street, mm -hmm. and they, what's the phone number here? So if they have any questions, they can call and ask for Cal Bombay. My no phone number is area code 905-335-7100, extension 3206. All right, well, call them up if you don't believe it. Uh, that's I, I saw it. I mean, a lot of people. still alive. Uh, when I saw this picture, I thought, that's what I saw. I mean, it, All right, it, let's get them to zoom in on this picture if you can real quick, and we'll close out with that. If you have any questions, they would be glad to help. Uh, give us a call if you want more information on dinosaurs. Uh, you let us know, and we'll be glad to send you our videotape on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. So that's what you saw that day, 1962. That's All as right. close as anything I've ever seen. To okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate the time, and uh, God bless you. You're Amen. welcome. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now, and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. And forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help. What you're about to hear is an audio tape made of, apparently, the roaring of the creature in the Congo Swamp the natives call Mokele Mbembe, uh, which would be one of the few living dinosaurs. The sound appears to have a flapping or slapping sound near the end of each roar. Some have speculated that this may be similar to the gecko lizard that uh, makes a little roaring sound and then the flap of skin under its throat slaps back against the throat making the slapping sound. That's the best uh, so far we have on this. If you hear any more, please let me know. I hope you enjoy it. For information on the Ministry of Creation Science Evangelism, write us at Creation Science Evangelism. 
P.O. Box 37338, Pensacola, Florida, 32526, USA. Or call us at 850-479-3466. That's 850-479-DINO. You may also visit us on the web at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com. Dr. Hovind taught science for 15 years. Then he got his PhD in education. He's always had a love for teaching. But one thing that he's discovered is that in many of the science textbooks across America today, there are some fallacies, some false information being presented. Why is this information in the science textbooks? What are they trying to prove? Hi, my name is Eric, and in this seminar called Lies in the Textbooks, you're going to find out some of those lies that are being presented and what you can do about it. Welcome to our seminar on lies in the textbooks. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years. And now for, well, since 1989, I've been doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And our goal is to strengthen your faith in God's Word. Now, this is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. We live in Pensacola, Florida. Been there 16 years. Have three children, one of each. And I got them all married and the dog died. Praise God, so I'm home free. And as we mentioned earlier, we have four grandkids so far, and that's God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. So we got a whole tribe, and they all live right around me and all work in our ministry. It's a real blessing to all have them right there. God's given us an amazing staff of people at Creation Science Evangelism. Our purpose is to get people saved. Okay? We like science at our place. We have Dinosaur Adventure Land. We have a science center, a theme park, and a museum, all kinds of cool science stuff. Some people try to say, well, you Christians are against science. No, 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 I like science. I'm against evolution because it's not part of science. Evolution's a lie, okay? There's no scientific evidence to back up evolution. We'll get into that in just a minute. The Bible says in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. Proverbs says, A false witness shall not be unpunished. He that speaketh lies shall not escape. God hates liars. The Bible says they delight in lies, okay? These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A lying tongue, then a couple of verses later, a false witness that speaketh lies. Out of the seven things God hates, two of them are liars. <laughs> he must really hate them. He lists them in there twice, okay? Jesus said, you have your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. Now, I like science, and I collect public school textbooks. I have hundreds of them from many, many countries, from clear back from 1880, I believe, to 2005, textbooks. I'm not against science. We happen to really like the subject. We have all kinds of cool science displays at our museum and our science center, and you can come down and visit Dinosaur Adventure Land and see for yourself. I am, however, against lying to kids. Now, in the first three videos, we talked about how students are being lied to about the Big Bang. It didn't happen. They're being lied to about the age of the earth. It is not billions of years old. They're being lied to about the cavemen. There's never been a caveman, unless you mean Osama bin Laden. Okay. <laughs> They're being lied to about the dinosaurs. They did not live millions of years ago. Now here we're going to cover about 30 more lies in the textbooks. There are hundreds we could go through. We're going to try to hit the highlights, and this could go for days just covering lies in our textbooks. I'm going to hit some of the big ones, leave some of the little ones go for another time when we have more time. Now, I am not trying to get evolution out of the public schools. I'm not. I think any theory should be allowed to be taught if you don't have to lie to support your theory with that false evidence, okay? I am not trying to get creation into the schools. And I think Christians that work on either one of those are wasting their time. And many people have wasted hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to accomplish those two goals. It's futile. It's not going to happen. I am, however, trying to get lies out of the textbooks. I think we'll find if we take the lies out of the books, there's nothing left to support evolution. Well, that's their problem. They shouldn't have picked such a dumb theory to begin with, okay? It's not my fault, okay? Now, I'm not against teachers. My mother was a godly woman, led my dad to the Lord on their first date. She retired from teaching public school years ago. Been in heaven now for about seven years. My brother led me to the Lord. He just retired last year from teaching public school after 34 years. 
There are many good godly teachers in the system. There are many good godly principals, many good godly school board members. I'm not against schools. I'm not against school boards. I'm not against teachers. I'm not against textbooks. I'm against lies. Okay, let's just keep it in perspective. Is there anybody here that thinks te teachers or textbooks should be allowed to deliberately lie to students for any reason? And I mean deliberately. They might be lying and not know they're lying, okay? But if they're deliberately lying, that shouldn't be allowed, should it? Okay? Wisconsin has a law that requires textbooks to be accurate. So does Alabama. Textbooks shall be adequate and current, up to date, okay? The latest information. Texas has a law that says, instructional material shall be factual. Go Texas, okay? Florida has a law that requires accuracy of instructional materials, and the commissioner is responsible to remove books that are not accurate. Well, commissioner, do your job, okay? Watch this video and remove the books that are not accurate. It's just simple. It's so simple, okay? California says textbooks shall be factually accurate and reflect uh, current and confirmed research, okay? Minnesota says a teacher shall not deliberately suppress or distort subject matter. Yeah, sure, hey there, fella. You betcha. The problem is none of those states enforce their own laws. I don't know if Tennessee here has a law that requires textbook accuracy. They ought to if they don't have one. If you don't have one, pass one. This is a textbook from about 100 years ago. It says, God created the heavens and the earth in six days. Hmm. Prayer is a duty, but it's vain to pray without a sincere desire of heart. God governs the world in infinite wisdom. you believe that's a public school textbook? Well, here's one today. Evolution is fact, not theory. Birds arose from non-birds and humans from non-humans. No person who pretends to any understanding of the natural world can deny these facts. Wow, something's changed. Actually, I was at uh, Chickasaw, uh, Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago. Did it, it was supposed to be a debate, but none of the professors would debate me. So they scheduled an evolution seminar two days after I was gone. They let me come speak on creation. The, the student group got me in there. Here's a poster they put up right next to my poster. Uh, the poster was inviting people to come to the evolution seminar. Interested in evolution? Well, come on down. Evolution lecture with Dr. Mather and Dr. Ray. It says, hear both sides of the issue. <laughs> well, we invited them to debate. They could have heard both sides altogether. Here are the kids get nine months of evolution teaching. I come in for two hours and they panic. And then they got to say, hear both sides. Both sides. You're not going to present both sides. You're going to present one side the evolution side, which is what they already got for nine months. They don't want to hear it. <laughs> I think they said 20 people turned up, 15 of them are from the Baptist Student Union, just to see what the teachers would say. Okay. They hear both sides. Their own textbook there in Chickasaw, Oklahoma, has one quarter of the book, one entire unit devoted only to evolution teaching. Nothing about creation. Evolution is a dying religion surviving only on tax dollars. It's dead. This textbook has over 100 pages where evolution is talked about. There's not one single mention of creation. So don't tell me they want to hear both sides. They don't, okay? They want to present one view only. It's called indoctrination, not education. Now, this is a chart showing how the atheists feel that the different states are doing with the teaching of evolution. They think you folks in Tennessee are doing a lousy job of teaching evolution to your kids. Go, Tennessee. All right. Hey, hey. Okay. <laughs> they think the folks right over here in North Carolina are doing a good job of teaching evolution. Well, North Carolina folks, get on the ball. Turn your state red by the next time they do this survey, okay? Now, is there anybody here that thinks te teachers or textbooks should be allowed to use outdated or false information just to get students to believe a theory? Would that be a good idea? No, okay? Anybody here that thinks teachers that deliberately lie should be fired? Okay. Is there anybody here that thinks textbooks with lies should be banned or the lies torn out of the book? Think that'd be fair? All right. Well, buckle up, hang on, let's go. It's always amazed me how two people can look at the same thing and come to opposite conclusions of what they are looking at. You know, two people can look at Grand Canyon. One of them believes in evolution. He looks at the canyon and says, wow, look what the Colorado River did for millions and millions of years. The Bible believing Christian stands there, looks at the same canyon, and says, wow, look what the flood did in about 30 minutes. Now, how was that canyon formed, huh? 
Textbook says over millions of years, the Colorado River formed the Grand, carved the Grand Canyon from solid rock. Oh, now, hold on a second, okay? It's a fact the Grand Canyon exists. I've been there a bunch of times, studied. I taught her science for 15 years. I love studying Grand Canyon. There are two interpretations of how it got there. The evolutionists will say it formed slowly with a little bit of water and lots of time, like, you know, billions of years. The creationists will say, no, it formed quickly by lots of water and a little bit of time, like a big flood in the days of Noah. And the guys who believe in evolution are always trying to erase the line between their interpretation and try to include it as if it is part of the fact. <laughs> no, no, it's just your interpretation, guys, okay? This textbook says, the Colorado River has cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. Well, now, hold on a minute. This textbook says, the Colorado River cut through 2,000 meters of rock, exposing sediment layers like huge pages in the Book of Life. Scan the canyon wall from rim to floor, and you look back through hundreds of millions of years. I don't think so. I was in a debate one time, and this atheist said, Hoven, you're so stupid. Don't you know it took millions of years to carve the Grand Canyon? I said, well, sir, there's a couple things you ought to learn about Grand Canyon. If you built a dam across Grand Canyon, a huge lake would fill in behind it, covering several states, okay? <laughs> I mean, take a lot of dirt to build a dam, but if you could build a dam across that canyon, you'd have a really big lake. Actually, some of the water from Wyoming drains through the Grand Canyon. It has a huge drainage pattern. Here's a picture of it, satellite false color uh, image. You can see Grand Canyon right there, a big gash right across a ridge in the mountains. You folks in Tennessee know what a ridge is. Not really a mountain, just a big, long ridge, okay? I've flown by and taken lots of pictures. I asked the pilot one time, I was going, going, I said, man, are we going near Grand Canyon? He said, yeah, about 100 miles. I said, can you uh, get permission to, you know, divert and go closer? He said, ah, uh, let me see what I can do. He got permission, and we flew right over the top of the canyon. I'm taking pictures like crazy, you know. Love studying Grand Canyon. Actually, it's a bunch of useless real estate. I mean, what would you do with it if you had it, you know? You can look at it and then go home. That's about it. But, I mean, you can't plow it, that's for sure, and you don't want your cows playing out there. But... I said to this professor, I said, sir, there's a couple things to consider about this canyon. I said, these two red lines indicate what's called the snow line, okay? Between those two red lines is a ridge that gets about uh, 6,900 to 8,500 feet above sea level. Now, the river enters the canyon at the far right over there at 2,800 foot elevation. The river flows downhill for 270 miles, comes out the other side. If you look at it from a side view, a schematic view, it'll look like this. The river comes in, 2,800 foot elevation. The ground rises up while the river goes down for 270 miles. I said, now, sir, there's a few things you ought to consider about this canyon. I said, did you know the top of Grand Canyon is higher than the bottom? He said, obviously. I said, sir, did you know the river only runs through the bottom? He said, well, yeah. I said, sir, did you know the top is higher than where the river enters the canyon by over 4,000 feet? He got a dazed look on his face like a calf looking at a new gate. I said, sir, did you know rivers don't flow uphill in Tennessee? There's no delta. Where's the mud that washed out of Grand Canyon? Nobody has a clue, okay? That river did not make that canyon. Grand Canyon's a washed out spillway. There used to be two big lakes, Grand Lake and Hopi Lake. The lakes are long gone, but the beaches are still there. You can still see the beach line. They got too full and went over the top and washed out that canyon in a hurry. Any farmer that's ever built a dam to hold water for his cows will tell you, once the water goes over the top of the dam, it's all over with. That's why they guard the levee like crazy during flood seasons, don't they? Get out there with sandbags. You don't want it to even get started. It's gone in a flash, okay? This river flows down this, this way. Obviously, it started at the top. Must have been a big lake backed up there, too. Even El Paso, Texas is called El Paso because it's the pass, okay? I bet there used to be a big lake backed up behind El Paso that dried up and left the white sands of New Mexico behind. That's another long, interesting story. But if you look at Grand Canyon, it's pretty obvious it's a washed-out spillway, okay? Almost all rivers around the world come together at what's called acute angles, less than 90 degrees. I mean, the rivers merge and keep going the same, you know, general direction. If you look at Grand Canyon, the rivers on the lower left are indeed merging at l acute angles, less than 90 degrees. But if you look at the upper right, the rivers are flowing backwards. Why would they do that? The rivers run backwards, hit the main channel, turn around, and come back out the other way. It's called a barbed canyon. 
there aren't many places like this on the planet. Well, this is evidence that a lake is draining, and as the water's running off the spillway backwards into the channel, it turns around or off the dam, water runs off the dam into the low place, turns around and comes back out through the crack, through the breach in the dam. Grand Canyon was not made by the Colorado River over millions of years. That is one of the lies you kids are going to face in your textbook. It's just not geophysically possible for that to happen. Now, are there any farmers or vets in the crowd that might know what this machine is? What is that, brother? That's a calf puller. That's a what? A calf puller. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, a cow has a hard time having that baby calf, and so to get the calf puller out, tie the cable around the calf's legs and <coughs> jack the calf out of the cow. You get a few tons of pressure on there, calf comes right out, no problem. Well, one day, this farmer was out pulling a calf. It was a breech birth. The back feet are coming out first. That's not good, but you know, it happens once in a while. So the farmer had the calf puller out there, and he's <coughs> trying to pull the calf out of the cow. And a city fellow stopped his car to see what on earth is going on. And the farmer said, have you ever seen anything like this before? The city fellow said, I have never seen nothing like this. The farmer said, do you have any questions? The city fellow said, yes, sir, I have one question. It's been bugging me for 10 minutes. The farmer said, well, uh, what's your question? And the city fellow said, how fast do you figure that calf was going when it ran into that cow? <laughs> No, 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 no. We're not separating the rack here, fellas. You know, it's possible for two people to be looking at the same thing, and one of them is getting the wrong idea of what he's looking at. The Bible warned us that was going to happen. Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. Did you know there are people that scoff at the Bible? I deal with them on a regular basis. I attract them like a lightning rod. They scoff, it says, because of their lust. There's no scientific reason for them to reject the Bible. They just don't like that book because it chaps their hide. So they're scoffing because of their lust, not because of their science, okay? Even Huxley admitted, I suppose the reason we leapt at Origin of Species was that the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. Uh, we don't want God telling us what to do, okay? Arthur Keith said, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. The Bible says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Anybody that believes they evolved from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, I would say is strongly deluded. You would have to have help to be that dumb. You could not do it on your own. You'd have to have years of training and conditioning to believe such a silly idea. Hey, is it possible for a person to go insane? I mean, absolutely loony? Oh, yeah, it happens, doesn't it? Okay. Is it possible for an entire group of people to go insane? Can you imagine over 900 people drinking poison Kool-Aid and killing themselves? A whole group went insane. Is it possible for an entire nation to go insane? You know, like millions and millions of people go just plain old nuts? Oh, it's happened, folks. Hey, is it possible for the entire world to go insane? Well, the Bible says, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. I think we're living in a time when just about the whole world has gone nuts. They believe they come from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. How dumb can you get? Second Peter goes on to say, where is the promise of his coming? That's what the scoffers are going to say. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's an important phrase. The scoffers are going to say, the way things are happening now is the way they've always been happening. Long, slow, gradual processes. Hmm. The Bible says the scoffers are willingly ignorant. Willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. Mm -hmm. They're willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens and the earth, and they're ignorant of the flood. The world was overflowed with water and perished. We cover more on that on videotape number two of our series. But one of the scoffers in the last days was a guy named James Hutton. Now, James Hutton lived in the late 1700s. James wrote a book and said the earth is millions of years old. Now, you need to understand, in the late 1700s, most people believed the Bible, or at least they were strongly influenced by Christianity, and everybody thought the earth was about 6,000 years old. That was the common teaching of the day. 
Okay? They taught the kids in the public school, you know, God created the world in six days, like we saw earlier. But this was also a time of many revolutions. We had the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Polish, the Spanish, the German. Every country is just about revolting against the idea of a king and establishing a democracy. So they threw off monarchy, and this is known as, as the age of anti-monarchy. So the Bible says to honor the king, and some people thought the Bible was an obstacle to their political objectives. And they wanted to discredit the Bible. Keep in mind, this all happened in the early, early 1800s and late 1700s. So back when everybody thought the earth was a few thousand years old, James Hutton came along and said, oh no, it's lots older than that. And he got here by uniformitarianism. Ooh, kids, big word, bold print. That'll be on the test. They always are, okay? Uniformitarianism means the present is the key to the past. No, James, I think the Bible's the only perfect key to the past. But there, during this time frame, the Christians, instead of fighting against this new teaching of millions of years, they swallowed it. The Christians accepted the idea of a gap theory or day-age theory or progressive creation. They just accepted millions of years right into the Bible when it's obvious to anybody with half a brain and one eye reading the Bible that it does not teach the earth is millions of years old. That's not what it says. So the Christians did not put up an effective defense, an effective uh, resistance to this teaching. And they allowed the church to believe all this. And then when evolution came out, 1859 became popular with Darwin's book, well, the Christians just accepted that too. Boy, what a tragedy. That book covers the great turning point in history, if you've got like the history of stuff. Well, James Hutton's book that he wrote had a real strong influence on a young lawyer from Scotland named Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell, the lawyer, hated the Bible. Somebody calculated one time that if all the lawyers in the world were laid end to end around the equator, we would all be better off. <laughs> Charles Lyell, in 1830, wrote this book right here, Principles of Geology. I've got it here on the table. You can come take a look at it. It's all marked up. In this book, you can see his hatred for the Bible kind of ooze off every page. He kept calling it ancient doctrines. He said, oh, you have a scriptural authority. He was mocking them, okay? He called it a religious prejudice. He said, men of superior talent, oh, he's talking about himself, <laughs> who thought for themselves and were not blinded by authority, he used every opportunity he could find to mock the scriptures. And kids, you won't have to go to college very far before you're going to run into a professor that has this mocking attitude toward God's word. How many of you had one when you went through school? Seems like their whole goal in life is to destroy your faith. I had a bunch of them when I went to school. <laughs> they just wanted to destroy your confidence. Well, Charles said his goal was to free the science from Moses. What do you suppose he meant by that? Well, before Charles Lyell wrote his book, everybody looked at the geology, looked at Grand Canyon, and said, wow, look at the flood did. He didn't like people interpreting Earth's history in light of the Bible. He wanted them to interpret Earth's history in terms of millions of years. Lyell is the primary guy responsible for inventing what today is known as the geologic column. How many have ever heard of the geologic column before? They divided the Earth up into layers and gave them names, you know. Uh, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, all that kind of stuff. Maybe you saw the movie Jurassic Park, named after the Jurassic layer, okay? Each layer of rock was given a name and an age and an index fossil. Now keep in mind, all this was done in 1830 before there ever was a carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating, lead 208, lead 206, uranium 235, uranium 238. None of those had even been thought of. So they didn't determine these great ages by any radiometric metric decay method. They just picked the numbers out of the clear blue sky. It's a fact the Earth has many layers of sedimentary rock. That is just a fact. You can see them all over Tennessee here. How'd they get there? Well, there are two interpretations. One group says the layers form slowly over millions of years. The other group says, no, these layers are all from the flood in the days of Noah. And again, they're always trying to erase that line between the two and make their interpretation become part of the fact. And it's just not, okay? It's just their interpretation, that's all. The geologic column is actually the Bible for the evolutionist. The only place you'll ever find it is in the textbooks. It doesn't exist. This guy admits it. He said, if there were a column of sediments, uh, unfortunately, no such column exists. Did you know there is no geologic column? If there was, it'd be 100 miles thick. It doesn't exist. It's one of the lies in the textbooks. And actually, all of evolution is based on this lie right here. This is one of the most serious ones, in my opinion. It's true the Earth has layers. That's not the question. Okay? 
How did they get there, though? I mean, if that layer sat there for 10 million years waiting for the next one, don't you think it's going to rain once in a while in 10 million years? Why are there no erosion marks between the layers? Why are they stacked on top of each other just like a stack of pancakes? Hmm? And by the way, why are there no soil layers between the rock layers? I mean, soil builds up on top of rock. Don't you think there'd be some soil built up once in a while? Hmm? Look, if you get a jar of dirt and rocks and gravel and sand and mud and shake it up and set it down, it settles into layers for you in a few minutes. It doesn't take long. How many have seen those things you buy at the mall with two pieces of glass and different colored sand in between? You know, you flip it over and it makes all kinds of layers just in a few seconds. It doesn't take long. I was preaching years ago in Union Center, South Dakota. Now, Union Center is right there. It's not even on the map. And South Dakota puts everything they can find on the map just to kind of fill in the white places, you know. Well, there were 40 people in the whole town. 38 of them came to church. The other two must have been pulling a calf, I reckon. I don't know. But boy, we had a great meeting, and the preacher said, Hey, Hovind, let's go down to Rapid City. They've got a bunch of dinosaurs in the museum there. I said, All right, I like dinosaurs. Let's go. So we all drove down to Rapid City. We came to this museum, and a guide met us at the door. He said, Hey, folks, would you like me to give you a tour? We said, That would be great, sir. Well, the first place we stopped on the tour was the geologic time chart. They have it lit up, and it's behind glass, and it's holy and sacred. Don't dare touch that thing, you know. So we're standing over there, and the guide said, Now, folks, this layer of rock right here is about 70 million years old. And it's so cool, because they always get that sanctimonious tone in their voice, you know. 70 million years old. Oh. Well, my daughter was 12 years old at the time. She raised her hand. She said, Mr., how do you know that layer is 70 million years old? He said, honey, that's a good question. We tell the age of the layers by what types of fossils we find in them. They're called index fossils. And by the way, that's correct. That's what the textbook says. Scientists use index fossils to determine the age of rock layers. She said, thank you, sir. We walked around the other side. We're standing over here, and the guide said, now, folks, these bones are about 100 million years old. My daughter raised her hand again. She said, sir, how do you know those bones are 100 million years old? He said, well, honey, we tell the age of the bones by which layer they came from. She said, uh, sir, when we were standing over there, you told me you knew the age of the layers by the bones, and now you're telling me you know the age of the bones by the layers. She said, isn't that circular reasoning? I thought, wow, a chip off the old block. <laughs> that guy had the strangest look on his face. It was almost as if he were thinking. <laughs> he looked at my daughter. He looked at me. I wasn't about to help him. I thought, wow, this is going to be good. I have got to hear this. He looked back at my daughter. He said, wow, you're right. That is circular reasoning. He said, I never thought of that before. That fellow drove 50 miles one way that night to, hear me come, to come hear me speak in Union Center, South Dakota. The crowd swelled to 39. <laughs> we set up a chair in the aisle. Afterwards, he talked to me for an hour. He said, Hovind, is everything I believe about geology wrong? I teach this stuff at the college. I said, oh, no, no, no. I like geology. I've got a huge fossil collection, rock collection, mineral collection. I teach earth science. I love studying geology. I said, but as far as the layers being different ages, I said, yes, sir, I'm sorry. That is all baloney. It's based on circular reasoning. I'll show you. Here's a textbook that tells the kids to date the rocks by the fossils. And on the very next page, it says date the fossils by the rocks on the next page, and they don't catch it. It's a lie. It's circular reasoning. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply, feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as the work brings results. Hmm. It cannot be denied from a strictly philosophical standpoint. Geologists are arguing in a circle. The relative ages of rocks are determined by the organisms they contain. They, they date the rocks by the fossils and the fossils by the rocks. Ever since the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. They don't date fossils by potassium argon dating or carbon dating. That's not how they do it. Radiometric dating would not even be possible if the geologic column had not been erected first. There's no way to simply to look at a fossil and say how old it is unless you know the age of the rocks it comes from. 
This is Niles Eldridge, one of the most famous evolutionists alive today. He said, and this poses something of a problem. Yeah, something poses a big problem, Niles. If we date the rocks by the fossils, how can we then turn around and talk about patterns of evolutionary change through time in the fossil record? Circular reasoning. This guy said the rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. <laughs> I think the cheese done fell out of his sandwich. That's what I think. Okay, he's, he's a few fries short of a Happy Meal. Mm -hmm. It's based on circular reasoning. Okay? This guy said the charge of circular reasoning can be handled several ways. It can be ignored is not the proper concern of the public. It can be denied by calling down the law of evolution. It can be admitted as a common practice or avoided by pragmatic reasoning. But it is all based on circular reasoning. Actually, at the Scopes Monkey Trial, 1925, over here in Dayton, Tennessee. How far is Dayton from here, Steve? About 100 miles. 100 miles, OK. This is what they were going to use as evidence for evolution. The lowest layers are obviously the oldest. Page 275 of the court transcript. No, the oldest layers are not obviously the oldest. Did you know in still water, sediment layers settle out the bottom one first, and then the second one, and then the third one? That's correct. But in moving water, you can get five or six or ten layers to form simultaneously. They form from one end and travel across. So it's possible to have a fossil on the bottom that is younger than a fossil on top if it's moving water. There's a great video tape called Experiments in Stratification. It covers all that if you want more on that or get our video number six. We'll get more of that later. I like to ask evolutionists. I say, guys, your geologic column contains limestone uh, quite a few places. If I handed you a piece of limestone, how would you know if it's 100 million year old Jurassic limestone or 600 million year old Cambrian limestone? I mean, exactly what's the difference? They'd say, well, the only way to tell the difference is by the index fossils. Uh, that's precisely my point. They date the layers by the fossils. This textbook shows the kids a trilobite. And it says, boys and girls, trilobites make good index fossils. If a trilobite is found in a rock layer, the rock layer probably formed 500 to 600 million years ago. I don't think so. Somebody found a human shoe print where the guy with a shoe on had stepped on and smashed a trilobite. They asked evolutionists all over, how on earth could a human step on a trilobite? If trilobites lived 500 million years ago and man didn't get here till, you know, three million years ago, and they didn't start, didn't start wearing shoes till 10,000 years ago. How could a human step on a trilobite? One atheist said, well, it's obviously. The uh, only un answer would be that uh, aliens visited the planet 500 million years ago. <laughs> oh, them aliens will do it every time. <laughs> Another guy said, well, maybe there was a large trilobite shaped like a shoe that fell on a small one. Now, there are some big trilobites, okay, but I don't think they're shaped like a shoe. Actually, the trilobite has the most complicated eyeball ever. Trilobite eyes are unbelievable. And this is one of the first creatures to evolve, and it already has the most complex eye, which it, just the eye is one of the most complex features you could have. Now, trilobites are not index fossils for anything, okay? There are all kinds of different types of trilobites, and there probably are some still alive today. Certainly, the Baltic isopod is still alive. A guy sent me a couple weeks ago, about a couple months ago, I guess, a whole jar full of trilobites from the Prudhoe Bay uh, treatment, water treatment plant up there for the oil uh, um, factory they've got, oil refining uh, rig. When they arrived in Pensacola, Florida, they were still alive in the jar. But I don't know how to keep a trilobite alive. I mean, you know, you give it mouth to what, you know, some resuscitation, but they all died, but we got them in our museum there. Somebody just sent me a large one that they got down in the Caribbean, about this big. It's in our museum, and it's, it was frozen. They said, yeah, I pulled it off the rock myself down in the Caribbean. Still alive. They call it some kind of roach. Roach? It looks like a big trilobite. This textbook shows the kids a graptolite. It says, boys and girls, this is 410 million years old. I don't think so. Graptolites were found still alive in the South Pacific 10 years ago. So if you find graptolite, you can't use that as an index fossil for any age rock, okay? They tell the kids in school the lobe-finned fish is the index fossil for Devonian, 325 million years old. See that short leg, boys and girls? He's got a little bitty leg and then the fin. Ah, see, that proves he's evolving from a leg to a fin. No, that's a lie. The lobe-finned fish are still alive today. They're swimming around the Indian Ocean. And when they caught the first one in 1938, the scientists looked at it and said, wow, would you look at that? They survived for 325 million years. <laughs> it never dawned on them once.
to question the geologic column. That thought never crossed their brain. You don't question the geologic column. It is holy and sacred. You just have to say it survived for 325 million years. It's in the textbooks today. And they still say it's the index fossil for 325 million year old rock, even though they know they're swimming around the ocean. How can they be that dumb? This lady wrote a book about it, A Fish Caught in Time. She says, boys and girls, this is our own great uncle, 40 million times removed. She does look a little fishy, you know, kind of around the gills there. Okay. You're going to be told that dinosaurs are index fossils for the Jurassic period, 70 million, or Cretaceous, 70 million years ago. That's baloney. Dinosaur bones were found here recently that had blood cells still in them. How long are the blood cells going to last? Here's soft tissue found with dinosaur bones, still flexible, soft tissue in March of 2005. Here's fossilized human hands found in the same rock strata as dinosaur bones. Now, they tell you the layers are different ages. That's simply baloney, okay? Now, Charlie Darwin didn't like round numbers, so he said the Weldon deposits are 306,662,400 years old. <laughs> oh, how could he possibly know such a thing, okay? All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting these different rock layers. Petrified trees standing up. Now, how long does a dead tree stand up around here before it falls down? Hmm, five years, maybe ten years? Five million? Oh, no, not five million, that's for sure, right? But yet petrified trees in the vertical position are found all over the planet. I'll just flash through some pictures real quick here. There are all kinds of petrified trees found standing up. And they're running through multiple layers, and the kids are being taught the layers are different ages, and yet here's one tree connecting them all. I'm having a hard time believing these layers are different ages. That's what I'm having. Central Alabama's got a large coal mine with a whole bunch of petrified trees standing up running through two seams of coal, the Blue Creek and the Mary Lee. Now, they're going to tell you in school, for coal to form, a forest has to grow, and then it all falls over and turns into a swamp, and then it gets buried, and then new mud washes in on top, and the coal slowly, or coal slowly forms from the forest that was buried. And then thousands of years later, another forest grows on top, and a whole new layer of coal form. So if you find two layers of coal, oh, that took thousands of years. That's what they'll tell you in school. That's simply baloney. We'll cover more on coal formation on video six, but if you look at the samples of trees found in this coal mine, you look at sample A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I mean, any freshman law student could tell you, hey, folks, I think I can prove these two coal formations formed at the same time, very quickly, within a few weeks or months of each other, that's for sure, probably during the flood in the days of Noah. We'll cover more on that on video six. In Cookville, Tennessee, how far is Cookville from here? 100 miles? What's that? 150 miles. In Cookville, Tennessee, there's a coal mine with petrified trees standing, running. Here's coal at the bottom. The tree is coalified at the bottom, petrified in the middle, and coalified on top, where it went through a second coal seam. Same tree. By the way, why are coal seams generally found on top of layers of rock or clay? Wouldn't uh, be a pretty poor place to grow a forest? Ought to be on top of soil, don't you think? Yeah. Polystrate fossils are found all over the world. In uh, no Joggins, Nova Scotia, there are dozens of petrified trees standing up, connecting different rock layers. People, scientists go up there and look at them and just say, wow, that's, that's curious. <laughs> no, it's more than curious. It's devastating to your teaching that the layers are different ages. There's a brochure you can get from our uh, bookstore. It's $2. It's got 30-some pictures of color pictures of petrified trees in the vertical position. Occasionally, the petrified trees are found upside down running through many rock layers. Now we really got a problem. I've thought about this till my brain hurts. The evolutionists have two ways to solve this. They can say, well, Hoven, you know, the trees stood upright for millions of years while the layers formed around them. Or the trees grew through hundreds of feet of solid rock looking for sunlight. Uh, there's a third way to look at it. You know, maybe they were all buried in a big flood. Mm -hmm. How fast was that calf going? Keep that thought in mind, okay? Mount St. Helens blew thousands of trees into Spirit Lake. Lots of those trees are stuck in the mud at the bottom of Spirit Lake. They're going to petrify in the standing position. More on video six about that. It doesn't take long for things to petrify. Here's petrified firewood. The guy chopped on it before it turned to stone. Here's mummified dog stuck in a tree. Turned to stone. Chased a coon up the tree, apparently, and got stuck. They named it Stucky. What would you call it, okay? There's petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's legs still in it. 
The boot was made in 1950, and the leg is turned to stone. There's petrified fish giving birth. It does not take millions of years to give birth. Praise God, okay? There's a petrified hat. Petrified pickle found in a jar. The guy sent me the jar and pickle. He said, Brother Hovind, I found this in Montana in an old home. The house was you know, junk. The roof was gone. The house was falling apart. But he said, you want a petrified pickle for your museum? I said, of course. Who in their right mind would not want a petrified pickle, you know? <laughs> Come on down to Pensacola and Dinosaur Adventure Land and see the petrified pickle. Here's petrified sacks of flour found in a uh, flour mill that flooded in 1910 in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Here's petrified toadstool. There's an amazing gem and mineral museum just south of Bloomington, Illinois, in the little bitty tiny town called Shirley, Illinois. You've got to be trying to find it to get there, but it's worth going to see the Funk Gem and uh, Mineral Museum. Okay? Here's petrified acorns. This kid sent them to me. He said, Brother Hovind, I was, I was seven years old at the time. He said, I stuck these acorns in a bucket of water, and I thought they might you know, sprout and make some trees, and I forgot about them. Next spring, my mama found the bucket on the back porch, and the acorns had turned to stone. He said, would you like them for your museum? I said, of course. Come on down and see the petrified acorns. More on petrification on video number uh, six. So kids, when they tell you the layers are different ages, you tell them Kent Hovind said they're confused or they're lying. It is not correct. Those layers all form, nearly all of them, at the time of Noah's flood. 80 to 85 percent of Earth's surface does not even have three geologic periods appearing in correct consecutive order. Even though this geologic column does not exist, except in the textbooks, that teaching is what changed people in the 1830s away from believing the Bible to believing in uniformitarianism. This teaching especially affected a young preacher. He just got out of Bible college, studied to be a pastor of a church. His name was Charles Darwin. Anybody ever heard of Charles Darwin? Charles Darwin graduated from Bible college to be a preacher. And he's going to sail around the world for five years first and collect some bugs for some, you know, bugologist back there in England. Charlie brought some books with him. He brought his Bible, of course. He just got out of Bible college. And he brought this brand new book, Principles of Geology. Charlie said that book changed his life forever. He later wrote to a friend and said, Disbelief crept over me slowly. I felt no distress. He slowly lost his faith in the Bible. As Darwin sailed around the world, he stopped off at the Galapagos Islands. Here on those islands, he noticed there were 14 different varieties of finches. Little tiny bird with a little tiny beak. But the beak shapes were different. Now the Grants went there and studied them and said, wow, during dry years, the beak is a tenth of a millimeter thicker, and during wet years, it's a tenth of a millimeter thinner. But it always averages back out. A tenth of a millimeter, do you know how much that is? Not much. Darwin looked at the birds and said, you know what? I think all these birds had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. <laughs> and then Charlie said, well, maybe this proves that birds and bananas are related. You say, oh, he never said that. Uh, he sure did. I knew you wouldn't believe me, so I brought his book. It's right here. Principles, I'm sorry, uh, The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. On page 170, Darwin said, it's a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Isn't he saying the birds and bananas are related? He sure is. This is a lie. What Charlie observed is what is sometimes called microevolution. Microevolution tells us dogs produce a variety of dogs. That's a fact. It happens, okay? And roses produce a variety of roses. Nobody argues about that. The question is, does it go any farther than that? You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you get a dog every time. And probably the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. We did the test this morning. Had a five-year-old girl. Said, okay, here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? She got it. The banana. We got college professors can't figure that out. Here's National Pornographic. A Geographic says, uh, the evolution of dogs from wolves. Well, duh, nobody's arguing about that. Yeah, dogs came from wolves, okay? The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. Ten times it says that in the first chapter. See, this word evolution has six meanings. We've been through this before, so I'm going to go through it kind of quickly. There's, first of all, cosmic evolution, Big Bang. Secondly, chemical evolution, where all the chemicals come from hydrogen. That's baloney. Thirdly, stellar evolution, where all the stars form from dust. You cannot get dust to condense into a solid star. Can't happen. 
There's Boyle's gas laws that drive it away, okay? Then there's enough stars out there, though we can all have 11 trillion to ourselves. Then you have organic evolution, where life gets started from non-living material. And then macroevolution, where an animal changes to a different kind of animal. None of those have ever been observed. Number six, variations within the kinds, sometimes called microevolution. That one happens. The first five are religious. So whenever you discuss evolution, you have to define what you're talking about. If you're talking about number six, I'm with you. I agree that happens. If you're talking about the first five, that doesn't happen. That's something you believe happens, okay? Watch how they change the definition for the kids. They say, okay, boys and girls, evolution is change over time. Uh, is that really what they mean? Watch this carefully now. In other words, living things have changed over time. Wait, wait, wait. Are you going to skip over the first four? They just want to bypass the first four stages like it's not part of the theory? Well, then you don't have a coherent theory. Then they say, evolution is defined as a change in species over time. Now they're down to what I believe in. I think species can change. I think you can get some really weird varieties of animals, but they're still the same kind, okay? This is a lie, kids. That's not really what they mean by evolution. They want to give you examples of number six and make you believe that the whole theory has been proven. Don't get brainwashed. Most evolutionists will say, well, macroevolution is just micro with longer periods of time. No, it's not. They had a big conference on this very question in Chicago. They said the central question of the Chicago conference was whether the mechanisms underlying microevolution can be extrapolated to explain the phenomena of macroevolution. The answer can be given as a clear no. It doesn't work. Variations happen, sure, but they have limits. Did you know farmers have been trying to get bigger pigs for a long time? You think they'll ever get a pig as big as Texas? Nah, I bet there's a limit in there, okay? Roaches become resistant to pesticides. Do you think they'll ever become resistant to a sledgehammer? <laughs> Probably not. See? There's a tiger had three kittens, all different colors, same litter. That's variations, but it's still a tiger. That's not evolution. They always end up producing the same kind of offspring, just like the Bible says. The information for the new variety had to be in the in gene code already, or it couldn't produce it. No new information is ever added. The gene pool of the new variety is always more limited. Somebody spent years crossbreeding dogs to develop the Chihuahua. All that money to make a dog that's 100% useless. <laughs> I mean, think about it. How long would the Chihuahuas last in the real world? Turn them all loose into the woods. Watch what happens. They'd run up to the wolf. Yep, 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 yep. Crunch. <laughs> End of gene code, right? <laughs> Genetic information is lost, not added, when you get a strange variety. Real evolution would need an increase in genetic complexity. We don't ever observe that. Now, I grew up in Illinois, corn country. Did you know there are so many kinds of corn up there, they have to number them? You'll be driving down the highway, and there's a sign that says BX65. Don't mix it with XL29. Something will explode. <laughs> but folks, you can crossbreed corn from now till the cows come home, and you are always going to get corn. You're never going to get a hamster or a tomato or a whale to grow on your corn stalk. It just ain't going to happen, okay? There's a whole variety of dogs in the world, and they might have had a common ancestor, a dog. There's BBC News. It looks like 95% of current dogs came from just three original founding females. Hey, they're getting closer. Right here it says, Today's dogs come in all shapes and sizes, but scientists believe they evolved from just a handful of wolves tamed by humans living in or near China less than 15,000 years ago. <laughs> they're getting closer. Man, if they keep studying their Bible, keep studying the science, they're going to be an independent Baptist when they're done. <laughs> you get done climbing the mountain of truth, that's where you end up, you know. Okay. This Irish textbook calls them divergent evolution. Oh, come on. They show five dogs around a wolf. and That's not divergent evolution. Don't give it a fancy name. It's still a dog. <laughs> it's just a variety of dog. This Mexican textbook says, the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor. I agree. It looked like a horse. You know, four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery, all the standard horse equipment, okay? They got little tiny horses today. We had the world's smallest horse come visit our dinosaur adventure land. Talk about useless. I mean, you, know, you can't ride it. Well, my granddaughter could, but uh, it won't bark. You know, what do you do with a horse like that? Uh, you know, horses, zebras, and asses can all be crossbred. 
They have competition in California. Who can get the weirdest animal? They get zorses, zonkeys, zeonies, zedonks, zebras, and shebras. Here's a zebra who forgot to put his PJs on. <laughs> Here's a herd of zebroids running around. You know, in the last hundred years, the Kentucky Derby has gone from an average winning speed of 127 seconds down to 123 seconds. Now, even in the old days, they had some pretty low times turned in, okay? Question, how much money would you guess has been spent on selective breeding trying to get the fastest horse for the Kentucky Derby? Millions and millions of dollars. They do the same thing right around here, don't they? Spend lots of money for a Tennessee walker. What's the most expensive Tennessee walking horse that you've ever heard of? A million dollars for one horse? Three million for one horse. That's how much per pound? <laughs> Man, I was in Italy. We ate horse over there. It was good, too. It tastes like chicken, you know? Uh. Now, I don't know if they've got to the absolute limit of horse speed or not. I don't know. But I suspect they're getting kind of close, okay? If you really want to win the Kentucky Derby, why don't you breed wings on your horse and fly around the track in 12 seconds? <laughs> the whole point is, sure, you get varieties, but they're limited. There's a bunch of different kinds of cows in the world, and they might have had a common ancestor. A cow. This magazine's where you order chickens. All right, boys and girls, should we order... You know, cinnamon queens, red rocks, white rocks, cherry eggers, or brown leghorns. But look what the magazine says. Jungle fowl are the original bird from which all varieties and strains of domesticated chickens are derived. Did you know all the chickens had a common ancestor? Anybody want to guess what it was? Chicken. You got it. There are eight kinds of bears in the world, and they might have had a common ancestor. A bear. Mm -hmm. You know, broccoli... Ca cabbage, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts all have a common ancestor called a plant. Mm -hmm. In California, they've got huge fields where they graft English walnut trees onto black walnut stumps. They do it because the black walnut stump, the root system is tough and can handle the weather over there, but the black walnut doesn't taste as good, it doesn't sell for as much money, and it's tougher to crack. English walnuts taste better, e they sell for more money, and they're easier to crack, but the root system rots. So they cut them off and stick them together. They do it all over there. Well, they can do it because they're both a walnut. See, you could never graft an English walnut tree onto the back of a turtle. That won't work, see? The sugar beets were used for years. When sugar got expensive, they wanted to get sugar out of beets. So they tried to do selective breeding to increase the sugar content in sugar beets. They raised it from 6% to 17% but could not, they, they ran into a brick wall. Hey, can't go past 17. And the further they got away from the normal wild sugar beet, the more problems they started having. Now you've got to babysit the field and spray pesticides and bugicides and everything else on it, okay? Because it's disease resistance goes down. People say, don't bacteria become resistant to drugs? Well, that's because they lose information, not gain it. I'll show you. Dr. Spetner points out, this is based on a misunderstanding for the mutations that cause antibiotic resistance still involve information loss. For example, to destroy a bacterium, the antibiotic streptomycin attaches to part of a bacterial cell called ribosomes. Mutations sometimes cause a structural deformity in ribosomes. Since the antibiotic cannot connect with the misshapen ribosome, the bacterium is resistant. Even though this turns out, mutation turns out to be beneficial for the moment, it still constitutes a loss of information, not a gain. No evolution has taken place. The bacteria are not stronger. In fact, under normal conditions with no antibiotic present, they are weaker than their non-mutated cousins. I'll give you an example. Suppose somebody's coming through town and they're handcuffing everybody, taking them off to jail, and then they're going to kill them. But you don't have any arms, so they can't handcuff you. Aha! Uh -huh. Is that a beneficial mutation to not have arms? Well, yeah, for a moment, for the moment, okay, <laughs> but. In, in long term, it's not beneficial, okay? And so the, all the examples they ever point to are bacteria becoming resistant to drugs. That's a loss of information, not a gain. The Bible is correct. They bring forth after their kind. James Hutton wrote a book in 1795, and people began to doubt the earth was 6,000 years old. Charlie, Darwin, or Charlie Lyle wrote a book in 1830, and people began to doubt the flood, and Charlie Darwin's book made people doubt the Creator. And by the mid-1800s, People were wondering, wow, if God didn't do it, how did we get here? 
Who's in charge of the world? That led directly to the rise of communism, Marxism, socialism, Nazism. We'll cover that on seminar part five. Politically incorrect, the dangers of this evolution theory. Now, Darwin didn't originate the evolution theory. It was around before him. He just simply made it popular, okay? But Timothy was warned by Paul here in 1 Timothy 6, you be careful about avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Evolution is not science. Evolution's a religion in every sense of the word. Hitler said, let me control the textbooks, I'll control the state. Professor Wilson at Harvard University said, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. When I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolution theory. He lost his faith, first year of college. That's what happened to Philip Wentworth. Studied for the ministry at Harvard, lost his faith, gave up on the ministry. That's what happened to Scott. He almost lost his faith, so somebody showed him one of my videotapes, and he said, oh, man, you, you saved my faith, Brother Hoven. This, uh, Mary wrote me, or Marty wrote me and said, I want to let you know your ministry has been a blessing to me. I'm one of the high school students in the anthropology class that is a victim of the dangers of evolution teaching. I was very discouraged and questioned the existence of God. I listened to your seminars, and that completely encouraged me, and it was a blessing to me. Yay, rescued one. It's amazing how many thousands of people down through history have lost their faith because of this evolution teaching. Karl Marx studied, uh, said he wanted to serve God with his life, went off to college, became an evolutionist. Comrade Stalin, it was a special this afternoon on TV, how many saw that about Comrade Stalin on the History Channel? He went to a Christian school, read Darwin's book, became an atheist, killed between 60 and 100 million of his own people. Andrew Carnegie became an evolutionist reading Darwin's book. He said it freed him from the shackles of religion. Light came in as a flood and all was clear. Not only had it got rid of theology and the supernatural, but I found the truth of evolution. Carnegie left behind millions of dollars to make sure evolution is taught in our schools instead of creation. He funded the National Center for Science Education. The list is really long. We'll have to quit now. But 75% of kids from Christian homes that go to public schools lose their faith after one year of college. What's in these textbooks anyway? What are they teaching our kids that's making them lose their faith? Well, we're going to cover some of the lies in the textbooks, some more lies in the textbooks in the next session. There is no known evidence to support the evolution theory except things that have been proven wrong a long time ago. If real evidence exists for this evolution theory, I would like to see it. We've been offering a quarter of a million dollars for real scientific evidence for evolution. We've had that offer for over 10 years. There isn't any, okay? I'll give an example. Suppose I had a theory that the moon is made of green cheese. Now, that's a dumb theory, I know. But hey, it's okay to have a dumb theory. There are no laws against dumb theories. But then, suppose I started teaching my students, hey, kids, did you know NASA proved my theory in 1973 when they went there on a secret mission and drilled a hole and found the moon is made of green cheese? Oh, no, hold on a minute. It's okay to have a dumb theory. It's not okay to lie about my evidence for my theory, okay? It is worse for me to get paid by tax dollars while I lie about my theory. So I don't mind if they want to have a theory that we came from a rock. That doesn't bother me. It does bother me that they want to lie to the students about their evidence, and it really bothers me that I have to pay their salary while they lie to support, spread their theory. So here's some of the evidence they use for evolution theory. They say, we have evidence from fossils. I say, guys, you've got to be kidding. No fossil counts as evidence for evolution. None. If you find bones in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't know it had any kids. No fossil could count as evidence for evolution. None. They say, we have evidence from structure, from molecular biology, from development. Well, let's talk about a few of these. Evolution is dead. The theory is defunct. There is no evidence to support it. But some of the followers are pretty dedicated, and they're having a hard time letting it go. They'll even lie to you to make you ever think everything's fine. They say, wow, look at that evolution theory. It's perfectly fine. There's no challenge to evolution. Look, he never looked better. Pulse and heart rate look good. No, I'm sorry. He's a goner, okay? <laughs> Don't be the last one off the boat. It is sinking. Evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. Number one, they say mutations make something new. That's never been observed. Number two, natural selection makes it survive and take over the population. Evolution is actually a religion of death. In order for evolution to work, one animal evolves a little better than the rest. What must happen to the rest of them to make this thing work? They got to die. Or else the new improved gene is swamped back into the gene code. 
The question is so simple and profound. Did man bring death into the world like the Bible says? Or did death bring man into the world like evolution says? Somebody is wrong. Textbook says there are mutations, and they are the original source of variation in populations. I agree, mutations happen. No question. But mutations do not produce any evolution. Mutations scrambling up are scrambling up existing genetic code. They're not making anything new. Here's a five-legged bull. That's a mutant. There's no new information added. He already had the information on how to make a leg. It just made one in the wrong place, that's all. It's not new information. It is scrambled information. Here's a short-legged sheep. Again, no new information. And by the way, that's not beneficial. He's the first one the wolf is going to catch. Right? Oh, boys, go. Here comes the wolf. Brrr. Oh, Herman didn't make it. There's a two-headed lamb. That's a mutant. It's not beneficial. Two-headed turtle. That's a mutant. Not ninja, but it's mutant. Okay. Now, he's going to freeze first winter because nobody makes a double-neck turtleneck sweater. He's just not going to make it. Now, scrambling up the letters of the word Christmas will get you all sorts of different words. But it will never get you Xerox, Zebra, or Queen. The letters aren't available. This textbook shows the kids a four-wing fly, which, by the way, cannot fly. And it says, boys and girls, normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Then it says, beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. <laughs> no, hold on a minute. Why don't they show us an example of a beneficial mutation? Why did they tell us about the good ones and not show us a picture of a good one? You know why they didn't show a picture of a good mutation? Because nobody's ever seen one. There's never been one beneficial mutation. I, was, I said that in a debate one time, and this atheist said, Hovind, you're lying. He said, I can name a beneficial mutation right now. He said, people in Africa <clears throat> that get sickle cell anemia are less likely to get malaria. I said, that's brilliant, sir. That's like saying if you cut off your legs, you can't get athlete's foot. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they're both negative, okay? Then they say evolution and natural selection go together. This one says natural selection causes evolution. That's a lie. Natural selection selects. It doesn't create anything. Natural selection is not a creative force, okay? Natural selection may be a stabilizing force, but it is not a creative force. Anybody with half a brain can figure that out. Natural selection cannot create any properties. It can only select. This textbook says, evolution by natural selection had occurred in just one year. Oh, they're lying. It says natural selection can lead to evolution. That's a lie. Natural selection selects. It doesn't create a thing. If you worked in a factory that made cars, how far is the Saturn plant from here? Pretty close, isn't it? How many of you work? Anybody here work in the Saturn plant? Okay. Suppose you worked in quality control. Your job was to check the car when they got done building it, you know, kick the tires, slam the doors, and drive it around, see if it runs. If you caught every single mistake, they don't, by the way, <clears throat> but if you did, okay, how long would it take that quality control process to change the car to an airplane? You say, Hovind, quality control can't change it to something else. Oh, I know. Only design engineers can change it. And God's natural selection is a quality control that will never change it to a different animal. It'll just make sure you get a good animal, that's all. They keep talking about survival of the fittest. Well, I agree, but that doesn't explain arrival of the fittest. And even survival of the fittest is pretty shaky. It's what's called a tautology, a sentence that means nothing. I'll show you. If you say, Professor, <clears throat> why did it survive? It's all oh, because it's the fittest, you know, survival of the fittest. How do you know it's the fittest? Uh, because it survived. How else can you tell? Oh, I see. Look, if a whale goes through a school of fish and eats 80% of them, it's not survival of the fittest. It's actually survival of the luckiest. That's what's really going on out there. But some of these scientists have the ability to make amazing observations and still come to the wrong conclusion. One day, a bunch of scientists were going to see how far a frog could jump. They put the big old frog down there and said, jump, frog, jump. That frog jumped 80 inches. They brought the frog back, cut off one leg. Said, jump, frog, jump. He only jumped 70. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump, frog, jump. He went 60. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump, frog, jump. He jumped 50 inches. 
They brought the frog back, cut off his last leg, and said, jump, frog, jump. You know, they expected he might go maybe, you know, 40, based on the data. Actual jump was zero. The frog didn't move. They yelled louder, jump, frog. The frog never moved. The scientists were baffled. They tried the experiment again. Uh, new frog. Got the same results every time. So the brilliant scientists put their data together and said, you know what, folks, the frog jumped less as the legs were removed. Hey, that's a good observation. They got it right on the head. And they said, so we must conclude that a frog with no legs goes deaf. <laughs> Bad conclusion. It's possible to have a good observation and still come to the wrong conclusion, you know. That's what they did with the fruit flies. They put them flies in the laboratory. They nuked them, microwaved them, x-rayed them. They did all kinds of mean things to those flies. And they got some weird-looking baby flies. They got flies with curled wings. They fly around, bzzz, 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 couldn't go anywhere. They got flies with no wings at all. Hmm? What do you call that? A crawl or a walk? Can't fly. They raised all these mutated flies in the laboratory and said, you know what, folks? Fruit flies refuse to become anything but fruit flies. Well, duh. So they said, all mutations produce flies that were inferior to the original fly. Good observation. They said, so we must conclude that flies have evolved as far as they can go. Oh, bad conclusion. You know, maybe you could conclude that God made them right to begin with, and all you're doing is messing them up in your laboratory. Mm -hmm. They were doing fine until you guys got a hold of them. Yeah. And they say, evolution's as fit as ever. Yep, fruit flies in the north have wings 4% larger than flies in the south. Well, that proves something to somebody somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> but it's still a fly, okay? Then they tell the kids, the peppered moth is proof for evolution. They counted the moths on the trees and found it was 95% light-colored and 5% black. Then they burned coal in the factories and the trees turned black. And they counted the moths again. It was only 5% light and 95% black. The problem is the entire story is a lie. They glued dead moths to the tree to take that picture for your kid's textbook. It's right here. Where's this book used at, brother? It's not used anymore. Peppered moth. It's still in the new books, though. Evidence for evolution. Those are dead moths glued on a tree, because after 40 years of watching, they found a grand total of two moths on the trees. Two out of, let's see, what's 95% of two? Wow. I have to do some figuring on that one. Uh, <clears throat> they still keep it in the textbooks, though, as evidence for evolution. What's the Tulsa Zoo doing having a peppered moth display? I mean, this is a zoo, for heaven's sake. Why do they push evolution in a zoo? Get the book Icons of Evolution if you want a whole lot more on the history of this peppered moth idea. But <clears throat> they tell the kids, we're going to learn to think critically. Boys and girls, do you think humans are still evolving? What kind of question is that? That's one of those questions like, uh, have you stopped beating your wife yet? Wow, let me think. If I say yes, I'm admitting I did. If I say no, I'm still doing it. Did you know it's possible for the question to already have a built-in assumption? Look at that question. Do you think humans are still evolving? What's the built-in assumption? That humans evolved. Now, how's a Christian kid supposed to answer that for homework for Monday? Hmm? I would say, teacher, this question is poorly written. It assumes evolution has happened when it has not. It's like asking the question, you know, why are elephants orange? Boy, no, there's a tough one. Why are they orange anyway? Uh, they're not orange? Mm hmm This is not learning to think critically. This is a Soviet-style indoctrination-type brainwashing question. And when the kid gets done taking this class, he's going to think he knows how to think. But he doesn't. He knows how to be told what to believe, and he never understands how it happened to him. That's not thinking critically. Then they tell the kids, we've got evidence for evolution from homologous structures. Wow, what's that mean? Yes, boys and girls. Did you know you have two bones in your wrist, and they're called the radius and the ulna? Pretty cool. And did you know the alligator has two bones in his forelimb? And look at this. They're called radius and ulna. See that? That proves we are related. That's what they're going to tell them. Homologous structures provide evidence that these animals evolved from a common ancestor. It's found in just about every textbook. You got it in these other ones up here, I'm sure, don't you, Steve? Homologous structures as evidence for evolution. 
They descended from a common ancestor, textbook says. Think critically. The bones are the same, boys and girls. See, that proves we're related. Evolved from a forelimb of a common ancestor. This textbook says, <clears throat> comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. The commonality suggests that these and other vertebrate animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. This is a lie. They probably have a common designer. Mm -hmm. You know, the different bones in different animals come from different genes on the chromosomes. They're not homologous to begin with, okay? And even if they were, that still wouldn't prove common ancestor. Proves a common designer. The same designer made them all. Did you know the lug nuts from a Pontiac will fit on a Chevy? You can go out in the parking lot and try it. They will. That proves they both evolved from Honda 14 million years ago. <laughs> no, it's true many animals have a similar forelimb structure. That's a good observation. I agree. They say they must have had a common ancestor. Oh, bad conclusion. Then they'll say, this helps prove we all came from a rock. Well, now you really have got a bad conclusion there. Then they tell the kids, we have evidence from development. Now, this one makes me angry. So I'm going to try to stay calm while we talk about this is probably one of the most dangerous lies in the textbooks. So just calm down now. Okay, I'm ready. This textbook says the similarity between the early stages of development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. Darwin considered this the strongest class of facts in favor of his theory. This was the best evidence Darwin knew of for his theory. The guy who made up this dumb idea is named Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel called this idea we're about to share with you the biogenetic law, which means as animals develop inside the mother, they go through the stages of evolution. All you got to do is memorize the word farm, F-A-R-M, fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal. That's the way they say it happened. The phrase they had for it back then was ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Wow, what's all that mean? Well, ontogeny is the growth of the baby. It goes through stages, okay? Recapitulates means it reenacts or does over again. Phylogeny is the evolutionary sequence. This Irish textbook says, the presence of fish-like structures in embryos of different species shows these animals have evolved from fish and share the basic pattern of fish development. It's as if the embryo retains a memory of its origins and starts to copy them during its development. That's the ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Now the idea that sick mind Freud relied on was the idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, that is, the development of the individual recapitulates the evolution of the entire species. This is stupid and dangerous. They tell the kids the embryo, the baby growing in the mother, has gills like a fish. Gills? That's a lie. Those are not gill slits. Those little folds of skin you see on the embryo grow into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. My uncle had five or six chins, and he couldn't breathe through any of them but the top one. Okay? <laughs> Those are not gill slits. Ernst Haeckel said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Darwin's book in 1860. See, Darwin's book was printed in English in 1859. The next year, it was printed in German, 1860. Haeckel was a German embryology professor. He read the book and said, wow, what a great theory. If only we had some evidence. Well, nine years later, they still had no evidence. So Haeckel decided to help out. He was going to make some evidence. Haeckel took a drawing of a dog and a human embryo he was an embryology professor, you know, and he lied. He faked the drawings. He changed them and made them look exactly alike to prove they're related. He just is a bold-faced lie, okay? Haeckel made giant posters of his fake drawings and traveled all over Germany and converted the people to believing in evolution, which led to the next obvious question. Hey, if evolution is true, I wonder which uh, race of humans have evolved the farthest. And guess who the Germans thought it was? Huh, yeah. We'll talk more about that later. Now, on top are Haeckel's fake drawings. Underneath are the actual photographs of these animals. He lied. His own university held a trial and convicted him of fraud. He said at the trial, I should feel utterly condemned were it not that hundreds of the best observers and biologists lie under the same charge. This biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail. It's not true. But it can't be taken out of the textbooks for some reason. It's been proven wrong since 1875, and they still keep it in the books. It's still used in this book, Evolutionary Analysis, College Textbook, 1998 edition. 
used at University of West Florida, the exact same chart of Ernst Haeckel. That's only been proven wrong since 1875. Okay? I know it takes a while to get textbooks up to date, but uh, that's long enough. I think 130 years, they ought to be able to get it out by now, don't you think? Okay? More about the gill slits in uh, this book here, Icons of Evolution. Darwin's theory, his book came out 1859. He predicted they would find evidence. 1869, Haeckel faked the drawings. 1875, it was proven wrong. But it's still in textbooks used all over the planet. 2004 textbook, still has it. 2005 textbook, and I pronounced it wrong as Chickasha, not Chickasha, Chickasha, Oklahoma. I got corrected during the break. Uh, still teaching the baby has gill pouches. Notice, for example, gill pouches, okay? Gill slits on the embryo. They're teaching this in textbooks all over the world. It's only been proven wrong since 1875. Get it out of the book. Tear the page out. I mean, it's, not, it's a no-brainer. Tear out the page. It's not true. There's a junior high textbook telling them it has uh, embryo, has gill slits. This one says, similarly, humans and fish embryos resemble each other because humans and fish share a common ancestor. Three, these similarities provide evidence that these three animals evolved from a common ancestor, tiny gill slits. Gill slits on the human embryo. Gills of fish. Tiny gill pouches used in college textbooks. There's a 2004 textbook saying it has evidence of evolution is seen in uh, development of embryos. You can't get a high score on SAT or ACT tests unless you lie and say the baby has gill pouches. It's found on every single test we could find. If you don't believe in evolution, you won't score high to get into college, or at least give the evolution answer. Why would they keep this in the textbooks 130 years after it is proven wrong? Oh, there's only one answer I can come up with. I'll tell you in a minute. This one shows a five to six week embryo, and it says by seven months, the fetus looks from the outside like a tiny normal baby, but it's not. <laughs> it's not a baby at seven months. Hello? That's a lie. It's a human at conception. 34% of babies born at five and a half months will survive. One lady had surgery on her baby before it was born. Cut the mother open, cut the uterus open, and the baby's holding the doctor's finger at five months along. Let's see. The angel of the Lord said, Behold, thou art with fetus. No, I believe he said you're with child, didn't he? Yeah, it's a child before it's born. Hmm? Yeah. Scott Peterson is accused of murdering his wife and unborn child. Now, Paul is on, you hypocrite. Don't you think it's okay to have an abortion, and yet you call it an unborn child? Scott Peterson is found guilty of murdering his wife and son. That's because in California, you have to have a double homicide to get the death penalty. So they want it to be a son or a child. But the rest of the time, if you want to have an abortion, it's okay. Now it's not a child, it's just a fetus. Well, let's get consistent here, folks, okay? Which is it? All right? More about embryology on this one, but why do they keep this in the textbooks? It's very simple. That's the only way to justify abortion. They want you to think it's not human yet. Somebody wants to reduce the population of this planet. And abortion has already done 15 or 20 20% 20 of the entire world's population has been killed by abortion. One billion people. Let's see, Hitler killed six million, Stalin about a hundred million, abortions a thousand million. And that's gonna work. We'll cover more on that on video five. Anna Rosa had her arm chopped off in a botched abortion. She was born anyway. They thought they killed her. Everybody says, oh, that's terrible. What if they would have cut her head off instead? We never would have heard about Anna Rosa. Now, I live in Pensacola. You might have heard of my town. We've had two doctors that were doing abortions shot and killed. Several clinics have been blown up or burned down. I did not shoot any doctors, and I did not blow up any clinics, okay? And I don't think Jesus would do it that way. He, did, he, he grew up under Roman control. He didn't go around blowing up tanks and burning down bridges, okay? Well, when the first doctor got shot, I was preaching in Fort Lauderdale. The next day, I flew home, and right in front of me on the airplane were two ladies, I'm sorry, two women from NOW, the National Organization for Wild Women. <laughs> and they were flying up to Pensacola, going to have a big rally and march around town, you know. As we got off uh, the airplane, and I noticed on their shirt, it had in huge block letters, Choice Above All. 
So, being my mild-mannered self, I said, excuse me, ma'am, what does this mean, choice above all? She said, a woman ought to have a right to choose. I said, choose what? She said, choose to have an abortion. It's her body. I said, well, yes, ma'am, if she wants to abort her body, I suppose that's fine. <laughs> but it looks to me like she wants to abort somebody else's body. Mm -hmm. When you consider half of them are male, think about it. It's not her body. Mm -hmm. I said, by the way, ma'am, I'm kind of curious about this. I have three kids. I delivered one of my kids at home. I used to raise hamsters. I taught biology and anatomy. I'm kind of familiar with this process. I said, why does the woman's right to choice stop at birth? Why don't we let the mother choose to kill it after it's born? It'd be a lot safer and simpler. Hey, why don't we extend abortion rights up until the kid's two years old? I know a lot of mothers with a two-year-old that have thought about it a time or two. <laughs> I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I know you're out there. I got it. Let's extend abortion rights up until the kid is 18. I bet they behave a lot better. Son, one more time, and I'm going to abort you. <laughs> hey, teacher, where, where's Johnny today? Oh, he didn't do his homework yesterday, so his mommy aborted him. Hey, grades would skyrocket, wouldn't they? By the way, Peter Singer is pushing for abortion after the baby's born. He's trying to get legislation passed so you can kill the baby up to 28 days after it's born and still call it an abortion. Have you ever noticed the news media calls them pro-choice and they call guys like me anti-abortion? I'm not. They, they do that anti-abortion because it's a negative sounding term. Pro-choice is such a positive sounding term. How about let's call me pro-life and call them pro-death? And we both get a positive sounding term. Hmm? That's why I refuse to take the paper. I just can't stand their liberal slant on everything. We get a call once in a while. Hey, you want to take the Pensacola News Journal? I say, no, ma'am, we don't have a parakeet. <laughs> That's what I tell them. See, the media will ignore the wishes of the majority, and they're going to push their liberal agenda. We'll cover more on that on part five. Well, remember when the kids got shot in Colorado? Right away, they jumped on the gun control issue. You know, if kids keep getting shot in our schools, maybe it's time to consider some other issues, like uh, should we have public schools? Or maybe should we teach them evolution? Hmm? That's what did the Columbine shooting. Those kids were real strong believers in evolution. They made a videotape before the shooting. One of the boys said, he doesn't deserve the jaw evolution gave him. Look for his jaw. It won't be on his body. They were strong believers in evolution. They did the shooting on Hitler's birthday on purpose. They shot Isaiah Scholes just because he was black. Eric's t-shirt said, natural selection. And then Rosie O'Donnell said, see, we need more gun control. <sighs> Rosie, Rosie, Rosie. Blaming guns for Columbine is like blaming spoons for Rosie O'Donnell being fat. It's not the spoon's fault. It's not the gun's fault, okay? Maybe certain criminals ought to be publicly executed. Maybe that's time to think that one through one more time. Maybe all law-abiding citizens should be required to carry guns to protect themselves. Hmm. Suppose every teacher in the public school was required to be armed. Just, just suppose. How far down the hallway would those kids have gotten? Somebody sent me this button. Proudly unarmed. Would you wear this? What does this say to a criminal? Rob me. <laughs> Isn't that exactly what it says? Of course. The Founding Fathers gave us the Second Amendment so we could keep and bear arms, and it wasn't so we could go duck hunting. The purpose of the Second Amendment was so we could defend ourselves if the government goes bad. Last-ditch defense against an evil government is an armed citizenry. Have you ever noticed a lot of animals that eat grass have horns? Did you know you don't need horns to eat grass? The purpose of the horns is to explain to the lion Stay off my back. I just want to eat the grass. Leave me alone. And I think everybody ought to be armed, not so we can hurt anybody, but just so we can explain to people, leave me alone. Don't take my stuff. Don't break into my house. Don't steal my car. Don't come hurt my family. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> I probably waited too long. I didn't start my kids shooting until they were about three. I probably should have started about two, you know. Here's the logic they use to justify abortion. They're going to say, well, it's not human. Oh, brother, you're either dumb or you're lying. It's human at conception, okay? They're going to say, well, it's not viable. It can't live on its own. 
You're not viable st yourself stark naked on the North Pole, you know. <laughs> Can't live on its own. I know kids that are 25 that still come borrow money from Dad. <laughs> hey, Dad, can I borrow some money? <laughs> you ought to be able to live on your own by now, son. <laughs> They're going to say the child may be unwanted. There's kids that are already born that are unwanted. My parents moved four times when I was growing up, but I found them every time. <laughs> by the way, there's probably five people in this room that have had an abortion. Now, you listen carefully. God loves you. He can forgive you. It's not the unpardonable sin. God can use you in a powerful way. But don't you go through life justifying it. Don't say it was okay. No, it wasn't okay. It was murder. So confess it, forsake it, get right with God, and go serve God with your life, okay? Amen. Half the Bible is written by murderers, okay? <laughs> You're in good company. They're going to say, well, the child may be unwanted. Well, a lot of people are unwanted. Year after year, the number of people waiting to adopt is about equal to the number of abortions. The babies are not unwanted, okay? They're going to say, well, the child may be a financial burden. Show me a kid that's not. <laughs> Anybody got a kid that's not a financial burden? <laughs> They're going to say, it may be from rape or incest. Well, then you kill the rapist, not the baby. <laughs> Execute the rapist and adopt out the baby. It's not that complicated. Hey, did you know it's illegal to shoot deer at night with spotlights in just about every state? Is it illegal in Tennessee to shoot deer at night with spotlights? You got to give them a sporting chance, right? Let's give the baby a sporting chance. Pass a law in Tennessee that says, if a lady goes to have an abortion, the nurse will have a jar of marbles, and we're going to have a lottery, okay? One marble for baby, one for mother, and one for father. <laughs> and one for doctor. <laughs> and one for governor. Yeah, let's put several in there for the past president. And let's really have a choice. Hmm? Now, if he's not alive, uh, why is he growing? If he's not a human being, what kind of being is he anyway, huh? She says, honk if you're pro-choice. It's easy for her to be pro-choice. She's already been born. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but did you know everybody that ever voted for abortion has already been born? Think that one through. They say, well, abortion's legal. Well, that doesn't make it right. 1936, the German Supreme Court declared Jews in Germany are not persons. That opened the way to allow Hitler to kill the Jews. Six million, at least, Jews were killed. I read lots of books about Hitler. I've been to Germany a couple times. Hitler said, I have the right to exterminate an inferior race that breed like the vermin. Hitler thought the Jews were an inferior species. He said, the Germans are the superior race that deserve to rule the world. Hitler was killing the Jews to make more living space for the Germans. He sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. Hitler said, if you want these criminals, I'll send them to you on luxury ships. You know, in 1938, the Jews could have been saved, but America refused to take them. Every country but Sweden refused to take the Jews. Hitler's book and his mind was captivated by evolutionary thinking, probably since he was a boy. Evolutionary ideas lie at the basis of all that is worst in Mein Kampf. Hitler thought it was the duty of the strong to trample the weak. In his book, Hitler said, Nature does not desire the mating of weaker with stronger individuals, even less does she desire the blending of a higher with a lower race. Who's a higher race, Adolf? He kept talking about the mingling of Aryan blood all through his book. He talked about Aryan races, lower peoples. Well, I found Hitler's hit list. Hitler thought the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegians were close to pure Aryan. Did you get all that? The blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegian. Yeah, sure you betcha. Oof, da hater, fella. He thought the Germans were mostly Aryan. The Mediterraneans are slightly Aryan. The Slavics are half Aryan, half ape. Orientals are slightly ape. Black Africans are mostly ape. And Jews are close to pure ape. Hitler killed the Jews to speed up the evolution process. Let's eliminate the inferiors. Anybody know where the Olympics were held in 1936? Berlin. Anybody know who won the most gold medals? Jesse Owens, the black American athlete. Hitler was so angry, he said, it's not fair to make my men race against this animal. Hitler said, I regard Christianity as the most fatal, seductive lie that ever existed. Well, that's because... He thought biological evolution would weed out the religion 
It would be a, a weapon against religion because the Bible teaches all nations are of one blood. And if you think you are superior to somebody because of the color of your skin, number one, you're wrong. Number two, you're stupid. Okay, number three, you're not right with God. Okay, we cover on the, more on the races, and there's no such thing as races. It's just skin colors on video number seven. I stood in the courtroom in Nuremberg where they held the trial years ago. Those guys on trial said, we did nothing illegal. We were just obeying orders. Yeah, and they were found guilty. Anyway, weren't they? Because see, there's a higher law than Germany's law. It's called God's law. Now, the Supreme Court in America in 1973 said the word person does not include the unborn. That's the decision that opened the way now for 45 million babies to be killed in America. A thousand million, that's a billion worldwide. On September 11th, 2001, 3,000 Americans were killed by terrorists. We spent billions of dollars trying to hunt them down and kill them, right? You know what else happened September 11th, 2001? 4,500 Americans were killed by abortionists. 50% more, and nobody said a word. The next day, it happened again. We've had a September 11th tragedy every day ever since. Have we gone nuts? Margaret Sanger started a group called Planned Parenthood to eliminate the inferior species. She wanted to wipe out the blacks, the Jews, and the Orientals. She thought they were human weeds. We could spend all day on Margaret Sanger, but they thought that, just like Hitler said, the Jews are a parasite in the body of nations, Margaret Sanger said the unborn child is a parasite in the woman's body. No, it's a child, okay? It's a baby. We could spend all day on Margaret Sanger. We don't have to take time for that now, but um, this is a Planned Parenthood document from 19, <clears throat> uh, 1952. They said, your question's answered about birth control. What is birth control? Is it an abortion? They said, oh, definitely not. An abortion requires an operation. It kills the life of a baby after it has begun. Well, you bunch of hypocrites at Planned Parenthood. Now they're the biggest funder of abortions in the country. These six things doth the Lord hate. Hands that shed innocent blood. God hates this. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Your textbooks are going to tell you kids that you have an appendix that is vestigial. You don't need it anymore. That's a lie. You need your appendix. The appendix is part of your immune system. Here's an article on the web from University of Chicago. Ask a scientist. Nancy writes in and says, what is the function of the appendix in a human before it is taken out through surgery? This lady writes back and says, the appendix has no known function. It, She's way behind the times on that one. She goes on to say, It is believed that the appendix will gradually disappear in human beings as our diet do not includes cellulose no more. <laughs> our diet do not includes cellulose no more. University of Chicago, wow. Good place to get an education. Uh, not in English, apparently, but... In the first place, this is not true, okay? The appendix is part of your immune system. You need your appendix. The appendix activates killer B cells like your thyroid activates killer T cells. It's true you can live without your appendix. That's true. You can live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes and both your ears also. Doesn't prove you don't need them. If you take your appendix out, you've got a much better chance of getting all sorts of diseases. This textbook says the whale has a vestigial pelvis. Many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. National Center for Science Education teaches, Bossy the cow evolved to blowho the whale. The cow evolved to the whale. And the evidence is the pelvis. Whales have a pelvis, vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose. They have hind limb bones that have no function. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. Well, here's the bones they're talking about right there. Just imagine the whale walking around. I have tried and tried to imagine, and I just can't do it. Almost every type of whale has these bones right there in the abdomen. They are not attached to the spine. That's correct. Textbook says the whale's pelvis 
is located far from the vertebra and has no apparent function. The whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged, land-dwelling mammals. This is a lie. Those little bones are anchor points that special muscles attach to that allow the whales to reproduce. Whales are kind of big, you know. And without those special muscles and those special bones, they can't get more baby whales. So either these guys are ignorant about their whale anatomy or they're lying to your kids trying to spread their theory. But it's not true that those are vestigial, okay? There are no vestigial organs, and if there were, think about it, that would be the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. How's that going to help? You lose everything until you have it all? We could spend two days on whale evolution. Every one of them, Ambulocetus and Pachycetus, have all been proven baloney. They can't be intermediate species, okay? The authors were certain the feet were enormous, even though nothing was found. <laughs> Basilosaurus could not possibly have been ancestral to any of the modern whales. Pachycetus was made from one small piece of jaw, a few, a small piece a small piece of skull, a small piece of jaw, and a few teeth. You find a little bit of jaw, a little bit of skull, a couple of teeth, and you know that it's half whale, half something on land? That's kind of a stretch, don't you think? Uh, we'll cover more on that later, but there's all kinds of stuff on our website about this. Um, I've got in my museum a 15 and a half foot python snake skin. If you look at the south end of that snake skin, it's got a couple claws attached to a little two-inch bone going up inside the snake's body. We've got them in our, got it in our museum, okay? Textbook says, see, boys and girls, this is a vestigial structure. The boa and the python have these little tiny claws. Do whales or snakes have back legs? You can see that they don't. Yet, both animals have vestigial hip bones and leg bones where legs may once have existed. This is a lie. This textbook says they have reduced hind legs, rudimentary hind legs of a python snake. You've got to be kidding. Those little claws are used in mating, okay? The snake doesn't have any arms, and he can't talk and say, uh, scoot over, honey, okay? This has nothing whatsoever to do with walking on land. It has to do with getting baby snakes. So once again, somebody's real dumb about their snake anatomy, or they're lying to your kids trying to spread their theory. This textbook shows the coccyx, the human tailbone, and a Discover magazine, and it says, that's all that's left of the tail that most mammals still use. Humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. I was in a debate in Huntsville, Alabama, against the president of the North Alabama Atheist Association. He got up in front of God and everybody and said, folks, I've got proof for evolution. Humans have a tailbone they no longer need. I said, uh, Mr. Patterson, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, <clears throat> without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. I said, now, if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. <clears throat> Critical thinking, this book says, 2005 edition. At the end of your backbone is a coccyx, a few small bones that are fused together. Could the human coccyx be a vestigial structure? Or is it the start of a newly evolving structure? That's thinking critically. They give the kids two answers, two options, both of which are wrong. There's a third option, you know. Maybe it's fine just like it is. Notice they don't give that as an option, do they? Maybe it was designed to support your colon and support your lower back for posture when you sit. And five or six other things you can read your Gray's Anatomy about. Okay? They say, aren't babies born with tails once in a while? No. Well, that baby's got a tail right there. No, he doesn't. It's not a tail. That's just fatty tissue. There's no bone, no muscle, no cartilage. It's not even lined up with the spine. It has to do with the way the baby develops inside the mother. There's fat around the nervous system to protect it until the bone grows around it. And extremely, generally, the, the fat is resorbed into the system as the baby grows and develops bone. But on extremely rare occasions, the fat is excluded outside the body like a big wart. So what you do, you cut it off, sew it up, put a diaper on the kid, and send him home. It's just nothing like a, it's just like a wart. That's all it is. Cut it off. 
It's not a tail. This one says the coccyx is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function and is thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree living ancestor. They told me when I was a kid, man used to have a tail, but he lost it because he didn't need it. I thought, didn't need it? Have you ever thought how handy a tail would be? Have you ever come to the door with two sacks of groceries? Man, wouldn't that be nice to be able to grab that door and walk right in there? You could drive down the highway and hold that can of Coke and tune the radio knob all at the same time. <laughs> Lost it because we didn't need it. That's a lie. Everything used as evidence for evolution has been proven wrong. If real evidence exists, I'd like to see it. We'll pay a quarter million dollars for real proof for evolution. But don't lie to me. I think you ought to demand that your school board cut out pages with lies on them. Don't put up with that stuff. I was in a, speaking at University of West Florida, and this one biology teacher said, Hovind, I don't think we should deface textbooks. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, tonight you said we should cut out the pages with this stuff on it. We shouldn't deface a textbook. I said, well, sir, uh, suppose you were teaching math and you found a book that said 2 plus 2 is 5. What would you tell your students to do? He said, I would tell them to mark out the wrong answer and write in the right answer. <sighs> you would deface a textbook? I said, now, sir, you teach biology, don't you? He said, yes, I do. I said, well, suppose you found one of your textbooks that taught the embryo has gill slits or the snake has a vestigial pelvis or, you know, all the stuff I covered tonight. Are you going to tell your kids to tear that page out? He said, oh, no, no. I said, would you tell them to mark it out and then write something in the column that it's not correct? He said, no, no, no. I said, would you at least put a warning sticker in the front cover that said, hey, kids, the information on page 85 is wrong. Would you at least warn them? He said, oh, no, no. I said, you would correct a math book, but you won't correct a biology book. I said, you, sir, are a hypocrite. And the folks in this county need to help you get a different job pick, and peaches are changing tires. But you've got no business taking our tax dollars to lie to these kids coming through your class. We're paying for this school. Why don't you be respectful and resign, or quit lying to the kids? He said, Hovind, you don't have much tact. Oh, I made full contact with that guy, that's for sure. Okay. <laughs> Evolution is... Unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation. They just don't want to believe this. They don't want to believe in creation. And they're willing to believe a lie rather than believe the truth, just so they can support their wicked lifestyle. Psalm 94 says, He that formed the eye, shall he not see? God formed the eye. Eyeballs are incredibly complicated. Charles Darwin said, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. But then he goes on for three or four pages and says how he thinks it happened anyway. Your eyeball is amazing. You know, at the back of your eye, there are 137 million light-sensitive cells in one square inch called your retina, all of them wired straight to the brain. How would you like to hook up 137 million electrical connections in one square inch? My Heavenly Father did. He's pretty smart, isn't he? Now, I debated one atheist one time, and he said, Hovind, the eye is an example for evolution because it's poorly designed. I said, what on earth are you talking about? He said, well, the light comes into your eye, and then it goes through blood vessels in front of the retina. He said, that's wired backwards. He said, the octopus has a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. I said, sir... Let me just explain something to you, okay? I said, we live in the air. <clears throat> now, air is a pretty poor insulator for UV light. So your body has, is designed with the blood vessels in front of the retina. That's your body's last defense against ultraviolet light. Now, octopus live in the water, okay? Water blocks UV light. So they don't need their blood vessels in front. See, we're designed for living in air, and they're designed for living in water. Now, if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you just go ahead, sir, but you're going to be blind in a few days, okay? Because they don't have the blood vessels in front to block the UV light. What a dumb evidence for evolution. What they're trying to say is, well, God wouldn't do it this way, so it must have evolved. Well, that's a silly argument for evolution. Maybe you just don't understand why it was designed that way. I think man's understanding of the human body... It's about like putting a five-year-old kid under the hood of your car and saying, hey, kid, take out whatever this thing doesn't need. 
You don't know what any of it does. You can take it all out, right? You know, your eyeball's amazing. It would take a minimum of 100 years of Cray computer time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. Eyeballs are amazing. But this textbook says, the complex structure of the human eye may be the product of millions of years of evolution. Why doesn't God get the glory for what he did? This textbook shows the kids a bird eye and a reptile eye, and it says right up here, boys and girls, you can better understand how the eye might have evolved if you picture a series of changes. You have to imagine how it happened. Just imagine the eye changing. That's not science, <laughs> imagining how it happened. Where's the evidence? See, evolution only takes place in the imagination. Never takes place in reality. They're lying to you, okay? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? Science deals with things we can observe and study and test. You don't observe anything about evolution. If you have something that's designed like an eyeball, it demands a designer. If painting is proof there was a painter, even if you never see the guy. A building is proof there was a builder, and a watch is proof there was a watchmaker, and design, the creation, is proof there was a creator. See, design simply demands a designer, period. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They are without excuse, the Bible says. There's no excuse. The psalmist said, when I consider the heavens. You know, God knows that the study of science will draw us to him. Satan knows that too. So Satan has worked really hard in the field of science to make sure it pushes kids away from God. And we need some good godly science teachers to get involved in the school system and turn this thing around, okay? And by the way, we can prove the existence of God by the impossibility of the contrary. It's impossible that there not be a designer. It's just not possible. There had to be a designer, okay? I like to show evolutionists this picture. I say, guys, here we have, as far as I know, the world's largest rock group. Uh, you know of a bigger one? I'd like to see it, okay? Um, I'll say, do you think there's any way George Washington's face could have appeared on this rock by chance? I say, no, it was designed by a guy named Borglum. Took him a long time to build it. Okay, very good. Now, let me ask you a question. You say there's no way this uh, face could appear on the rock by chance. You don't think wind could have done that? Abrasion, exfoliation, thermal expansion of the rock? Nothing? Nope, nope, happened by, happened by design. Okay, now let me ask you this question. Do you think George Washington himself, with 50 trillion cells in his body, and all these complex systems, happened by chance? I say, yeah. Now wait, wait, wait. You don't think his face could appear on a rock by chance, but you do think his whole complex anatomy could happen by chance. Are you dumb in any other area, or is that the only one, you know? <laughs> then they tell kids that plants are adapted to their environment. Adapted? Yes, boys and girls, gills are an adaptation to living in water. Oh, well, how did they live before they adapted the gills? Hmm? Well, you see, Mr. Hoven, for millions of years, they all died. None of them lived until they adapted the gills. Oh, I see. Why don't they say it's a design feature? See, they avoid using the word designed because then some kid's going to say, who's the designer? Hmm? Adaptations for living on land. Legs. Oh, yes, boys and girls. Legs support the body's weight as well as allow movement from place to place. Well, that's true. It doesn't prove they adapted by themselves, though. Lungs. Oh, boy, the delicate structure of a fish's gills depends on water for support. On land, lungs carry out gas exchange. That's true. That's not proof one changed to the other, though. They just make this mental, imaginary connection in the kids' minds. I've got a Casio data bank stopwatch, or uh, watch, okay? Holds 300 phone numbers. It's a calculator, stopwatch, an alarm clock, and a countdown timer. It does not tell time. I have to look at it. But it's a pretty amazing machine, 70 bucks at Walmart. Um, I was in Japan a couple years ago, but I did not see the guy who makes the Casio data bank watch. I never saw him. Do I have to see the guy who made it to believe he exists? Hmm. Is it logical for me to stand here in Tennessee and say, I believe there's a watch designer in Japan that made this thing? Is that logical? Even if I never see him? Sure. Would it be illogical for me to say, I've never seen him, so I don't believe he exists. That would be totally dumb, wouldn't it? And you don't have to see the creator to believe he exists, okay? 
Evolutionists argue against design using arguments they designed. Mm, think about that one. Here's a great book talking about the complexity of living things at a micro scale. We sell the book at our website. Michael Behe wrote this on Darwin's black box. He spends a whole chapter describing the hair on a bacteria. That hair is so complicated, it's attached to a little tiny motor. The motor is so tiny that eight million of them would fit in the cross section of a human hair, but the motor turns 100,000 RPM. Let's see you build a motor like that. Pretty amazing. And as things get smaller, the world they live in feels more sticky to them. The viscosity of the fluid seems greater. So a bacteria swimming through water is about like a person swimming through peanut butter. And that little motor is so powerful and turns so fast, that bacteria can swim about like a person going 60 miles an hour through peanut butter. We've got a little model of it in our museum if you want to come down and see how they work. And the textbook says, humans probably evolved from bacteria more than 4 billion years ago. What? They can swim through peanut butter 60 miles an hour. We should sign them up for the Olympics, man. We evolved from them? <laughs> We're getting worse, not better. It's a lie. Nothing this small and complex could have happened by chance. This is a great book that we sell in our bookstore. Just simple illustrations. Could a box evolve? Could an ink pen evolve? Could a paperclip evolve? It just goes through a bunch of simple things and shows it just can't happen, okay? Then they talk about the origin of life. Yes, boys and girls, how living things started from non-living matter. This is pure baloney, how they teach this in the books. We're going to cover that after a quick break. Cover a few more lies in the textbooks and then tell you what you can do about it. Some practical steps to fix the problem right after the break. In the last two sessions, we covered 15 lies found in the typical textbook. I taught high school science for 15 years, and I'm not against science, I'm not against schools, I'm not against teachers, but I'm against lies. Just don't lie to the kids, okay? The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth thee to err from the words of knowledge. Don't listen to things that are simply not true, okay? Get the lies out of the books. The Bible says God created all things, and it says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Um, hath not my hand made all these things? God made everything. And the Bible says God formed the entire world. The Bible says God created great whales and every living thing. Now the textbooks in school are going to teach your kids that every living thing happened by itself. They're not going to teach them God created every living thing, that's for sure. Here's a, a textbook that says, The history of life on earth began about three and a half billion years ago. How this occurred has been and will continue to be a topic for inquiry. Let me give you the Hovind translation of what they just said. What they just said is, it's okay to inquire how it evolved. It is not okay to inquire if it evolved. Hey kids, you're allowed to research, you know, how did evolution happen? And if some kid says, well, maybe it didn't happen at all. Oh, shut up, kid. You're out of my class, okay? The only way you can research is how did it happen. You cannot even ask the question, did it happen? That's not education. That's indoctrination. Okay? I'm sick and tired of paying for that stuff. Now, nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organized themselves into the first living cell. Paul Davies said, Nobody has a clue how life got started from non-living material by itself. There is not even a good theory how it can happen, but the textbooks are going to teach your kids it just happened, okay? They just tell them, hey, it happened. And you, don't, you can't even consider the option that maybe God made it. Here's what happened. Back in the 50s, two guys, Miller and Urey, decided to figure out how life evolved. So they took a mixture of chemicals and ran it through these tubes and tried to create life in the laboratory. The experiment's been duplicated many, many times. Always been a failure. And always created more problems for the evolutionist. This textbook says, uh, although he never proved how life originated, he did add evidence to the theory that life could have started by itself. That is a lie. All they did was create problems for the idea that life could have started by itself. This one says, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> well, it sure is. It don't even happen. That's how slow it is. There are several different articles that say life came from clay. Yep, got some clay together and poof, came alive on the bottom of the ocean. They did not address the origin of uh, life in Darwin's book, and it's never been figured out since how life could have started. What he did is he took these four chemicals and put them in these uh, glass tubes, made them circulate around, and tried to create life in the laboratory. This textbook says, many important events occurred during the Archean era, the most important of which was the evolution of life. 
Progress from complex molecules to the simplest living organism was a very long process. <laughs> I guess so. If you give it billions of years, somehow it looks more reasonable, you know? This one says, the first living cells emerged between 4 billion and 3.8 billion years ago. There is no record of the event. But you better believe it, and you're going to be tested on it. The first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So great, 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 great grandpa was soup. This is one of the lies in the textbooks you kids have to face. Nobody has a clue how life could have gotten started by non-living chemicals. Even Haeckel confessed, he's the guy we talked about in the last session, uh, that made up the idea that the embryo has gill slits, you know, so they could justify abortion. Haeckel said, he claimed that spontaneous generation must be true, not because it had been proven in the laboratory, but because otherwise it would be necessary to believe in a creator. Well, Ernst, I'm sorry, bud, that's just the way it goes, okay? There's a creator, whether you like it or not, okay? So have they really produced life in the laboratory? Oh, they haven't even come close. Here's what they did. They took four gases. They took methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen, ran them through these tubes, ran it through a spark chamber, which is supposed to simulate lightning. <clears throat> they say, we're going to see. We're going to put them together and make life in the laboratory. At the bottom of the flask, they got this red goo, and they kept draining the goo off, because if it went through the spark again, it would destroy it. So they had to make the goo and then save it from the next spark, okay? They said in the textbook here it was rich in amino acids, this red goo was. Well, that's simply a lie, okay? They didn't come close to making life. The problem is they had a reducing atmosphere. In other words, he excluded oxygen. You can look at his four gases. There's no oxygen there. He knew if he had oxygen in there, it would oxidize whatever chemicals tried to combine. You know, you cut a banana open and lay it on the table, it turns brown, it oxidizes. You don't paint your car and it oxidizes, it rusts. Well, living, living cells will, try, will oxidize quickly in the presence of oxygen. So he didn't put any oxygen in there. That creates a serious problem because if you, if you have oxygen, you cannot get life to come from non-living chemicals. The problem is ozone is made from oxygen, and ozone blocks UV light, and UV light destroys ammonia, and ammonia is one of the four gases he's got. So you cannot get life to evolve with oxygen, and you cannot get life to evolve without oxygen because if you don't have oxygen, you don't have ozone, and now your ammonia gets destroyed. It's just not going to work either way. And the Earth has always had oxygen, even more than today. This guy said, what evidence is there for a primitive methane ammonia atmosphere on Earth? The answer is there is no evidence for it, but much against it. We find in general no evidence in the sedimentary distribution of carbon, sulfur, uranium, etc., that an oxygen-free atmosphere ever existed on the Earth. If somebody tells you the early Earth had a reducing atmosphere, you tell them Kent Hovind said they're confused or they're deliberately lying, because it's not true. The Earth has always had oxygen. This article said, it's suggested from the earliest dated rocks at 3.7 billion years ago, Earth had an oxygenic atmosphere. They've always known the Earth had oxygen, even more than we have today. We covered that on seminar part two, how the early Earth probably had even more oxygen, made them live longer. This textbook says, there was no oxygen on the Earth, which is a lie, and then it says, the rocks absorbed it. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> how can they absorb it if it wasn't there? Well, think about it. Second problem they had with the Miller experiment, they filtered out the product. That is not realistic for nature, okay? They saved the goo from getting sparked the second time because it would have destroyed it. What he actually made in this experiment was 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid. Now, both of those are poisonous to life. If you make a mixture that's 98% poisonous to the other 2%, I don't think it's logical to say you've succeeded in creating anything that's going to help make life, okay? The problems are he made mostly only two amino acids. There are 20 different ones required to make life. 20 different amino acids. Now, these amino acids are kind of like letters of the alphabet, okay? You have to have 26 letters in the English alphabet to make all the words that we have. Well, you have to have 20 different amino acids to make all the proteins that your body has. With those 20 different amino acids, your body can build a bazillion different kinds of proteins, kind of like you can make a lot of different words with the same 26 letters, okay? What he actually made was a couple of letters, like two of the letters of the alphabet by combining these gases. This creates a real problem since half of them were left-handed and half of them were right-handed. What he actually made was amino acids, only two of them, and half of them were backwards. I mean, if I drop letters of the alphabet, there's a 50-50 chance some of them are going to land upside down. They don't do any good. You have to have them all facing the right way. The smallest proteins we know of have about 70 to 100 amino acids, all of them facing the right way. This greatly compounds the problem, okay? DNA and RNA are all right-handed. All other proteins are left-handed. It's a very puzzling fact. All proteins that have been investigated 
from animals, plants, and higher organisms, and from simple organisms, bacteria, molds, even viruses are made of left-handed amino acids. They're all that way. So he's really got a problem since half of his letters were backwards. And there are hundreds of amino acids required to combine in just the right way to make a protein. And they unbond in water faster than they bond. And they claim this all happened in the oceans. Well, the oceans are completely full of water all the way to the bottom. And Brownian motion is going to drive them apart. It's not going to put them together. One of the lies in the textbooks is that they made life in the laboratory. They have all they've done. Every experiment has made the problem worse for the evolutionist, OK? They, spontaneous generations do not occur spontaneously in water. Life is not going to get started in this way. There's a whole lot more in the book, Icons of Evolution, if you want a lot more on the subject to go down deep. But they got this weird idea in their head that all they have to do is get all the right chemicals together and then add energy, and it'll make life. OK, well, let's do an experiment. Let's put a frog in a blender and turn it on. In a matter of moments, you will have frog nog. <laughs> and you will have all of the chemicals required to make a frog in one blender, right? Then we're going to add energy. You can turn it on puree for 30 minutes. You can nuke it, microwave it, zap it with jumper cables. I don't care what you do. Drop a hand grenade in there. Add all the energy you want, OK? How long will it take to reassemble the frog? It'll never happen. See, just getting the chemicals together isn't the problem. You go to the mortuary. You've got a dead body laying there. You've got all the chemicals required for life right there in one spot. Bring it back to life. Life is something different. I don't think science has ever defined that clearly. But they talk about how we all came from this early life form. Once this first life form got started, this single cell, then it evolved into everything else. Like this textbook shows the kids that a bacteria slowly evolved to a human. These trees of life are absolute propaganda. There is no evidence for any of these, OK? Even Mary Leakey said, those trees of life with the branches of our ancestors, that's a lot of nonsense, OK? Stephen Gould said, the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks are not the evidence of fossils, that's for sure. There is no evidence that any animal is related to any other kind of animal. But this textbook says, all the many forms of life on Earth today are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. There's no such thing as a primitive unicellular organism. If it's alive, it's complicated. We'll cover more on that in a minute. And then it says, no traces of those events remain. What they do is they tell the kids, OK, kids, the mammals, the birds, and the crocodiles have a common ancestor. They draw these trees in the books, and they look so pretty. And the kid goes, wow, they've got proof. I saw it in my book. <laughs> no, they've got a picture in your book, OK? Everything inside that circle is pure religious speculation. They think it happened. They hope it happened. But there is zero evidence for anything inside that circle. It's one of the lies you're going to have to face in your textbook. The Bible says if you offend one of these little ones, you'd be better off with a millstone about your neck. Go swimming. These folks teaching evolution are in serious trouble when they stand before God. Then they tell them we come from a simple, primitive, unicellular organism. Look, just because it's smaller doesn't mean it's simpler. A paramecium is more complicated than a space shuttle. And you can put thousands of those into one drop of water. Smaller is not simpler. That's one of the lies in the textbooks. I'll show you. Here's a microchip inside a paperclip. Pretty small. Not simple. This microchip is being held in the mouth of an ant, and that little microchip can process every letter of the Bible 200 times per second. Smaller is not simpler. I'll show you. Let's compare the brain of a honeybee to NASA's Cray computer. At one time, the world's fastest computer. I think they got a faster one now. The brain of a honeybee is pretty small. The Cray computer is huge. We would all agree there's a size difference, right? Okay. Now. The Cray computer could do 6 billion calculations per second. It was estimated that the honeybee's brain is doing about a trillion calculations per second, a thousand billion. So that little honeybee brain is about 133 times faster than a Cray computer. The Cray uses many megawatts. It's power hungry. The honeybee uses 10 microwatts. Did you know honeybees not only make honey, they fly on honey. That's their energy source. And a honeybee can fly a million miles on one gallon of honey. How would you like a machine that gets a million miles per gallon? Especially at today's price of gas, right? Fill up once and you're done for the rest of your life. The Cray costs $48 million. The honeybee's brain is pretty cheap. <clears throat> you splat them on your windshield all the time, right? Many people scramble when the Cray breaks down. 
Nobody heals the honeybee. A self-healing computer. Steve, you work on computers. How'd you like one of them? Something crashes, reconfigures itself, fixes it all up, no problem. Cray weighed 2,300 pounds. Honeybee's brain doesn't weigh too much. So what should we conclude? Let's see, the supercomputer is huge, it is slow, it is very inefficient, it is power hungry, and it had to be designed. We all know that, right? But did they turn around and look at the honeybee and say, well, that happened by chance? <laughs> and the brain of a human is a whole lot more complex than a honeybee, for heaven's sake. Your brain can hold more information than the entire British library. The human brain is phenomenal, okay? You have more computational power in bits per second than the entire national telephone system. One brain surgeon estimated that there are more connections in your, in just one person's brain, there are more connections than the entire electrical system of the United States. How many wires have been connected together in the United States, would you guess, inside every computer and inside every machine and inside every building? Like zillions of them. One brain has more than that. One professor told me that he believed in evolution, and I said, well, sir, do you believe your brain is nothing but three pounds of chemicals that got together by chance? He said, yeah. I said, then how can you trust your thoughts and the conclusions you come to? <laughs> Maybe you got a chemical in there backwards. He did, by the way, several actually. But Then they tell the kids, well, DNA is pretty tiny, but that proves evolution. That's what this textbook says. We have evidence of evolution from molecular biology. Darwin speculated all forms of life are related. This speculation has been verified. They are lying to your kids. Nothing about DNA has helped with the evolution theory at all. DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, is the most complex molecule in the universe. Unbelievably complicated molecule. That little DNA molecule, average person has 50 trillion cells in their body with 46 of those little molecules in each cell. 46 chromosome strands in each cell of your body. If you extracted all of it, it would only fill about two tablespoons. But if you took those DNA strands and unwound them, <coughs> stretched them out, tied them together, one person's DNA would reach from Earth to the moon and back over half a million times. Round trips to the moon. They say the DNA holds more, compute, more information than all computer programs ever written by man combined. IBM models the newest computers after DNA. The quantity of information is so vast, we have to invent new numbers to measure it. Not terabytes, petabytes, or exabytes, yottabytes, and zettabytes. All the words uttered by everyone who ever lived would amount to five exabytes. And your DNA and your chromosome holds more information than that? It is so unbelievably complex. If you typed out the code found in your DNA, when you got done typing, you'd have enough books to fill Grand Canyon 78 times. That's the instructions to make you. I'd say you're pretty special. Quite a list of instructions to make you. David said, I will praise thee, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And he didn't have a, he didn't have a microscope, and he could figure that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, from conception to birth, the baby adds 15,000 cells per minute to its body. Each one is more complicated than a space shuttle. How would you like to, like to be in charge of the supply end of supplying a factory that is producing 15,000 space shuttles a minute? And it's your job to make sure they have all the nuts and bolts and screws and everything they need to put that thing together. Some of you women are saying, boy, I did it, and that's hard, too. Sometimes they want pickles in the middle of the night, you know. <laughs> what are you building down there anyway, you know? Uh, <clears throat> the probability of one DNA happening by chance has been calculated to be 1 in 10 to the 119,000th power. That's a big number when you figure the entire visible universe is about 10 to the 28 inches in diameter. DNA has not proven anything that would help the evolution theory. It's been made the problem much, much, much worse. But let's just assume that the chromosome number means something and that, you know, it, it could evolve. Okay, well, then I did some research on this. I discovered penicillin has two chromosomes. That one had to evolve first. And then slowly, over millions of years, they got some more chromosomes, because they're complicated, you know, and turned into a fruit fly. You can see the similarity there. It's only got eight chromosomes. And then very slowly, it evolved some more chromosomes and became either a tomato or a house fly. Very tough to tell the difference. They're identical twins, you know. And then very slowly, over millions of years, it evolved into either a pea 
or B, you can see the similarity there, you know, P, B, very similar, and slowly became lettuce and then a carrot, and finally when we got to 22 chromosomes, triplets. The possum, the redwood tree, and the kidney bean all have 22 chromosomes. Average scientists cannot tell them apart. <laughs> let's see, which one is which here? Okay, let's see, tree, possum, bean, huh. Uh, and we have 46, folks. And if we can just get two more, the next step of human evolution, we're going to become a tobacco plant. <laughs> I know some already smell like it. Sometimes I'll get on the elevator and I'll say, man, you're evolving, you're way ahead of me. And it probably won't happen in my lifetime, but we might get enough chromosomes someday to be either a dog or a chicken. They're twins, too, you know. And then way down the road, you know, we're going to become a carp. They got double the chromosomes we do. And someday, star date 34, 95, 72, we're going to become a fern. I was at a church one time, and this lady walked up to me afterwards, and she said, Mr. Hoven, I'm fern. <laughs> I shook hands with that hand right there. I'll never wash it again. Hey. <laughs> How come the evolutionists are always comparing things that fit their theory? Why don't they show us the things that don't fit their theory? Like, let's just say we're going to examine how things evolved based upon how long they lived. Well, we could arrange animals by how long they live, and we'll find out the hamster evolved first, slowly turned into a cat, and then a canary, and then a dog, and then a chimpanzee, and an alligator, elephant, horse, turtle, and human. We made it, folks. We made it. Let's, uh, Let's ex arrange the animals based on how long they're pregnant, their gestation period. Well, in that case, the possum, only 13 days. How do you like that, ladies? Only be pregnant for 13 days. Not bad, huh? Yeah, I'd have a bunch of kids in. Uh, slowly evolved into a hamster, then a rat, then a rabbit, kangaroo, on down the list, and the elephant, 640 days. They are the winner, the most evolved creature on Earth. Or maybe you can see here the cat and the dog are identical twins, you know. Maybe we should uh, arrange them based on how much they weigh in their adult form. Well, the shrew only weighs four grams. Slowly, it became a mouse. And very slowly, slowly, over billions of years, became a whale. The whale's the most evolved now. Why don't they show us these charts, huh? And why is it that amphibians have five times more DNA than mammals, and some amoeba have a thousand times more DNA? They don't tell us these things, because it doesn't fit their theory. It's impossible to arrange in any sort of evolutionary series based on just one little bit of facts. You better find all the facts. You find out this evolution theory fails miserably. But they tell the kids, we're going to think critically, boys and girls. There are 20 kinds of amino acids. That's a fact. Explain how this fact supports the idea that all life shares a common ancestor. How's a Christian kid supposed to answer that for homework for Monday? Hmm? Don't you see a built-in assumption in this question? That's not learning to think critically. Would the kid be allowed, teacher, to explain how this fact that they all have 20, all life forms have 20 amino acids, would the kid be allowed to say, maybe that proves the intelligence of a common designer? Maybe God gave all the animals the same basic 20 amino acids so that uh, we, could, we don't have to just eat each other, you know? I mean, if they're all totally different, wildly different kinds, then we could, we could only eat other humans. But see, God made it this way so the brown cow can eat the green grass and give the white milk and make the yellow butter, and I eat it and get the blonde hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe that's why there's all the same basic building blocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the lies they face in the textbooks is this idea that all these similarities prove a common ancestor. Well, let's pretend that it does, okay? This textbook says, humans and orangutans are 96% similar, proving a common ancestor 15 million years ago. I don't think so. Humans and chimps have thousands of differences, thousands of differences. Overall, this guy says, the genetic difference is only 1.6%. Oh, that's what they used to think, but that's a lie. Barney Maddox was the leading genome researcher on this project. He said the genetic difference between human and chimpanzee is at least 1.6%. That doesn't sound like much, but calculated out, that's a gap of 48 million nucleotides. And a change of only three nucleotides is fatal to an animal. He said it's not going to happen. That's when they thought the difference was 1.6%. It's still too big of a gap. Now, then, later they found out, oh, actually, it's a 95% similarity, which is 5% difference. And just recently, they said, oh, no, wow, look at this. It's 7.7% difference. The difference, the more we study about this, the worse the problem gets for the evolutionist. Actually, it's becoming worse by the day. This result is based on only 1 million DNA bases out of 3 billion. They've only analyzed one three-thousandth 
of the human DNA code. A very small percent has actually been analyzed. French and American scientists have mapped chromosome 14, the longest sequence to date, and the site of more than 60 disease genes. The feat enlisted nearly 100 researchers and marks the fourth of the 24 human chromosomes mapped so far. If somebody tells you they have mapped the entire human genome, you tell them Kent Hovind said they're mistaken or they're lying. Okay, they've only mapped a small percentage, okay? Then it says, uh, the French National uh, Sequencing Center said the chromosome is compared, is comprised of more than 87 million pairs of DNA, all of which have been sequenced, so the chromosome's map includes no gaps. This is the longest piece of contigu contiguous DNA sequenced. 87 million pairs, a fraction of the total 3 billion pairs found in the human genome. They still don't know how much there's in there, and it's already 7.7% difference. This researcher said, human genome is littered with up to 20,000 pseudogenes. That proves evolution. I get this in debates all the time. They'll say, what about the pseudogenes? I said, there's no such thing. They said, well, yeah, there is. There are thousands of pseudo, which means a false gene. It doesn't do anything. Oh, no. Those pseudogenes serve several purposes. Number one, they serve as decoys to draw you know, poisons away from the real ones. Number two, they serve as backup mechanism. It's like your computer has an automatic backup. You know, if a piece of the memory gets destroyed, another one of those pseudogenes jumps right in, takes over. No, there's not. They took out some of the pseudogenes to see what would happen. They said, well, the mouse doesn't need these things. Let's take them out. And there's how they turned out. They were deformed terribly. No such thing as a pseudogene. The pseudogene may function as a decoy to lure away destructive enzymes. Discover Magazine of 03. We could spend all day on DNA sequencing, but, you know, it could be. We have similar DNA to other animals because we have the same designer. You know, similar bridges would have similar blueprints, wouldn't they? Similar cars would have similar instructions on how to build them, how to make them. Man has a pretty good understanding of how cars work. My daddy started us off boys, started us boys off working on cars when we were, you know, seven years old. I've had 128 cars, I believe. I've rebuilt the motors, the transmissions, the wobbleator shafts, the differentials, the high-speed Knutton valves, and the muffler bearings. I have a pretty good understanding of how cars work. But understanding the operation of a car does not explain the origin of the car. Big difference. See? Let's suppose your son turns 16. All of my kids did a few years ago. Your son comes up and says, hey, Dad, <clears throat> I got my license. Let me see that thing, son. Let me see your license. Come on. Wow, son. That's a lousy picture. It is a good likeness, though. He says, hey, Dad, uh, can I drive the car? Well, son, your mom and I knew this day was coming. The car is a very complicated machine. Did you know there are 3,000 bolts required to hold a car together, and one nut can scatter it all over the highway? <laughs> we don't think you're ready for the whole car, son. We're going to let you slowly evolve into the car. This year, we're going to give you 10%. Next year, maybe just a little more. Hey, what good is 10% of a car? That's what you put in a junkyard. How many things have to be right on a car to make it work? Like thousands of things? Hmm? How many things would have to be wrong to make it stop working? Any one of the many thousands of things. Like not having the keys, you know, not having any gas in it, you know. Take the distributor, distributor cap off and run a pencil around the inside and put it back on. Boy, they'll never find that one. Take the spark plug wire off, run a, put a doorbell wire in there, shove it back down, feed the doorbell wire through the firewall, and weave it through the fabric of the front seat. <laughs> Do that when they're going on their honeymoon, you know, get in the car, wow, let's go, honey. Bam, ooh, ooh, what was that? Okay. There's a thousand things to make your car quit running. <laughs> Probably 10,000 ways to stop a car from running. Shove a potato in the exhaust pipe, you know, <laughs> watch what happens. Uh, I don't want to give you any more ideas, okay? But, uh, <laughs> There are thousands of differences between, him, uh, between <laughs> humans and chimpanzees. But if you think a percentage of similarity proves a relationship, let me show you the research I've been doing. I discovered clouds are 100% water. Watermelons are 97%. It's only 3% difference. That proves they're related. Jellyfish are 98%. Missing link. And so are snow cones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. We got the proof, okay? Then they tell them fossils prove evolution. I say, guys, you've got to be kidding. This textbook says, evidence of evolution from the fossil record. Oh, no, don't give me that. That's a lie. There is no fossil record. There's a bunch of bones in the dirt. It's not a record, okay? You're putting your interpretation on those bones they're digging out of the dirt. There is no fossil record. This textbook says, evolution is a fact. 
The fossil record provides some of the strongest evidence that species evolved over time. This is silly. There is no fossil record. You don't look back into time. You look at a bunch of bones you dug out of the dirt. And you put your interpretation on them, okay? Fossils only exist in the present. They don't exist in the past. I mean, you're digging them up, and it's, it's 2005, okay? <laughs> you can't say, wow, this fossil is 40 million years old. You don't know that. Okay? All we do is put our interpretation on the fossils, but the kids are taught fossils contribute to our understanding of evolution. Kids, keep in mind, dead animals do not reproduce or evolve. Darwin said, if my theory is true, numberless intermediate species ought to have you know, been found in the fossil record. Well, I'm sorry. This guy said, since Darwin, many of these links have been found. Oh, they are lying to you. No missing links have been found. Even David Robb, who believes in evolution, says, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. <gasps> You're kidding. Fantasy in the textbooks? That's a fancy word for a lie. <laughs> okay? And we could spend two days on the fossil record. There's no fossil record, and there are gaps all over the place. Every place where there ought to be something, they find nothing. No evidence for how the whale evolved, or how the birds evolved, or how the flowering plants evolved. No evidence whatsoever. If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You couldn't prove it had any kids. And you sure couldn't prove it had different kids. And why would you think a bone in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do? Which is produce something other than their kind. Luther Sunderland wrote to major evolutionists all over and said, Hey, where's the evidence for evolution? They wrote back and said, we don't have it, somebody else has it. He wrote to Colin Patterson because Patterson has access to the largest fossil collection in the world, British Museum of Natural History. Nobody's got more fossils than them. Patterson wrote a book about evolution, but he didn't show any missing links. So Sunderland wrote him a letter and said, uh, excuse me, uh, why didn't you show the missing links in your book? I'd like to see a picture of the missing link. Patterson wrote back and said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. There are no missing links. The whole chain is missing. It's not a link they're looking for, folks. Even Stephen Gould said the absence of fossil evidence is a nagging problem for evolution. Yeah, it sure is. Stephen Gould died with a set of my videos on his shelf in his library. I hope he watched them. I donated them to him years ago, way before he died. Hopefully he watched them and got saved. I don't know. So Niles Eldridge and Stephen Gould have kind of resurrected the punctuated equilibria idea that came actually from Richard Gouldschmidt. Gouldschmidt said, the first bird hatched from a reptilian egg. They got so frustrated looking for missing links, they couldn't find any. They said, well, this just proves evolution happened quickly. Oh, I see. Yeah. And this bird that hatched from the reptile egg, uh, excuse me, who did it marry? Hmm. Don't you have to have two in the same place of the opposite sex? I mean, what if you get two males? Huh? And don't they have to be at the same time in history? What if one's born just 10 years before the other one? Oh, just missed it. You've got to get them in the same place of the opposite sex at the same time, and they've got to be interested. You've got a whole bunch of problems, okay? Serious problems. Then they tell the kids to think critically. Which theory best describes the organism's evolution, gradualism or punctuated equilibria. Look what they do. Kids, which theory is the best explanation, slow evolution or fast evolution? Do you see how they're giving the kids two options, both of which are false? Which is correct, boys and girls? Elephants are orange or elephants are pink? Ah, uh, oh man. Mom, what should I write for this one? <laughs> I don't know, honey, go do your homework. They're neither one. You realize how frustrating this is for Christian kids to go through public schools and have this kind of stuff day after day after day, and how it wears at their faith? And they finally just start giving the evolution answers. And 75% of the kids from Christian homes are being destroyed and losing their faith going through these public schools. That's not thinking critically. This textbook says, which is correct, boys and girls? Did evolution happen gradually or in short leaps and punctuated equilibria? They give them two options. Evolution happens slowly or evolution happened quickly. These guys are not capable of thinking outside the box. It didn't happen at all. Is that an option? 
But I guarantee if a kid puts, it didn't happen at all on his test question, the teacher's going to count it wrong. I debated Dr. Pigliucci from Knoxville, Tennessee, UT, UT Knoxville. I said, Dr. Pigliucci, you've studied and taught evolution of plants for 10 years. You've received $650,000 in grant money to study the evolution of plants. What's the best evidence you know of for evolution? That was my question. His answer was, the evolution of whales. I said, just exactly what kind of plant is a whale anyway? Hmm? Yeah. He said, the hippo is evidence for evolution because it's in the process of adapting to an aquatic way of life. Hippo is proof for evolution because it likes to go in the water. Wow, I like to go in the water too. What's that mean? <laughs> Evolution's a shell game. Everybody thinks that somebody else has the evidence. The biologist says, oh, we don't have it. The geologist has it. The geologist says, oh, we don't have it. The anthropologist has it. It's a shell game with one major difference. You know how they put the P down there and try to get you confused, you know, which one has the P? Um, the difference is, there's no P under any of them. Nobody has the evidence. Nobody. They're all lying. They say, what about horse evolution? Yes, boys and girls, you see this? The four-toed horse evolved to the one-toed horse. That's a lie proven wrong 55 years ago. The hyrax is the so-called four-toed horse. They're still alive today in Africa and, and Turkey. <laughs> There's still a little bitty critter. There's one right there, a hyrax. They don't tell you the early horse had 18 pairs of ribs. The next one had 15. These animals are not even related. They just picked some bones and put them in order they wanted them. The next one had 19 and then back to 18. This horse evolution theory was proven wrong a long time ago. There's a whole variety of horses today, by the way, big ones and little ones. But back in 1950, G.G. Simpson, a famous evolutionist, said, this horse evolution was unintentionally falsified. It's not true. The evolution of the horse was all wrong. It never happened in nature. If, if, horse evolution has not held up under close examination. The whole idea was made up by Othniel Marsh back in 1874. He picked animals from all over the world and put them in order the way he wanted it to happen. He never found them in that order, okay? Modern horses are found in the same layers as the so-called ancient horse. The ancient horse is just an animal still alive today in Turkey and East Africa. The ribs, toes, and teeth are different. In South America, the fossils are in the reverse order. Real problem. They're never found in the order presented in the textbooks. Tulsa Zoo finally took out their display because a friend of mine wrote him a letter and said, hey, uh, why do you have the horse evolution on display? I've got the letters here somewhere. Did you get those out, Steve? The, they're in the suitcase? Okay. You can come read those later. He wrote him a letter and said, guys, your horse evolution thing was proven wrong like uh, 50 years ago. You know, would you please remove the display? And they said, we don't have the funding to remove it. So he went to a sign shop and got a bid for a sign, 60 bucks or something, that says, we'll take this, the sign would say, we will take down this display as soon as we receive the funding, because the display is not accurate. He went into the curator at the zoo and said, uh, here's 60 bucks for the sign, this guy will make the sign, when would you like it delivered? He said, what's this? Oh, you're going to take down, the, we're going to take down the display when we get the funding. Yeah, he said, you at least warn the people, you know, the display is not right. Well, they didn't take it down. Finally, I forget, 2,000 people signed a petition saying, get this thing out of our zoo. It came on the evening news, 10 o'clock one night. Tulsa Zoo has a false display. Next morning, it was gone. They found the funding. Six months later, they put it back up. Yale University still has their horse evolution on display, proven wrong 55 years ago. Get more on the horse evolution in the book, Icons of Evolution. Just because you can arrange animals in order, that doesn't prove anything. Even if you find them buried in a certain order, that doesn't prove anything. If I get buried on top of a hamster, does that prove he's my grandpa? <laughs> no. Order of burial means nothing. But if you think you can arrange things and that somehow proves something, okay. I've been doing a lot of research on the evolution of the fork. I've pieced together fragmentary evidence for a long time. I believe, after studying this very intently, that the knife evolved first. Slowly, over millions of years, great geological pressures squeezed it and made it concave on one side, convex on the other, and squeezed it into a spoon. And then slowly, erosion cut grooves into the end and turned it into a fork. I knew I was onto something here, but I felt like I had a missing link, particularly between the spoon and the fork. I just couldn't find it. Till one day I was flying to Connecticut on U.S. Air. I was 30,000 feet off the ground. 
and the stewardess walked down the aisle and just handed me the missing link. I don't think she knew what she had, but my trained scientific eye picked it up right away. I said, wow, this is it. I've got it. I stuck it in my pocket. Later that day, I went to Popeye's Chicken and found another one. There they are, folks, the missing links. So the evolution of silverware is nearly complete. Of course, we got a few mutant, mutants along the way. Didn't quite survive for some reason, you know. And of course, people found out I was doing research on this. They all wanted to be famous, you know. So they tried to get in on the glory. They sent me their research. This one was an obvious fork head on a spoon handle. I mean, look, it didn't get by me. I caught it right away, you know. They don't get stuff. I don't, get, I don't fall for stuff like that. Even the races, of course, evolved over the long ways. But uh, look, if you want to arrange things, you can turn a cat to a cot to a dot to a dog by changing one letter at a time. You can play with this for a while and turn yourself into a fool when you're done. They say dinosaurs turn to birds. There are very few ideas as dumb as this one. The Bible says God made the birds on day five. He made the reptiles on day six. Evolution says reptiles came first and then the birds. You know, everything about evolution is backwards to the Bible. Everything. But this article says, dinosaurs alive as birds, scientist says. Oh, wow, scientist says. Well, that proves it right there. <laughs> Just like it gives some kind of authority. Wow, scientist says. This is absurd. Everything about the bird evolution is baloney. Okay? Archaeoraptor was listed in 1999 as the missing link. Yes, boys and girls, breaking news, National Geographic, we found the missing link. I had a whole big article about the missing link has been discovered. Then a couple months later, oops, it was proven wrong. You know, everything about these feathered dinosaurs has been proven baloney. But guess what? They're still teaching it. Here's a whole book, The Feathered Dinosaurs of China. Well, you just got this recently? Why would they still be teaching something that's been proven wrong for five years? All this feathered dinosaur stuff is baloney. It's all baloney. We cover more on that in one of the debates I did. I forget which one, but uh, they say birds are descendants of dinosaurs. Well, kids, in case you don't know, <clears throat> there are a few differences between a dinosaur and a bird. Okay, you don't just put a few feathers on them and say, come on, man, give it a try. It won't hurt too bad. <laughs> it's just not that easy. See, reptiles have four perfectly good legs. Birds have two legs and two wings. So if his front legs are going to change to wings, um, somewhere along the line, they're going to be half leg and half wing. Which means on that particular day, he can't run anymore and he still can't fly yet, so he's got a real problem. <laughs> Serious problem. They say Archaeopteryx is proof of it for evolution. You got one here on the table, brother? Archaeopteryx. Whenever you buy a bag of dinosaurs, they almost always stick one of these in there. Archaeopteryx. Wow. And this somehow gets an impression to the kids. Wow, we got proof that dinosaurs turned to birds. Here's one here with feathers on it. They're lying. It's still in the textbooks. I mean, today, about Archaeopteryx, and it's been proven years ago, Archaeopteryx was just a bird, a perching bird. Alan Fiducia, who believes in evolution, says it's not a missing link. It had the right features for flight. All the features of the brain were for flight, okay? Archaeopteryx means ancient wing, and he had claws on his wings. Well, that's kind of unusual, okay. But 12 birds today have claws on their wings. The swan, the ibis, the hoatzin, several birds have claws. They say, well, he had teeth in his beak. Well, not many birds have teeth. Some do. There's a hummingbird has teeth in his beak. But most birds don't have teeth, I agree. Actually, some mammals have teeth. Some don't. Some birds have teeth. Some don't. Some fish have teeth. Some don't. Some of you have teeth. Some don't. Okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> missing link. <coughs> The Chinese dino bird was a forgery, and we don't have time to cover all that today, but we give lots more on that on the, uh, one of the debates I did. It's true feathers and scales are both made of keratin, same building block, that's true, but that's where the similarity stops, okay? Actually, birds and reptiles have different lung system, different reproductive system, different body covering, different brain, I mean a th different circulatory system. Thousands of differences exist between dinosaurs and birds. That could be a whole seminar by itself. It's interesting, there are two different kinds of dinosaurs, the bird hip and the lizard hip dinosaur. Their hips are very different. Ask an evolutionist, which type of dinosaur evolved into the bird? Was it the bird hip or the lizard hip? And they will probably kind of hang their head and quietly say, well, it was, it was the lizard hip. Oh, so now the hip's got to turn around backwards too. 
in addition to the billions of other changes you've got to make, there's no evidence of how dinosaurs evolved to birds. None. Zero. So who's right? Well, Richard Dawkins said, it's absolutely safe to say if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. Sounds like he's open for a discussion. When I went to England, we tried everything to get to debate Richard Dawkins. He refused. He hung up on my secretary. I, his secretary hung up on me when, when I called back. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind. There's no mental reason to reject Christianity. It's a logical deduction to say, hey, there must have been a designer. You see something complicated like this world, you say, hey, there must have been a designer. Evolution's not a fact. It's not even a good theory. It's not even a hypothesis. It's a metaphysical research program. Julian Huxley said, I suppose the reason we leapt at origin of species was the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. We don't want God telling us what to do. Evolution is a religion. Even uh, Michael Ruse said that. He said, I'm an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian. But I must admit that in his one complaint, Mr. Gish is but one of many to make it. The literalists are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it's true of evolution still today. We believe in evolution because the only alternative is creation. And that's right. That is the only alternative. One Russian atheist astronomer came over here to America, and he was speaking at the university, and he said, Folks, either there is a God or there isn't. I thought, wow, now that's a brilliant conclusion to come to. <laughs> but then he said, both possibilities are frightening. I thought, wow, now that is a brilliant statement. See, if there is a God, we better find out who he is and find out what he wants and do what he says. If there is no God, we're in trouble. We're hurtling through space at 66,000 miles an hour and nobody's in charge. <laughs> That's a scary thought. Even uh, one famous scientist said, this evolution, transformationism, is a fairy tale for adults. The theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. Even if evolution theory is true, it's useless. It's of no value to science whatsoever. Evolution is a kind of dogma which its own priests no longer believe, but which they uphold for the people. Even most scientists don't believe in this, but they're afraid of losing their job or their research grant money, or they're afraid of peer pressure. No different than a fifth grader afraid what the other fifth graders think of them. We've got college professors out there teaching these lies that I've covered just because they, they have to, because, you know, that's their job. Muggeridge said, I'm convinced the theory of evolution will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Satan is a liar. And everything about this theory is based on lies. Even uh, uh, Thomason said, these evolution, people who go about teaching evolution are great con men. The story they are telling may be the greatest hoax ever. We do not have one iota fact to support this evolution theory. So Fred Hoyle, the famous astronomer, said, well, life is so complicated, it could not have evolved on Earth, so it must have come from outer space. <laughs> well, duh. All that does is postpone the problem. How did it happen out there? Hmm. This guy says, evolution is a light which illuminates all facts. All lines of thought must follow. This is what evolution is. Well, Pierre de Chard and the Catholic priest that got most of the Catholics to believe in evolution, including the Pope, who's three times now said, we believe in evolution. Pierre de Chard is one of the guys responsible for the great Piltdown hoax. He's a liar. Absolute bald-faced liar. God's word is a light. Okay? Not evolution is a light. But if a kid goes 12 or 15 years to school in your school system, how's he going to view the world? Probably like an evolutionist. Why would they teach these lies? Well, some people think that if everybody believes in evolution, that will make it true. <laughs> it doesn't matter if everybody believed in it. That wouldn't make it true yet, okay? Some people teach the lie to keep the paycheck coming in. Kids, there are teachers that don't believe in evolution, but they keep teaching it anyway because they like their paycheck every Friday. And they will lie to you to keep their paycheck coming in. Some understand the bigger picture, how evolution is the foundation for the new world order. We cover more on that on seminar part five. Evolution is the foundation for Marxism, Nazism, communism, socialism. 
That's why when I do debates, I always call it creation versus evolutionism. It drives them nuts, you know, because they're used to saying, oh, it's evolution versus creationism. They always put the ism on creation. So when I flash up my sign at the beginning, it says, creation versus evolutionism debate. They always sit there with that puzzled look on their face. They're trying to read it thinking, you know, something doesn't look right about that, but I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Just get the little jab in there, you know. Why do people believe in evolution? Well, you might want to get this book, The Case Against Darwin. Excellent. Short book, quick read for, for your intellectual friends that want to uh, get the quick picture. Some people, that's all they've ever been taught. When I spoke in Russia, I was over there at the university. There were 30 professors came in to hear me speak. And after about an hour, one of the professors was crying. And I asked the interpreter, I said, what's, what's he crying about? And she said, he's never heard the evolution. He's never heard the creation story. He didn't know there was one. All he's ever heard is evolution. He wants you to keep going. I went for another hour. I spoke at a public school over there in Russia. The room would seat 400 kids. They had 700 high schoolers come in there and listen to me for two hours. I mean, you could have heard a pin drop the whole time. I couldn't believe it. When I asked the principal before I started, I said, hey, uh, are there any things I shouldn't say to these kids? I know this is a public school. It's kind of sensitive. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm a Christian. Is it okay to tell them, you know, talk, mention the Bible? He said, oh, yeah. Talk, tell them anything you want. I said, well, would it be okay if I told them, you know, how to go to heaven? He said, sure, sure, please do. These kids would love to hear about Christianity. They've never heard any of this. <laughs> wow. Door you can drive a truck through, brother. But they use the same lies in Russian textbooks. Here's a Russian textbook talking about the four limb proving evolution and the different geologic column strata, all the stuff we covered earlier. So why do they believe this stuff? Well, some believe it because that's all they've been taught. Some, their job depends on it. Some, they hope there's no God to answer to. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge, the Bible says. They just don't like this idea. And it says, God will send them strong delusion. The more I think about this, that is so true. Anybody that believes they came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago has to be strongly deluded. Think about it. Oh, there's so much we could cover on this. Some people simply have too much pride to admit they have been wrong all their life. So, kids are being taught evolution. There's no question about it. The kids are being lied to in these textbooks. There's no question about it. What do we do about it? Well, we cover that in great detail on our public school presentation on uh, the Green series of tapes. Get the public school presentation. We'll tell you step by step what to do, how to get these lies out of your textbook, how you can get on the school textbook selection committee, how you can get your kid exempt from class. Parents, if, you're, if your kids are in a public school, you should send a little note to the teacher saying, I don't want my child taught evolution. It's against my religious convictions. Sign it, notarize it if you'd like, give it to the teacher and to the principal. Then if they continue giving you a hard time, you say, oh, now, excuse me, do you discriminate against people because of their religious convictions? Watch their eyes light up on that one. And if they still give you a hard time, contact me. I got some lawyers waiting in the wings that are anxious to get a lawsuit like that. Title 42, discrimination based on religion. Wow. That principal's going to be the garbage collector the next week. I guarantee you that principal's going to call that teacher in and say, look, let this kid out of class. Stop teaching evolution. I had one guy call me a couple years ago. He said, Brother Hovind, my second grade daughter's teacher just called me. And the teacher said, Mr. Jones, whatever his name was, I forget. He said, your second grader's in my class, your daughter, and she stops me every time I start teaching something about evolution. And the teacher said, I've just decided I'm going to skip this evolution stuff for the rest of the year until your daughter's out of my class. <laughs> and my first thought was, yay. And then I thought, wait, 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 wait. Why are we sending second graders off to war? This is a battle the parents ought to be fighting, not the kids. We're the salt of the earth. Salt irritates. Hey, if nobody's irritated at you, you're not a good Christian. You don't have to try to irritate them. You try to be salty, that will irritate them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> salt preserves from corruption. How come you got so many lies in the textbooks right here in Tennessee in the middle of the Bible Belt? Where's the Christians that are supposed to preserve the world, huh? Why don't some of you get on the school board and do something about this? Why don't some of you get a committee to say, hey, let's take these pages out of the book. This is a lie. It won't cost the school anything. I'll show you. How many of you would volunteer to take the pages out of the book and bring your own scissors? 
Won't cost the school a dime. Oh, let's, let's do better than that. How many of you would pay $20 for the privilege of being on the committee to cut the pages out of the book and still bring your own scissors? We just had a fundraiser. We just raised 1000 bucks for the school. Wow. Won't cost them a dime. There are many good, sincere, godly public school teachers, and I praise God for them. And they are as frustrated as I am with what's going on. If you've got a good teacher in your school that wants to do what's right, support them. Because I guarantee if there's a teacher that tries to get up and stand up for creation and against evolution, there's a good possibility they'll get fired or get persecuted for it. We cover much more on that on video number seven, how teachers get persecuted for standing up for what's right. Many teach this theory because they simply have never been taught anything else. Many don't know it's okay to teach creation. It's perfectly fine. Well, what do we do? Well, there's a long history of how we got this theory in our schools, and we'll cover all that in the public school presentation. And what do we do about it? It's all covered on videotape number five. We'll show you the dangers of this theory. It's not just a dumb idea. It's a dangerous religion. And then take some real practical steps to fix it on seminar part five. Thank you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6:23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6:23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now, and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. Forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help. For more information on the Ministry of Creation Science Evangelism, write us at Creation Science Evangelism, P.O. Box 37338, Pensacola, Florida, 32526, USA or call us at 850-479-3466. That's 850-479-DINO. You may also visit us on the web at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.